Good morning, Council. Please come to order. Ready to continue with public testimony on uh, Let me go through the, the list of people we've missed so far and, and see if anybody uh, from there is available to testify. Um, Mark Fina. Good morning. Good morning. Who is this? Hey, uh, uh, my name is, uh, uh, I mean, to the chair, uh, my name is uh, Joel Jackson, uh, oh, the good, president good morning, of the Jackson. organized village of Cake. Great. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Jackson. Okay, I'll start over. To the chair, uh, my name, for the record, my name is uh, Joel Jackson. I'm the president of the Organized Village of Cake. Um, I'm here to uh, testify uh, to the uh, halibut bycatch happening. Uh, I'm 65 years old. I've lived in our uh, native village of Cake, spelled K-A-K-E, Alaska, Southeast Alaska. Um, over those 65 years, I've seen the halibut decline um, pretty steadily. Uh, I know there's many factors, but when I see the excess bycatch uh, by the trawlers, very concerning. I was talking with my late uncle uh, about four years ago, and he'd tell me stories of uh, halibut fishing and salmon fishing. He was telling me uh, he got a he caught a halibut, probably about a forty-pound halibut that was tagged in the Bering Sea out here in. Uh, Frederick Sound in front of our community and he turned it in um, because back then they would uh, offer uh, a few dollars if he turned it in but this was probably about 20 years ago I would imagine when he was still fishing but um, when I started learning about the trawling the uh, bycatch it became very concerning to me because next to salmon catching the halibut uh, catching halibut here in our community is very very important to us it uh, it sustains us uh, year round basically basically so, when there's no salmon, we rely heavily on halibut for fresh uh, fresh fish. I can't stress enough, you know, uh, especially over this uh, pandemic over the past year, 
how much food security uh, means to us. And my concern is all this halibut out there that are looks like mostly juvenile halibut that we can't catch because they're too small are being dumped back in. And I don't know what the mortality rate was, about 50%, I think I heard yesterday. Um, you know, it's really concerning. Uh Number one, um, all the spike heads being dumped back into the ocean, whether they're alive or not, is wanton waste by definition. And if we did that as subsistence users, uh, we would be fined heavily. Even just one fish over our limit, we would be fined heavily. We're throwing, for taking it, or throwing it back. So I don't understand the. You know, I, I understand that uh, uh, they're commercial, but I've been a commercial fisherman too. I had hell of it. Uh, I have keys for a small boat, and uh, if I took a small, undersized fish like. I see mostly that's going on out there, I would be fined. I'd be fined very heavily, like just like taking subsistence, taking one more. So I don't understand the justice of this whole thing to allow bycatch at all. And like I said, I've seen the steady decline of our halibut around here. I'm a heavy subsistence user. We have to look for halibut. One before, we could just go right out in front of our community and throw a hook in and get a fish. So <clears throat> we need to take better care of our, our fishing resources. Moving forward. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. And if this is a, uh, continued to be allowed, I have very, very deep concerns about this uh, hell of a fishery that uh, we're talking about bycatch. And I know there's a lot of other bycatch out there besides hell of it, which we all depend on statewide. Like I say, I can't understand one or one one industry being allowed to be able to uh, catch these uh, different uh, fish or crab or whatever you know that's caught by by these uh, industrial sized trawlers to continue Jackson. to happen. Mr. Jackson. Your time yeah. is up. Can you provide a, a summary comment for us, please? Okay. Well, I, I just want to encourage the NOAA Fisheries and uh, whoever else is involved to please consider either shutting it down or having stricter regulations. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Jackson. Are there any questions from council members? Any thanks for your time this morning. Okay, the um, the other two testifiers that we missed yesterday were uh, Mark Fina and Alexis Quachka. Hello, this Mark is Fina. Mark. I'm on. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mark Fina on behalf of U.S. Seafoods. Um, I just want to uh, hit a few highlights. I think, I guess, uh, I still continue to look at action and think that the most relevant national standard is National Standard Nine, which means that you should adapt adopt measures that uh, limit our bycatch 
to the extent practicable. And as we go forward, I think um, some of the things that concern me are the high variability in our bycatch that seems unrelated to the indices. And in that environment, it seems like uh, you really need to look to something other than an index to pick an appropriate level of bycatch for us. And that's where I think performance standards come into play. And I think um, in the uh, proposals you have, the alternatives you have in front of you, you have some performance standards. I think that's really where you need to look. Um, the cap is really just a backstop. And it's a number that we should never go over at wherever that's set. But you really should set up a performance standard that creates incentives that drive us to that number. And that's the number you should be looking at when you, when you start to consider what our bycatch will be. Um, I'm also concerned that with, with the indices, that the amount of variability that's unrelated to the indices, that it might be appropriate to think of using only one instead of two. That line survey includes trawl survey information in it. And to me, it seems like it may be appropriate to go with one index. The two indices just seem to add noise on top of noise if they're unrelated to what a practicable level of bycatch would be for our sector. Um, Another thing I'd like to point out, I know a number of people have suggested that they want data looked at at a company level for our sector, and people have suggested a problem with data confidentiality. I think there are ways to aggregate. For example, um, just cite whether zero companies would be over a limit, whether one or more but less than all is over a limit or whether all are over a limit. And I think if you did that, you would be able to present some information on a company level that you don't have in the document right now. Um, the last point I, I guess I wanna make is in respect to, with respect to the indices and the variability is that um, looking at things over the course of several years seems to make sense. It's what the IPHC does and your performance standards do that as well. And I think the IPHC acknowledging that the variability in bycatch when they do that, the bycatch reductions from their TCEYs is kind of further acknowledgement that there's, even from that side, that there's variability that maybe looking at one year alone isn't appropriate. So I think looking at things in, uh, across a, the course of several years, when you start to set limits and do performance standards is, is a functional way to do it that will allow us some flexibility, allow us to operate, and it'll get you to the result you're looking for and the impact on the halibut fishery is, is aggregated anyway. And uh, I'll just wrap it up with that. Thank you. Director Dina, if there's questions. Mr. Mesro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Mr. Fina. Are you concerned that um, a performance standard might keep your sector locked into a, a very low annual limit if you had several bad years? Or does that, is the difference between the performance standard and the cap critical to make sure that you don't get locked into a, a lower level for an extended period of time? Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mesero, I, I think the issue is making the performance standard reasonable. I mean, it should be something that we can attain. Uh, there's, uh, I think several people in our sector are concerned that the way that this, some of the numbers in the alternatives right now, the cap is likely to be binding in, in many years. And if that's the case, then there's no way we're going to achieve a performance standard. So I, I think it's a matter of um, making the performance standard, setting it at a reasonable level. If you do that, I think we'll, you know, you, you, we'll be able to achieve it reasonably enough on a, you know, on a reasonable basis, and we won't get locked in at a low number. Thank you. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dr. Fina, for your testimony. My question is about your comment on perhaps considering uh, just the set line survey index uh, for the lookup tables and not use the trial survey index. And I understood your point about the indices as they relate uh, to PSC, but I guess in, in my 
mind, I was thinking the, the purpose of those indices was to give us uh, a sense of what the halibut stock was doing. And so do you think, uh, and, and the idea there was uh, that the set line survey focuses on larger fish generally um, caught in the directed commercial fishery and, and the trial survey uh, tends to capture more of the smaller fish that aren't captured in the set line survey to give us together uh, the best information available about the halibut stock. And so um, can you speak to that a little bit in terms of uh, why it, it, it probably uh, wouldn't be helpful to have the trawl survey in terms of the indices to give us the best information about the halibut stock, sort of why the set line survey would be good enough for that? Sure. Uh, um, just, I have a couple of thoughts on that. The first is that, um, you know, I guess the, my understanding is that the trawl survey does feed into the set line survey analysis that's used in the set line survey. And given that that's already taking place, it seems like there is added information from the trawl survey that's already contained in an, in, if you use that single index. Uh, secondly, I would say um, that uh, I understand that the desire to kind of make sure you take care of the whole stock, um, small and large fish. But I think if you look at the at the halibut management overall and the management of the of the uh, of the biomass that the IPHC undertakes, they're really looking mostly at the set line survey for that management as well. Also, to the extent that you're trying to come up with, I, I would say I, I kind of look at this action generally as kind of a, um, is doing it. One is first trying to come up with practical limits for us. And secondly, trying to make sure that you take care of the halibut fishery itself, the directed fishery. And, and you know, you even within, even if it we're within practicability, you may be concerned about what's going on in the halibut fishery because of bycatch, um, to me that impact is best reflected in the in the set line survey um, as opposed to the trawl survey because it, because of the close relationship between set line survey and what's happening in that directed fishery, and so I actually think that um, I mean probably the the most appropriate way to think of it is that when I mean, particularly when that hell, when the halibut fishery is down, that you really want, that's when you want the indices to actually have an effect on what's happening because that's when our impact on their fishery is, 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 uh, felt the most. And I, and I also am thinking that, you know, just as somebody who comes in and invests in a fishery, when you buy in a fishery, you think of it, there are fluctuations within a normal range. And if they're within the normal range, then limiting our bycatch to the extent practicable without an ad additional pressure, uh, you know, without an additional reduction on us kind of makes sense to me. Is if you come up with a good performance standard that gets us doing everything we can uh, to avoid bycatch, it seems like if they're within the normal range in the set line survey, that's the normal environment. When they go outside the normal range is when you, re is when you want to trigger reaction on these indices and that's when you see. That's when I I would understand the council saying, okay, we're in a we're in an unusual situation here. We need to push these. We need to push this performance standard down. We need to push the limit down a little bit, and, and address those concerns in the directed fishery. And I, I hope that answers your question. It does. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Marks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Fina. J just to further clarify the, your comment regarding um, using set line only, is that predicated on, on uh, kind of the, uh, using uh, variability over several years? And the other part of my question is, that does that capture uh, changes in the in the halibut population, and I, I think about the, the two of the more challenging uh, areas to to uh, 
predict are, are when there's an upturn in the population or when there's a downturn, you tend to be on a trend line and do you overshoot either way? And have you thought about how, how what you're proposing uh, would, would capture uh, those, those two bookends of, of the population? Thanks. Mr. Chair, um, I, I guess I, 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 you know, I know it's, uh, there's some, I don't have a great answer for that question. I do think that, um, and I'll, I'll revert back to something I've said before, which I actually think that um, the best index is probably the directed fishery catch limit, and the second best index is probably assessment, and the third best is probably the set line survey. And really because I look at the impact on the directed fishery is the most appropriate thing to look at for um, setting your catch, setting your index for an index. And I, I think um, I understand why the council likes the set line survey. And I think it will capture some of that, but I don't know of the, of the fluctuation that you're changing. But I don't know that it'll capture. I, I don't. I can't say whether it'll capture it all of the of the issues that are concerning you about you know catching a trend as it starts to develop. And that's really a question for the the biologists. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Bina. I'm just. You know, thinking back on previous testimony from your sector, and I'm just wondering if your suggestion on moving to just using the set line survey as an index, I feel like previous testimony was based on the fact that 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 there was little correlation between your encounter rates and the index itself. And I just thought in the survey itself, and I just thought that was a big push from your sector to have us consider that factor. But now I'm hearing, you know, a, a advocacy to move to just using the set line survey. And, and I'm wondering, is, does that mean we're moving beyond this argument of not having this correlation with encounter rates and more so to let's use an index that is best reflective of its impact on the directed halibut fleet? I, I know you've answered two questions on this already. I just want to a little bit more, Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Kimmel. That, no, that's a good question, and I do think early on we were looking for a correlation between an index and our and our bycatch and our encounter rates. I don't think that exists for any of these indices, based on everything I, I've seen and everything I've seen in in the documents. So at that point, my opinion is for the the councils on the most solid ground in this action, if it looks beyond just trying to, to set a practicable limit for us to something else. And the only thing I can think of that based on what's on the table is the impact on the directed fishery. I still think that practicability is, you know, the number one driver for this action. So I'm not saying sell that out entirely, but I think if you're gonna use an index, the best connection you can make to an impact is is through the directed fishery. And that's why I look at it, um, especially if you don't see a very good correlation with the trawl survey, because that's, you know, once more removed from the directed fishery. And really, I, I guess it all comes down to me that when you don't really have measure for this to set with practicability, um, why complicate it? And why just add more noise? Um, and, you know, I think there should be very few steps in whatever table you, you, you use because, because you're just, I don't see a good reason to move numbers around just to move them. You, they really should be connected to something that's in your system. So I really think the focus should be, okay, we're going to set an index that's related to something really tangible that we know about, and we're going to move things around when you hit critical thresholds in that that relate to those things you're trying to to impact. I mean, I just think with that type of an action, you get on much more solid ground and bearing in mind that practicability still needs to be the driver for the action. Thank you. 
Mr. Clay. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Fina, I know that you've answered three questions on this already, um, but I'm, um, I'm still um, trying to track one part of the logic that I haven't heard you discuss. I, I, it had seemed to me that as we worked through this and established that there wasn't uh, a correlation between um, bycatch incidents in the Amendment 80 sector and either survey, either the, um, the trawl survey or the IPHC longline survey, that one of the, there was the recognition then that that creates the risk uh, that we'll have a real mismatch between information from the surveys and what the Amendment 80 fleet is actually encountering, and that, that that mismatch may not have anything to do with actual population status. It just has to do with apparently these are three independent variables. But that one way to address that risk was to not pin the Amendment 80 to either one of the two survey methods, but to um, instead use them both weighted equally in order to address the risk in order to, to some extent, to lessen the risk that either one survey would pull you very far in a certain direction and, and thereby exacerbate the mismatch. So I, I thought we were taking an approach that acknowledged that there was a mismatch, but <clears throat> constructed it so that we reduced the risk of, of not of the mismatch, but of, of the, uh, the amount of the mis mismatch potentially um, reducing the, the chance that we'd have a very big mismatch, say, between a very low ab abundance indicator from either survey and, and a high level of incidence. So can you, have, has the Amendment 80 sector done a retrospective analysis on this? And are you speaking from that? And, well, and can you tell me that, that you, the approach that you're advocating actually does reduce the risk? Of, of a large mismatch? So uh, I actually think the, re the way you reduce mismatches and the r and risk associated with mismatches is by setting the numbers at the right levels, um, setting the limits and the performance standard at the right levels. I don't think that you, I don't think it's a good idea to rely on something that I don't want to call it random because it's not quite random, but I don't think that you reduce risk by increasing the potential that something random will show up that will bail you out um, of a mismatch. I think the right way to reduce that risk is by actually really focusing on the numbers that you're setting and setting them at practicable levels. And, uh, and, that, and that's really the, the more appropriate way to do it. We have had discussions in our sector about this, and people have looked at the table and looked at historically where we show up and have said, well, look at this. The trawl survey pulls us up here when the set line survey is pulling us down here. So that's a good thing. And, you know, that's to me, that's, a, you know, that's an outcome oriented view of the problem. And I really think that it's, I, I try to take a little more of a process view of it and say, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to come up with practicable limits. Okay, your number should be practicable. And then when you move the number, you should have a good compelling reason to move the number, performance standard and cap. And I still come back to the most compelling reason to move them is a directed fishery impact, which is best or best, um, recognized by that set line survey. So, uh, you know, I guess I didn't, uh, I guess I don't, I, I mean, I, I understand the desire to have the, um, to have the, to have the move, uh, you know, tempered by the other one coming in, but you can't guarantee that's going to happen. So I, I don't, I, and I'm just saying it, 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 you know, it's worth thinking about whether a single, single index, alternative may be worth having on the table between now and the action and you can decide later now and final action you can decide later whether you want it or not i think you've got good information on 
kind of the rate limit and also how those limits work. Um, and that having one with a single index isn't going to complicate isn't going to complicate the analysis. It's going to simplify the analysis. And again, you don't, you don't have to take it um, at final action. You can decide that it that it doesn't work or does. Any further questions for Dr. Pina? Thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Alexis Kwaczka. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name's Alexis Kwaczka. I started fishing in my teens on the Yukon River, working at a fish wheel, cutting dog salmon. I've been fishing out of Kodiak for 35 years, and this is my 34th consecutive halibut season. I've harvested millions of pounds of halibut as a crew member, hired master, sharecropper, and finally a grunt. 100% of my earned income has come from the sea. I own a boat, three limited entry permits, all owned with no debt to the tune of about three quarters of a million bucks. I own two homes, multiple pieces of property in the great state of Alaska, two kids through school, retirement, health insurance. I am a vested and an invested fisherman. My comments are earned with blood, sweat, tears, and salt. ABM analysis should use the best available science to incorporate it. The SSC comments and recommendations should be rolled into the draft EIS before it's released for public review and a PPP, PPA is selected. Personally, I'd like to see the IPHC modeling incorporated too. Amendment 80 vessels are the most rationalized fleet on the planet. Every amount of flexibility has been provided. This is a great place to be. The owners and hardworking skippers and crew pay no income tax in the state of Alaska. But there is a tax associated with this fishery. It's a down current tax of their use of bicot halibut. Pribilof Island residents have a long history of inequities and the thought of not being able to access halibut resources adjacent to them is like putting a piece of rock salt in that wound. Their fight is real. As it gets, every fish counts to them. Cost of living in the Pribs is outrageous. All down current users depend on a west east migration. Subsistence users need a healthy resource adjacent to their communities. Sport fishermen need a healthy stock to fund the ever-demanding public's needs. Second-generation invested fishermen need stable, consistent stock to uh, stabilize their investments. The U.S. must get its act together so Canada quits, Canada quits beating us with a bloody stump of bicot halibut. Halibut must survive the gauntlet of users to make it to the lower 48. I don't own any of the public resource, nor will I. I've advocated for new entrants to coastal co communities for more than 20 years in front of the table and behind it. I was surprised and would like to point out, out after reading the comment letters in the packet, these were heartfelt letters from individuals and were not form letters. This should resonate with the council members of how passionate and informed people are becoming. Look no further than the latest National Geographic. The questions are, are we going to trade thousands of commercial and recreational halibut fishermen and dozens of dependent coastal communities across Alaska for five bottom trawling companies? Are we going to restore equity and demand all users participate in meaningful conservation going forward? Last but not least, why on earth would we consider setting PSC limits on encounter rates? We manage on abundance. Let's stick with that. I've seen every time we make cuts to the halibut bycatch, innovation springs up. It's true that at some point equilibrium will be met, but are we there yet? What new innovation awaits just around the corner? And while we're at that corner, if we, we can't ratchet in the most rationalized fishery on the planet, why do we consider the, consider and implement more programs? You know, halibut has got me to where I am today. And, uh, you know, as I stated in other actions, this is, uh, this is a fleeting thing for coastal Alaska. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Kwachka, for your testimony. Ms. Kimball has a question. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Kwachka, from your first um, part of your statement, I know you were trying to get through your testimony quickly, but just, do I understand that to mean you uh, support the advisory panel motion on this issue? Well, I think you have to pull in the advisory panel and the recommendations from the SSC. And, you know, Ms. Kimball, we've, we've looked at this thing for almost six years now. Uh, my concern, and, and it is such a complex issue, and, and, you know, I was talking with Diana Stram one time, and she assured me that the squiggles on the screen were actually mathematic uh, equations, but I still think they were squiggles. Um, I, 
I want you guys to get this right. And, and I have always stated that, you know, I think Amendment 80 can do better. And like I said in this, at some point we hear equal and equilibrium where they can't get any better. And I, I just think that we subscribe to put everything we can in and not rush this to get it done to try to meet some whatever. You know, uh, there are a lot of great ideas and they're evolving. And, and the AP puts in good stuff. The SSD is critical of, of of the inputs and we just have to do the best that we can because there are so many people becoming ever more dependent on it. So there, please keep incorporating the good ideas from everyone until we get to the point where it's ready to go out to the public. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Kwachka. Um, back to the normal order of the list. Uh, next up would be uh, Bob Alverson, then Paul Wilkins, then Forrest Braden. Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is uh, Bob Alverson. Morning. Good morning. Um, for the record, I'm representing Fishing Vessel Owners Association. Uh, we have many members that have fished in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Island complex. For the better part of 100 years, um, our association has been um, participating there and has a, um, a great history up there and has been part of many of these difficult uh, decisions on trying to come up with a uh, reasonable um, cap either on the foreign fleets, the joint venture fleets, and our domestic fleet. Um, from the association, we support the abundance-based management of halibut bycatch. We support the revision of the analysis in accordance with the SSC recommendations. We support the council's alternative four at this point, which best addresses the needs of directed halibut users and halibut-dependent communities. Of the three alternatives being uh, considered, we see the alternative four provides the best proportion between the directed and halibut fishery and halibut bycatch for, for CD&E, which is most of the Bering Sea. This comes the closest to addressing the identified problem of declining directed halibut fisheries. During the uh, advisory panel meeting, there seemed to be some um, misunderstanding or, or it wasn't clear when the staff made a presentation on what makes up the uh, the fishery quota for the uh, directed halibut fishery. Uh, during 2000, uh, uh, this year, the um, Halibut Commission had a report from Dr. Ian Stewart, and I'm looking at his slide 61. And there was uh, approximately 4 million pounds available for directed harvest. And uh, with the uh, commercial discards deducted, the O26 non-directed discards, which is uh, the trawl and other uh, bycatches from uh, other 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 industries, recreational subsistence, and U26 non-directed discards, um, the quota ended up being for this year um, 1,640,000 uh, pounds, less than half of of what may be available. So I just point out that that is, uh, comports with our concern that, uh, that the directed fishery is getting a, a, a only about uh, 45 to 40% at times of their potential harvest. And um, we don't think that is, is a fair outcome. I uh, am going to conclude a bit here with uh, uh, reading a piece of the legislative history of the Magnuson Act. This was put together by Warren Magnuson, Senator Warren Magnuson, <coughs> Senator Ernest Hollings. And they. It, this is the congressional intent of what optimum yield is to be looked at from the council. And I start up on page 1099 on this, and it says the fisheries manager, which is contemplated to be the councils yourselves, may be determine that the surplus harvest of the entire biomass must be reduced substantially below MSY in order to restore a valuable depleted stock, which is taken incidentally to the harvesting of other species in this biomass. 
An example of such a situation occurred in the northwest Atlantic where mindless overfishing of haddock was virtually wiped out. A zero quota for haddock will not permit that species to restore itself since other fisheries in the northwest Atlantic cannot be conducted without taking halibut or, or haddock. Accordingly, the harvest of these other species must be reduced below their MSY to reduce the animal catch of haddock. The preceding concepts related to the biological well-being of the fishery, the concept of optimum sustainable yield is broader than the consideration of fish stocks and takes into account the economic well-being of the commercial fishermen, the interest of recreational fishermen, and the welfare of the nation and its customers. The optimum yield, sustainable yield of any given fishery or region will be carefully de defined deviations from MSY in order to respond to the unique problems of that fishery or region. I read that into the record because there's been a question of whether or not if you set an ABC, it has to be achieved. It does not have to be achieved. And the councils are given broad authority in developing a, a multi-species uh, uh, fishery complexes and their total OYs. Um, I'm just wondering, in order to <coughs> achieve um, our alternative four, if there aren't some current restrictions on the Amendment 80 fleet that can't be liberalized that would allow them to better achieve their OY, their, their harvest levels, um, I know that there's currently a restriction in the uh, Cape uh, Constantine, I think, uh, to Hag Hagamaster Island area on them. I'm wondering if that could be relaxed, give them an extra three weeks in that area where there's a very clean fishery at times for them on Yellowfin Sole to achieve their OI. Are there other restrictions on them that can be liberalized so that all of us can get a better piece of the pie here? So, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I conclude FEOA's uh, comments uh, with that, and uh, we'll stand by. Great. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Alperson. Any questions from council members? That will move us on to Paul Wilkins. And while we're waiting for Mr. Wilkins, I'd like to just ask members of the public to please mute your phones if you're not testifying. Hello, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, my name is Paul Wilkins. I am the quota manager for Coastal Villages Region Fund, or CVRF. Pardon me, I have a little bit of a uh, cough. <clears throat> CVRF is the largest of the six VDQ groups by both population and number of communities. Our 9,500 residents in 20 communities make up more than one third of the entire CDQ population. Our region is culturally rich, economically poor, and growing fast. A recent study showed that among the six CDQ groups, CVRF's region has the worst poverty by several measures. For example, we have the highest percentage of households on food stamps, and the lowest per capita income. Our per capita share of the CDQ resource is much lower than you would guess, and there is no permanent private investment like seafood processing companies in our region. But we are doing our best with what Congress has provided to promote economic development and social welfare for our residents. This is our mandate in the Magnus and Stevens Act. I'd like to highlight two CVRF programs that benefit all of our residents, including commercial fishers, subsistence fishers, and others in their communities. First, our mechanics and welders program puts a trained mechanic and welder in a CVRF shop in every community. We have fix and maintain boats and engines. We have even be begun providing certified Honda warranty repairs, which will substantially reduce the cost of the subsistence lifestyle that dominates our region. Second, our JUNIC program helps our young people get professional training and certifications for careers in the fishing and maritime industries. We believe many of these graduates will eventually return to our region as the next generation of community leaders. These programs and others help provide environmental justice for some of the poorest communities in America. They are funded entirely through our participation 
in the Bering Sea pollock, crab, cod, and groundfish fisheries. While 9,500 of our residents rely on a substantial sustainable fisheries management, fair and equitable allocation decisions, and sound conservation measures for which this council is known. In the halibut AVM social impact assessment, table ES2 claims that nine of the 29 Alaska communities that may be substantially engaged in or dependent on the BSAI held area four halibut fishery are located in the CVRF region. The council would benefit from additional context about the CVRF in region halibut fishery. In particular, you should know that the benefits were concentrated in only three or four of CVRF's 20 communities. Our past efforts to support C the CVDQ halibut fishery were very expensive, much more on an annual basis than the council's estimated benefits to these communities. Ultimately, our board suspended those operations and directed us to pursue programs that provide a more fair and equitable allocation of the Bering Sea resources and benefits to all of our residents. Since 2015, CVRF has leased out much of its CDQ halibut quota to directed fishery participants. That revenue funds the, the benefits programs I mentioned earlier, which are equally available to all CVRF residents in all 20 communities. The same can be said for the value we receive releasing our CEQ flatfish to Amendment 80 participants. CVRF must take into account the economic interest of our entire region when considering the impact of this halibut ABM proposal. Our statutory mandate requires us to address persistent poverty across our region. We cannot accomplish that by concentrating benefits in a few communities. CVRF supports halibut conservation. However, the current alternatives and options appear to create an allocative shift more than a conservation benefit. Abundance-based management may have value as a conservation measure if implemented correctly and with input from all sectors, communities, and stakeholders. But we are concerned this proposal would divert revenues away from programs that serve our entire region. CVRF applauds the work of staff and stakeholders to develop the social impact assessment and draft EIS. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Thanks, Mr. Wilkins. Questions from council members? Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. I did miss um, what you suggested needed to be incorporated. I heard I heard the lack of shorthead processing in your region, the reason why CBRF isn't doing that anymore, but I, I missed what the social impact assessment should include in the future. You had some suggestions there. Um, I, I, I believe that the, 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 the issue there is that there's, there's, there's a, the, I don't think that it's, so, so the the SIA sort of talks about the CVRF um, in region halibut fishery, and it doesn't really get into the the to weeds on whether or not the the benefits that are that were were coming from that fishery, um, and how that they were how they were distributed amongst our region. Um, we have quite a few communities, uh, twenty communities that um, a lot of which are not don't have any proximity to the halibut resource, some of which are, are up farther upstream the Cuscoquin River, um, and, and just were not able to participate in that fishery. Um, and so I think that there's a, um, there, there's a sort of a bis, bit of a disconnect between sort of how that fishery was able to, um, to, to be prosecuted and, um, and sort of how CVRF was 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 portrayed there. I don't know if that quite gets to your question. Okay, thank you. Mr. Merrill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to <clears throat> confirm uh, your statements concerning CBRF decisions about how it would prosecute its allocation of CDQ halibut. Uh, within our social impact assessment, there are several tables that describe a fairly substantial reduction in the number of vessels 
that were active in the fisheries. And I guess my understanding from your testimony is that a considerable number of those vessels may have been participating in the CBRF fishery. And then with the decisions that CBRF made, those vessels uh, no longer did. Is that uh, a fair assessment? Yeah, that's correct. The, the, because we were no longer operating and, um, and supporting that, that in region fishery, um, with our, our closure, our buying stations and that kind of thing. Um, there wasn't an outside processor to take over the processing of fish caught by those, those vessels. And so, um, that sort of is a, a sort of a downstream effect of of the closure of the plant. Um, yeah. Mr. Merrill? Any further questions for Mr. Wilkins? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next up is Forrest Braden. Following Mr. Braden is Todd Loomis and then Phyllis Wetha. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my clock is frozen at 30 seconds uh, on the screen, but I don't know if that can be reset. Or is that just a problem on my end? Um, yeah, mine appears to be frozen as, as well. I'm not sure if that's a, a okay. broader issue or just, but I'll let. All right, I'll, keep I'll give it a shot. Okay. 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 Uh, for the record, uh, and Mr. Chair and members of the council, thank you for this opportunity to testify. For the record, this is Forrest Braden speaking for Southeast Alaska Guides Organization, uh, representing charter uh, large fishing businesses. I think on this issue, uh, we can safely say across the state that we're Southeast based. Um, I will point out that there's an attachment to my sign up. Um, it's a reproduction of figure ES2 from the analysis. Uh, I have added a, a couple of um, points that uh, actually visually help me understand retroactively where uh, we would be in each alternative if the 12th uh, Amendment 80 was expected to um, be efficient at that level. So uh, anyway, I'd like to speak conceptually first and then um, to our support for abundance based management. This issue, uh, okay. I've been looking at it for a couple of years by board assignment and learned a lot. It's complex. Um, I have a lot more respect for all sectors and what they're up against. Um, it really seems to distill down to two things. Mostly what's being focused on is BFAI equity between A80 and, and the directed fishery. But there is a, a conservation component to this that I, I, I try as I might, I can't ignore. Um, and uh, hopefully I can get back around here to uh, some of the remarks about the indices and, and how they would affect that. Um, we, we do support uh, abundance-based management, both for the equity and conservation aspects of it. Uh, Conservation-wise, uh, we're focused a lot on low abundance, uh, how the fleet performs at low abundance. And uh, I'd like to point out that regardless of what the, the non-effects of a BSAI a bycatch on uh, spawning biomass is regularly being capped in the idea that it's a, really a zero-sum yield game between all sectors. And so if you take it away from one, you're just giving it to another. But uh, I, I think that we fail to identify the fact that if all other fleets, all other sectors are frozen um, and you have savings in one sector, you are um, hitting the conservation point of this whole thing. And so where we're at low abundance, I think we're, we've revised it to we're at B33. Um, we were at B32, dangerously close to, to a, a ramp to the directed fishery. Uh, these are times where conservation of fish, especially small fish, uh, with reproductive potential, migration potential, um, really could help in a broad sense, uh, a collaborative sense, uh, to help um, all people involved in the fisheries coastwide. So... That said, um, 
I'm going to swing around and speak quickly to this idea about singling in on a on the IPHC index or the setline series and index. I think one of the problems that you're going to run into if you single in on that one index is number one, you're going to have a lag time uh, if you're capturing small fish in the non-directed fishery. It's going to be a while before that shows up in the directed fishery, and I just think that it's very appropriate to leave both indices in place because uh, it gives you a wider view of what's going on underneath the ocean surface. And also, if you lay it specifically on the set line survey, uh, you're really not going to be speaking to conservation. You're only going to be touching on that equity component and BSAI. I think that we can all agree that the Aleutian Island chain is not impenetrable. I was looking at some nitrate seed juvenile migration studies. Uh, there was 120,000 tags that were uh, put on fish on both sides of the Aleutian chain, and 25% um, of the BSAI fish that were tagged, there wasn't a number of tagged fish, but 25% of them ended up on the other side of the Aleutian chain. So we know that there's a migration, we know that there's influence across the coastwide stock. So we hope that we don't lose sight of that. This is not just an equity issue, at least in our mind. I'll spend the balance of the time on what we would support, and I'm looking at uh, my reproduction of figure ES2 in the analysis now. And it just strikes me, uh, there was some talk yesterday about the 1396 threshold where the ground fish tack is actually constraining before the PSC tack is constraining, and it was said or stated that that was just one snapshot. Uh, my understanding is that snapshot is on the recent uh, 2016 through 2019 years, and I'm not sure, given that we uh, all of the uh, good measures implemented by A80 to reduce bycatch, why we would be looking prior to that and incorporating that into studies going forward. Uh, this is a, a low abundance issue again in a lot of people's eyes. Alternative T does not reach down um, below that threshold and address really abundance-based management. We don't see it as abundance-based alternative. Alternative three and four do. Um, if we had to make a call right now, we'd probably support alternative three with um, some options. And definitely option one, um, a three-year rolling average on the indices. And option three, um, some type of a performance standard, though I don't think that the ones that we're looking at, maybe in combination, are really enough to be flexible for the fleet in times where their encounter rates uh, dictate something different than the indices suggest. If you apply the a performance standard to alternative three, you'd actually bring some of those uh, caps down, uh, incentivize the fleet to fish even better when they can, and maybe it provides some flexibility when they find they cannot. And if, uh, lastly, if you look, if you're looking at what I'm looking at, um, you'll notice the performance of the fleet compared to where they'd be expected to fish. It kind of clusters and you can see, uh, you know, really what might be able to be expected of them um, moving forward. Uh, recognize the amount of time. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Braden. Questions from council members? Merrill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Braden. Uh, from your perspective, what is the trigger that makes a distinction between alternative two not being uh, adequate or appropriate from your perspective and alternative three? Is it the specific lower bound of the limit? Could you explain that a little bit for me, please? Yes, Mr. Merrill, uh, to the chair, thank you for the question. Um, in terms of how the fleets perform, uh, the, as has been stated, the, the caps don't seem to be constraining uh, if, well, ground fish tack and not the PSC caps and alternative two. If you move to three, you're, you're actually looking at um, asking the fleet to perform where they have been capable of performing with the tools that they have in their toolbox. Um, and if you add some an incentive on top of that to maybe uh, you know perform at 90%, um, with the, some flexibility to apply that uh, later in a performance type standard, you're addressing low levels of abundance. You're addressing a, a status, stock status that most of us are concerned about, especially downstream. So uh, we just 
visually looking at it, we, we just are not seeing alternative to reaching to the really the intent of this action um, and alternatives to and 4G, but F4 may be leaving the fleet without some tools that they need or uh, constraints that are too difficult to comply with. Don't see any further questions. Thanks, Mr. Braden. Thank you for the opportunity. Doug Loomis. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. You got me? Good morning. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. My name is Todd Loomis, and I'm here today representing Ocean Peace. Our company owns and operates four Amendment 80 vessels. I have been part of every major Amendment 80 halibut reduction that we've been able to achieve in the last 15 years. In each instance, the ability to reduce halibut was rooted in a major event that offered a new tool or circumstance to allow for the reduction. For example, Amendment 80 implementation ended the race for fish and enabled fishermen to make better choices to avoid halibut. Excluder development enabled us to exclude halibut larger than our target species when they couldn't be avoided. Deck sorting has allowed us to reduce the mortality of halibut that we can't avoid or exclude. And finally, our halibut avoidance program reined in poor performers and likely contributed to one historical poor performer retiring from the fishery. At implementation, the Amendment 80 sector consisted of 10 companies and today that number stands at five. Less efficient platforms have been retired, poor performing companies have been bought out, and every available tool noted above has been fully implemented to reduce our halibut bycatch to the level it is today. The progress we've made is significant, but with all tools implemented, we now vacillate at a greatly reduced level where our encounter rates and mortality ebb and flow with environmental conditions on the grounds. During cold years, when there's a southern extent to the ice edge and a well-defined cold pool, we are able to find dense aggregations of our target species that are largely segregated from halibut. During warm years, however, our target species are widely dispersed and intermixed with halibut throughout the Bering Sea. Our experience is that during warm years, our CPUE decreases and halibut encounters increase, which confounds our ability to handle any further reductions. We will continue to do everything we can to avoid halibut and reduce their mortality, but the magnitude of cuts in alternatives two through four are simply not practicable, and there are no new tools or programs proposed that would allow us to handle cuts of these magnitudes. Thank you for the opportunity to comment, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Loomis. Questions? Mr. Twice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Loomis, thank you for your testimony. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts for the council relative to um, how to structure an abundance-based uh, approach? Um, I, I understood your testimony about tools and I thought that was important. Um, but I'm asking you maybe to take one step back from that and just give us some thoughts, at least from the perspective of your company, about what the best structure for an abundance-based approach might look like. Uh, thank you for the question through the chair, Mr. Twight. Uh, I, I think our, if from our company's perspective, we are gravely concerned with the abundance-based management approach. And I, I don't have any concerns with, I mean, setting limits based on abundance sounds very reasonable. It sounds like it's what we do for everything else. But when the indices that you're looking at using are not correlated or are negatively correlated with what those limits will be, I think that's cause for concern and a strong signal that you should maybe pause and think about what you're doing and what the impacts might be. The, the package does contemplate the use of permit standards. So I think if, if 
the council chooses to set abundance-based limits, you have to be very cautious that you provide enough headroom in the limits to allow for any performance-based um, uh, standards to be achievable. The, the sector has shown that we have an ability to fish below our limits, and I have every faith that we're going to continue to look for new tools, and if they're discovered, they'll be implemented, and bycatch will continue to come in lower than the cap if we're able to do so. hope that answered your question. It did. Um, I wondered if you also wanted to comment on how we might construct an index. Uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Twight, I don't have, given the, the lack of correlation and the, the negative correlation, if you will, I, I just have strong, I don't really have any recommendations. I mean, my, I think, uh, approach would be to um, be very cautious about proceeding with an abundance base. That's why I, I, in my written comments, I suggested status quo was really the only thing supported by the analysis, um, but you could look at a performance standard. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Loomis, for your testimony. I, I want to ask about uh, your comments on a performance standard. I think a uh, performance standard may be a, a less familiar concept uh, to how that users. And so um, you mentioned uh, that, that a performance standard approach could uh, be worth considering, uh, but that there should be a, a lot of headroom between whatever performance standard or annual limit, as we're calling it, and one of our options between the, the annual limit and the PSD limit. Why is that? I think a lot of people have trouble with that concept. Um, thank you, Ms. Baker, through the chair. I think the, the idea of a performance standard, it, it has, has to be achievable. If you, um, you know, the number 1396, for example, has been, has been cited uh, both in the analysis and I think it got picked up on in, in public comments is perhaps a, a number that should be selected as a target. But it, Ground Fish Forum has shown that that number is not achievable by every company uh, with current measures being fully employed. So if you were to have a halibut limit set at 1396 or anything below, having a performance standard that requires performance at 10% or 20% below that number, it, it's just not practicable. It's just not achievable. You have no way to get there. So in essence, what the performance standard becomes is a cut on top of a cut that you have no hope of achieving. However, if you set the, the limits, um, if, if you make the level of reductions much less, you have headroom to perhaps try to employ the tools that you have available and make it achievable while providing an incentive to keep bycatch low at all times. Thank you, uh, Mr. Loomis. That was helpful. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Ms. Baker. Thank you. And so I appreciate your, your use of, of the 1396 as an example of a number because what I, I, I feel like when you talk about achievable, um, you would understandably be thinking about over a multi-year period rather than in one year because I think when, when the council hears testimony uh, that um, there, the 100,300 and 1,396 metric tons is not achievable uh, for the Amendment 80 sector, at least for each company. They look at Table 2-9 in the analysis and see that there are some years uh, where the sector was below that. And and so, um, can you is that correct? When when you talk about achievable. Um, it, it, relative to a PSC limit from a lookup table or a performance standard, um, that that the 
at least from your perspective, the Amendment 80 sector is looking at achievable over a multi-year period, given what you've said about variable conditions from year to year. Am I understanding that correctly? Through the chair, Ms. Baker, yes, and I'll, I'll refer you to the Groundfish Forum letter. There was a table uh, in the Groundfish Forum letter, and just looking at that 1396 column, um, you can see that anywhere from one to five companies historically have not been able to achieve that 1396 number. And if you look at the the rows where um, you know only one or two companies weren't able to achieve it, there's huge things that happened um, that explain why halibut bycatch was so low. 2020, you had the markets and tatters and people bailing on the flatfish fisheries because uh, um, the ability to, to sell product uh, was greatly reduced in 2020. 2017 was the year after FCA was bought out. So uh, some of those boats were not fishing at the beginning of the year because the new owners were uh, busy getting those boats in shape. So the worst performing company was off the grounds that year. So I think you can't look at these numbers um, for success meeting the bar in a vacuum. You have to look at what was happening in the fishery and what was happening uh, you know, in the world to see if there's some context that explains the sector's ability to have their bycatch be um, you know, lower than perhaps what it was in other years. Thanks for that response, Mr. Lemus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any additional questions for Mr. Lemus? Thank you for your testimony. Next up is Phyllis Swetsoff. German Swetsoff is Julie Raymond Yukubian and Jim Ayers. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, morning. First of all, I'd like to thank you for trying to connect everybody and get information and opinions to everybody during your time. Um, I've been doing the next of your episode. Uh, I'm Phyllis Bethel, uh, speaking for our family, and probably for some of the Albert fishermen as well. Vivian Bedoff, who has been testifying for the last 20 years or more, thought there was anything left to say that you had already heard. So I figured I'd know this. I'd say the emission even before we gave them, at the time when our. If you, oh, sorry. I'm turning it up. I, 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 I'm sorry. We're, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Um, is, I, I don't know if you've got a, a, a place with better connection. Is this. Uh, is this better? I'm on the phone now. Better okay, yep, that's much better. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I had to find a phone that had a mute button. <laughs> Our old phone didn't have a mute button. Okay. Um, let me repeat anything. Yes, no, we're okay. If you would, if you would start over, please. Thank okay. you. Um, I'm Phyllis Fetzoff, and speaking for our family and for the Halbert Fisherman guys on St. Paul Island, most of you know Simeon. Um, he's been testifying and attending meetings for the last 20 years or more. You thought there was anything left for him to say that you hadn't already heard, so I figured I'd call in and put something on the record. <laughs> I've been listening to ABM issues even before it was ABM, called ABM, a time when our little skiff used to go out on a great day would bring in 5,000 pounds. Nowadays, not so much. I realize how important ABM is to everybody and how hard it is to solve. I've been listening to comments in the last couple of days, and I kind of feel sorry for you guys. <laughs> From the peanut gallery here, it seems like it's a, a conglomerate Goliath, though, versus a whole bunch of little Davids. Twenty two years ago, I spoke to the council when I was in Homer, and um, it was spontaneous, but it's and it still is today. Um, but it's no less important to us, to our families here, for our sons and grandsons. Um, our fourteen-year-old grandson is going to be on the boat with Simon this summer, so it's it carries on. We're hoping it's going to be a road he wants to follow as he gets older. And now we're going to be hoping there's a livelihood to carry on um, with stocks going down no matter what and you guys trying to figure that out. 
Last year, St. Paul had a mitigation program for our CDQ fisheries due to COVID, and we all remained safe, even though it was an economic challenge to do so. Our fishermen have opted to do it again this year, because St. Paul was absolutely COVID-free for over a year until last month, when one construction worker who tested negative before getting here was positive four days later. Scared the hell scared the hell out of us. This town went into lockdown and we dodged the bullet, so to speak, because we didn't have any more cases, thank God. The reason I bring this up is because of the impact of the mitigation program to our community. When we didn't have a commercial fishery, um, subsistence halibut, which is so vital to many of us here, the thought of no commercial fishery was an um, immediate alarm. Money isn't the only thing we catch halibut for. Um, it's a vital part of living here. Simeon and his crew, uh, his volunteer crew, went out and caught over 4,000 pounds and distributed it in five-gallon buckets to homes. Um, and so everybody made it through the winter, and we'll probably do the same this summer since we're not going to have a commercial fishery again. You guys know all the specifics and the stats way better than I can ever understand. Um, I'm just hoping you give the little Davids a break, figure out how to lessen the Goliath bycatch impact because they need to fish too, but lessen the impact on the directed health of fishermen of Alaska. That's not easy, I know. I've listened to testimony, and everybody sounds so positive with their with their position. But you guys are working on it, and um, I'd just like to say in closing that we here support abundant space management of halibut bycatch and support the Council's Alternative 4, um, which best addresses our halibut-dependent communities. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Ms. Swetsoff, for your testimony. And council members, Ms. Swetsoff has elected not to take questions. So thanks again for your testimony. I was afraid you guys would ask something that I didn't know have an answer to. <laughs> All right, good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Have a, have a great day. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, up is, next up is Julie raymond Yacobian. Good morning, Mr. Chair and council members. Good morning. My name is Julie Raymond Yacobian. I'm representing Coeric Incorporated. Coeric is the Alaska Native Nonprofit Tribal Consortium for the 20 federally recognized tribes of the Bering Strait region. We believe that management of federal fisheries should promote conservation, ensure the sustainability of fisheries and fishing communities, be underpinned by equity, account for special rights accorded to Alaska Native people, and adhere to the mandates of the national standards. I would also like to echo the comments of Mr. Joel Jackson, who testified earlier this morning, particularly with regard to equity and conservation and wastefulness. Respect towards the marine environment and everything in it is a fundamental traditional value of the indigenous people of our region. Bycatch should always be as low as possible. Waste is disrespectful. Coeric supports the abundance based management of halibut bycatch. The current fixed halibut. The current fixed halibut PSC limits are not consistent with management of other fish and crab species and do not result in an equitable system of management and harvest opportunity for directed halibut users and halibut dependent communities. Please ensure the long-term health and sustainability of halibut by requiring lower bycatch limits during lower levels of halibut abundance. This will help share the conservation mandate and sustain the economies and cultures of halibut dependent communities. We support alternative four. Out of the existing alternatives, we feel that only this alternative meets the important mandates and principles we have noted above. Koyana, for your time. Thank you for your testimony. And council members, uh, she's elected not to take questions. So thanks again for your time this morning. Okay, next up is Jim Ayers, then Dia Kuzman, and then Mateo Pasola. Can you hear me all right, Mr. Chairman? Yes, we can. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, and thank you. And uh, I apologize, uh, Mr. Chairman, members. I'm in a migration and movement mode, and I've been uh, trying to follow this on a couple of different uh, methods. Uh, I'm Jim Ayers. Uh, I speak only for myself, and three minutes require us to be succinct, direct, and uh, hopefully respectful. I do respect each of you and the council and the people involved, including the commercial fishermen who are 
striving to provide food for uh, the world. Previously, I shared my observation that you have a tremendous challenge in accomplishing your goal of healthy biodiverse ecosystems that provide for vibrant fisheries while maintaining and improving conservation and opportunities for communities and the subsistence way of life and other sustainable uses for this and future generations. We talked about your biggest challenge and perhaps primary responsibility as balancing social justice and economic efficiency. This is all made tougher by the complex, uh, the complexities of climate change, resource demand, and population growth. I said the council had lost its way. I want to amend that. The council hasn't yet found its way. You haven't yet found the path to accomplishing the goal, to sustainability, and the balancing of social justice. The path we're on leads to a Bering Sea of targeted commercial fish farm. Communities and indigenous people are major losers. Ecosystem collapse, and there'll only be a few winners, as you can see. Practicability has been misinterpreted, misused, abused, and NOAA must expand its capacity to incorporate and understand traditional knowledge, including them in research to reach co-production. Sustainability includes the food web, other species, habitat, and the subsistence way of life. The status quo definition of practicability is a dangerous fog. Communities, indigenous subsistence opportunities are in serious decline and bycatch is wrong. That's what you're hearing. The state says it's not our responsibility. NIMP says we don't manage halibut as a ground fish. And it's sad to hear references to practicability from both. Many point to IPHC and say it's their fault. Others say let's do more modeling, it'll get better. And then we get into this debate about what is OY. Halibut management is a failure. The issue is how do we get to sustainable yield? In summary, Sapiens government councils have not been here before. It's understandable you have a tremendous challenge. The previous stated stresses, your goal and responsibility is a hell of a challenge. We know that ABM is our best known tool. True sustainability needs this broader view. You have the power and the responsibility to lead the state NIMPS to a sustainable management of halibut. I urge you to move to abundance-based management of halibut and get a just definition of practicability. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ayers. See if there's any questions. Thank you again for your testimony. Dia Kuzman. Kuzman is not available. Move on to Mateo Pasadan. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning. I'll be speaking on Mateo Pasadan. I'm speaking on behalf of the city of St. Paul Island. Uh, St. Paul is a primarily Unangang Aleut community of approximately 400 residents. It was one of the communities featured in the DEIS social Olympic assessment as most engaged and dependent on the halibut resource. It is also the largest majority Unangang community in the world. In light of the SSC's comments on the analysis and the AP's recommendations, we urge the council to follow these and to develop a solid scientific basis for this action. The stakeholders that are affected by this action need an analysis that is well-grounded and defensible scientifically and legally as required by National Standard 2, Best Available Science. If it takes a little more time to achieve this, so be it. A worse outcome would be for an unpolished analysis and the action to be challenged in court, get thrown out, and having to start all over again. Once scientific issues have been addressed, this leads me to the second point, 
That is the overall defensibility, equitability, and sustainability of the action. We have heard a lot about practicability throughout this and other meetings. The proposition appears to be that NS9 practicability trumps everything else, and that practicability does not mean significant constraints on the Amendment 80 sector. That is just not how the national standards are to be weighed and balanced. For example, NS4 equitability, especially as it concerns the identified tribal governments for each village affected by this action, is a key consideration with ramifications outside the Department of Commerce realm. NS4 ties into the relations between tribal and federal governments and treaty rights, as well as the Department of Interior, who oversees these. The relations of each tribal government with the federal government during consultation, for example, are independent of whatever ANCSA or CDQ affiliation these villages might have. NS8, the long-term sustainability of the 17 BSAI held and engaged communities featured in the SIA, is also key to building a legally defensible action. Similarly, environmental justice considerations under NEPA regarding impact of federal policies on minority populations with a heightened standard applicable to Native Americans kick in during the EIS process, review process, and later. So, Council needs an, needs an action that addresses NS4, NS8, NEPA, and the tribal consultation process in a meaningful and legally defensible way. On behalf of the city, I would therefore urge the council to focus less on practicability and more in terms of overall defensibility of the action. And let me just remind the council that in SIPC in 2015, there were a lot of predictions of gloom and doom when the PSC limits were cut. And those predictions just haven't panned out. On the contrary, Amendment 80 adapted and has done pretty well since then, as shown on Table 313 uh, on page 105 of the EIS. On another front, much has been said about National Center 1, often yield, and what it supposedly means. That OY in the context of this action really means maximized benefit of the halibut PSC for the roundfish fisheries. That's just wrong. First of all, OY does not outweigh other national standards, and contrary to the definition being mentioned, if you look at the NIMS guidelines for NS1 OY, it states very clearly, the MSA defines optimum with respect to the yield from a fishery as the amount of fish that will provide the greatest overall benefit to the nation. Let me pause here. It doesn't say overall benefit to one user group. It goes on to uh, include that, uh, say that uh, NS1 needs to uh, consider eco-social factors, ecological, economic, and social factors that council shall uh, consider in management objectives or of their SMPs. On this matter, the NIMS guidelines for NS1 state that examples of those social factors are enjoyment, gain, gain from recreational fishing, preservation of a way of life for fishermen and their families, and dependence of local communities on a fishery. Other factors that may be considered include the effect of past harvest levels have had on fishing communities. Check. The cultural places of subsistence fishing. Check. Obligations under travel treaties. Check. Proportions of affecting minority and low-income groups. Check. And yes, worldwide nutritional use. So all these apply to NS1 optimum yield. Uh, and, it, and it, you know, always kind of brings in a lot of the, the NS, NS1 uh, process, brings in a lot of concepts from NS4 and NS, NS8 uh, in the evaluation. Uh, to summarize my comments on NS1, the long-term nationwide availability of, of uh, Cajun spiced Popeye sandwiches is a good thing, but does not trump the survival of, a, of unique tribal communities and uh, nations. And this is a false choice anyway. With a balanced MSA approach, Native communities can be sustained and Americans can still have access to affordable fish products at Popeye's or Walmart, while on occasion enjoying a romantic dinner over wild-caught Alaska halibut or salmon at a fine and expensive restaurant. Again, this is a false choice. Going forward, once the SSC analytical comments are addressed, the city supports alternative four as being most responsive to the collective balancing of NS1, NS4, NS8, and NS9. Finally, the city wanted to note that the SIA is a much improved document in terms of the guidance it provides to the council on NS4 and the tribal indigenous rights it encompasses. There are a total of 573 tribal nations in the U.S., of which 229 are located in Alaska. This SIA sets a new standard for future council analyses on actions affecting Alaska Native peoples. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pakalan. Questions from council members? Thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Next up is TJ Dernan, then Linda Benkin, then Natasha Hayden. 
Yeah, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Thank you. My name is TJ Dernan. Um, I'm a captain with O'Hara Corporation, um, which is an Amendment 80 company. I've been in my current position since 2002. Um, I started my career in Alaska Fisheries in 1991, starting as a crab processor, working my way up to the deck, mate, and then finally captain. Uh, I've been involved in brown fish fisheries since 1995. And that's coincidentally the year that I built my first halibut excluder. This isn't a new issue at all. Um, I just want to offer a little bit of perspective from the fishing grounds that uh, I think it may be a little bit lost in some of the testimony. Um, we've done a lot of really hard work, um, lots of development, um, time, money, loss, catch. And with all the tools that we have, we've achieved some great success in halibut reduction. Um, but it's my strong contention that we don't have anything new um, where we can achieve any kind of reductions like our suggested in alternatives two through four. Um, there's just we just don't have anything. Um, you, you know we're we're trying all the time with uh, with gear, with communications, um, even some underwater video to try to ID things before they uh, arrive in the caught end and. Uh, and we, I really feel strongly that we've reached the limit of how much we can reduce our bycatch. Um, there's just very little left for us to do. Um, these fisheries need halibut to be prosecuted. And it's my contention that that a 45% cut would result in massive underutilization of the resource. Um, there's very little that we can do. But yeah, And also the... Um, Halibut doesn't exist in a vacuum for us. Um, we're, we operate under five or six different hard caps. And, uh, you know, we may find an area that's clean of halibut, but it has too many cod and we have to leave. So it, it's, it, it's quite a, a juggling act we have to do trying to bring our quotas down all at the same time. And having a look at what is on the table right now, um, based on my experience on the grounds, I just don't think that we can achieve these reductions, particularly in warm years. Um, during, in, you know, when the environmental conditions are, are cold and the fish are aggregated, we can do it. But certainly a, a, a fixed annual cap is not something that is sustainable with big cuts. And uh, that's about all I have to say. And I have, I'm happy to take questions if anybody uh, has any for me. Mr. Merrill has a question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dern. I was wondering if you could describe for me a little bit what kind of communication you undertake on the ground uh, in order to avoid halibut. How does that work operationally? Uh, operationally, within our company and also among companies, um, if anybody has a particularly dirty halibut tow, um, it's generally broadcast at, at, to at least one or two other captains and then the Word gets around very quickly. Um, we, we all speak to each other. As you know, the fleet is quite small. And uh, so everybody knows everybody. Um, and, you know, most of us work with four or five different boats. And generally speaking, the first, uh, after the haul is made, the first report's halibut. And that, that's that been that way for years and years. Um, the very first thing, I had 20 tons and we deck sorted 105 halibut. And, uh, you know, the, there'll be talk about whether or not it's too muddy that the excluders are, are silting up the halibut and the mortality is high, um, you know, it goes into some depth, generally speaking, between boats. Uh, but this happens on a real-time basis daily on the grounds. Any questions for Mr. Dernan? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next up is Linda Benkin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Linda Benkin testifying for Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association. I'm going to start with a quote that might be familiar to some of you, which is, all models are wrong, some are useful. That quote's attributed to George Box, who was my father's PhD advisor in statistics, Wicked limericks and some collaborations that combine the two. 
When I was growing up, George spent a lot of evenings at our house when he and my father would top each other with stories of how statistics and models had been misused or misrepresented. He even wrote a song for a nerdy math conference called I Am the Very Model of a Professor Statistical, set to a Gilbert and Sullivan tune about a modern major in general, that included this line. I never stoop to folly nor to action reprehensible. I always state assumptions whether they're ludicrous or sensible. While their facility with statistics and models did not wear off on me, I'm reasonably good at limericks, and I did gain a healthy skepticism with regards to models. In our written comments, I described what to us appeared to be fairly jarring contradictions between reality and the results of the model. For example, the projection that halibut TCYs in the Bering Sea would increase by a factor of four, and Gulf TCYs would never return to 2019 levels or that the ratio of bycatch reduction to directed fishery benefits were minimal. So we were very relieved that the SSC identified model parameters that were missing or improperly specified and indicated in their minutes that the simulation model could not be used as the basis for the analysis. And I would draw your attention to the strong statement in bold at the bottom of page 11 from the SSC minutes. But here's where I get worried and the stories around the dining room table come in. I heard an AAD testifier state yesterday that the directed fishery and poor CD&E benefited greatly from the efforts of the A80 fleet in 2015 to reduce bycatch through duck sorting. But in the same testimony state that based on the analysis, i.e. the model, there were no direct benefits to the directed fishery of further bycatch reductions. Clearly both can't be right. The area of poor CD&E directed fishery did survive to fish in 2015 because A80 reduced bycatch and committed to doing so. They will continue to survive to fish if bycatch is reduced in the fishery. The benefits are direct and real. By way of reminder, O26 bycatch is directly deducted from TCUI in the area that the bycatch occurs before the directed fishery catch limits are set. U26 has a significant downstream effect because of halibut migration, including a political ramifications because of Canada's frustration with the U.S. inability to grapple with this bycatch issue. But the U026, the over 26 since bycatch is directly deducted in area. And that's currently 60 to 80% of at least the four CD, D and E bycatch. So very direct, which leads to my, our first request well, relative to the next iteration of this analysis. Please clearly direct the analyst to remove misleading results from the analysis, including probabilities of future PSCs landing in the various tiers of the lookup table and the estimated ratios of change and how the fishery catch limits relative to changes in PSC. Caveats and listed assumptions are not enough. These misleading tables and documents need to be removed so people don't come to erroneous conclusions. Also, because those impacts and benefits in the Bering Sea are immediate and significant, please incorporate the AP recommendations to include impacts and benefits on a more geographically specific areas as a result of the interannual variability in PSC use, as the SSC described it. As both the AP and SSC noted, slight shifts in where bycatch occurs has major and very direct implications for the directed fisheries and the fishery dependent communities of the Bering Sea. Relative to, quote, the simulated effects of future spoiling biomass, we would ask that the council ask the analyst to include a clear explanation of why and how the spawning biomass is protected from bycatch. The IPHC moved to the SPR approach precisely because the IPHC cannot control bycatch, hence cannot protect the spawning biomass and maintain a constant fishing intensity without reducing catch limits in the directed fishery. In other words, the directed fishery is the conservation between bycatch and the spawning biomass, all of which works until the directed fishery is done. The spawning biomass may not be affected by bycatch as long as the IPHC can reduce directed fisheries, but that does not work at below B20, very low levels of spawning biomass, or as the analysis notes, at high, very high PSC levels. And we believe that should be more fully explained in the analysis. 
Ooh, I'm running out of time. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I will just wrap up to say we agree with the previous testimony that it's very important to also include a more thorough discussion of OY and how that applies in the directed halibut fishery as well as, as, well as other ground fish fisheries. We do, of course, of course, support you moving ahead with ABM as it's very consistent with your conservation management of other species. We believe the two indices you've identified are solid in that they capture the full range of sizes in the of the halibut stock relative to abundance. Um, we support alternative four, but believe there need to be some changes made in the analysis before um, you're ready for final action. And thank you. I'll stop there, but I'm very happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Bankin. Questions from council members? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Benkin, for your testimony. And I'm sorry if I missed it, but with reference to the changes in the analysis uh, that should be made, you listed a few, um, one related to SPR management uh, by the IPC. But could I also infer from your testimony that uh, a large number of the changes that you would like to see are those recommended by the SSC? Um, to the chair, Ms. Baker, yes, we I would definitely um, support the recommendations made by the SSC and the fact that really the the bottom line for those recommendations is that the model, the simulation model, should not be the basis for this analysis. And I would just draw your attention again to the bolded statement on page 11 um, for their minutes, but then also. Um, believe that you need a, a stronger discussion relative to how the SPR functions to protect the spawning biomass and how the IPHC manages with that to protect the spawning biomass from the impacts of bycatch and also a discussion of optimal yield and how social equity plays into optimal yield um, and how you respond to that relative to balancing national standards um, with a look at all the fisheries in the Bering Sea, not just A80, other ground fish fisheries, but particularly the, the directed halibut fishery. Thank you, Ms. Benkin, for that clarification. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Baker. Further questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Take one more uh, testifier before our morning break. Natasha Hayden. Morning, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Um, before I get started, I had signed up to, to testify on behalf of my tribe. I want to make it clear that I've decided to testify on behalf of myself, that I'm not speaking on behalf of my tribe um, in any way um, in my comments today, if that's okay. That is, that is noted. Thank you, Ms. Hayden. Okay, thanks. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you, Chairman and uh, fellow council members. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak. I'm supportive of abundance-based management. Um, I want to speak on behalf of myself as an uh, indigenous person living in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, my family's been participating in fisheries for over 7,000 years. I've heard many very smart, you know, well-read people give you um, solutions to this problem. I know that this is a difficult problem, but I don't think it's as difficult as it is um, made to be at this point. Um, I'm going to just draw a comparison to to this issue before the council right now to where the United States was prior to the Civil War when plantation owners had railed and, you know, pounded their fists at the idea of not being able to access slave labor to work their plantations and their farms and to produce their crops. Um, history is not kind when we look back at that model of business. I believe that the council has an opportunity now 
to weigh the importance of an extractive process that is trading profits for the corporations for an entire people of a region who have inhabited that region for thousands of years. At this point, I think if you make a decision to not take any sort of qualitative action that will tip the scale back to closer to where it needs to be, that history is not going to look kind upon that decision. Um, I want to be very respectful. I've been trying to participate in the process as the process is defined and have found that there hasn't, it hasn't seemed to be productive. And so I want to apologize for making such dramatic comments, but I don't know if anybody else that signed up to testify today is going to highlight what I see to be a very, very accurate comparison of where we are now and how fisheries are managed under an existing federal law to what the existing federal laws were prior to the Civil War that allowed for some people to prosper at the expense of others. And so um, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're probably not going to ask me any questions, and I'm okay with that. I really do appreciate having an opportunity to make these statements to you today on the record. Um, and I wish you luck, and um, I hope for the, the best possible outcome. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Hayden. Any questions? Ms. Baker. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Hayden, and I, I do appreciate your participation in the process. And so I wonder, you mentioned uh, you would like the council to select an alternative, although we're not at final action uh, for ABM, that uh, at least uh, tips the balance of the scale more toward equity. And do you have an opinion at this stage? on which alternative in front of the council that might be, or have you not formed an opinion about that yet? Thank you, Ms. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, <laughs> I got caught up in the emotion and forgot to say that I am a supportive of alternative four um, in, at this time, um, but I am also supportive of, of taking some time to for, uh, thoroughly incorporate the recommendations by the SSC and to include the opportunity for your new tribal liaison to have an opportunity to interface with the Alaska Native tribes, not just in the Bering Sea, but all coastal Alaska Native tribes to give them an opportunity to participate in this process. And so um, I think that they, I think there's some good work that's been done. I think there's more work that could be done. Um, you know, and if you choose to move forward with an alternative, a preferred alternative at this point, then alternative four would be my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Any further questions? Thanks again for your testimony, Ms. Hayden. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Okay take a, a break and come back at uh, 10 o'clock Alaska time and resume public testimony.
back to order. Uh, we can um, start up here with uh, with public testimony again here. Uh, first up is going to be uh, Sam Wright, then Dave Kubiak, then Linda Larson. Right. Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, a little background on me. My name is Tom Wright. Uh, 45 year Alaska resident, born and raised here. I currently live in Eagle River, Alaska. I grew up in Homer, Alaska. Started fishing like everybody around there about age 13, salmon tendering, halibut fishing. Uh, then I entered the crab fishery in 1993, became captain in 99. When crab rationalization happened, I was forced to move to the HD sector, as most people know now, the amendment 80 sector. Um, that was in 2006. Currently, I'm the captain of the factory Color Unimac, owned by North Star Fish. Uh, me and my wife also own um, the Fish Hunt Charters in Alaska and Anglo RV Resort and in Milchick, Alaska. So to me, you know, halibut is a big part of my life, whether it's out in the Bering Sea or here. Um, you know, out, out there for us, it's a daily struggle in the Bering Sea. Um, it's the first thing we think about, the last thing we think about before we go to bed, um, are our halibut numbers. It's just, it's it's literally the biggest constraint that we have. And um, I think that we've done great Thank the you. last year with excluders. Mm -hmm. You know, on the Unimac alone, we've probably spent over half a million dollars over the last 15 years in research and design and buying these excluders. Um, trips to Denmark, trying to figure out the right size grids, the right length, and everything to make them work. And, you know, we're trying to solve the impossible. Um, what I mean by impossible is, you know, as everybody knows, halibut's a bottom fish, along with the sole we catch. So, you know, they all have the same habits. They live in the same spots. Um, so it's very, very hard to try to get rid of something the same size as something you're trying to catch. Um you know, as a fleet, I think we've moved mountains on uh, halibut avoidance, deck sorting, communication between us all. Um, you know, it's it's a big disadvantage to us to try to use these excluders because of our target loss and everything else, you know, which comes with high fuel costs and everything else um, that goes with it. Currently, you know, my crew is 36 on my vessel. You know, 36 people, you got to try to make money. Uh, so they can feed their families and all that stuff. I don't know of anything else that we can really do to um, lower our bycatch any more than it already is. Um, you know, we've there's no magic trap out there that's going to make it happen. Um, we've literally reached the end of it as far as I'm concerned of what we can do to uh, oh get rid of these halibut. I don't really have a lot more to say. Um, question? Thank you, Mr. Wright. Let's see if there are any. Not seeing any questions, so thank you for your testimony. All right. Thank you very much for having me. You guys have a nice day. You too. Next up is Dave Kubiak. Yes, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Dan, good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm calling from Kodiak. Um, I'm speaking in uh, in uh, representing myself, and I suppose my uh, my crew. Um, I've been fishing uh, halibut for about 35 years, um, and it has. Uh, in years past, anyway, it formed uh, the basis for for you know my growth as a fisherman into salmon and and uh, uh, purchasing larger a larger vessel and the whole the whole thing. Halibut was the center, and <clears throat> in the last few years, of course, halibut abundance has declined for various reasons, and. Uh, one of the, the big reasons, I think, is, uh, is in fact, the bycatch out in the Bering Sea in the halibut nursing grounds. Uh, regardless of uh, what rumors I've read that the halibut don't migrate to the east, uh, 
we know they do, and we know that the, the uh, halibut savings area is, is critical to us. And uh, when we see this bycatch going on that, that has impacted our fisheries to the point where, you know, I've lost 75% of the, the quota that I've, uh, that I've earned and that I've purchased uh, through loans through the National Marine Fisheries Service. And uh, we definitely, uh, we definitely uh, here, my crew and I anyway, support the council's alternative four, which, uh, which addresses, best addresses the, the needs of the halibut users. It was interesting to hear uh, people say that there's some way to get rid of these halibut. It seems to me that they're, they're doing a pretty good job of it at, at the current rate. Um, the resources, uh, pressures are being borne by by the directed halibut users, uh, fishermen, uh, um, you know, they're catching more halibut, uh, destroying more halibut in the Bering Sea than we're, than our than our entire quota. So uh, this this uh, this is ju- it's just not right. And uh, and you know, while at, at one time, uh, in one sense, I understand how people are worried about their their right to make a living. Uh, there's uh, tens of thousands of people who depend on this resource and. And are seeing it wither away, and uh, it's it's a tragedy. Um, and I don't think everything that can be done is being done. Uh, it will be done, it, uh, as some other callers have uh, have noted that when things get shut down, creativity kicks into gear. Um, I just uh, the status quo is uh, is forcing forcing us out of, of the halibut fishery, and has made it so it's more like a, a hobby than anything. And, I, and, and in some ways, if I were if I were uh, uh, conspirator or conspiritually minded, I'd say, well, that's the intention. But again, uh, thank you for all your hard work. And please, uh, please support uh, uh, number four, uh, abundance-based management, uh, halibut bycatch. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Kubiak. Questions from the council members? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Dan. Bye-bye. Next up is Linda Larson, then Arnie Fugelbach, then Mary Beth Tooley, and Jason Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. My name is Linda Larson. I'm an attorney at Nosman LLP, and I've been working with the Amendment 80 sector on the legal aspects of this proposed action. At its October meeting, the council refocused the analysis to balancing the national standards. I would like to suggest to the council that national standard nine should be the guide for your further consideration of this action. The order in which the standard is worded suggests how to go about it. Conservation and management measures shall, to the extent practicable, A, minimize bycatch, and B, to the extent the bycatch can't be avoided, minimize mortality. So the threshold question posed by the statute is whether an action is practicable. In other words, practicability sets a limit. The statute directs that the policy goal of minimizing bycatch must be balanced against the amount of bycatch minimization that is practicable. Unfortunately, the statute doesn't define what practical means. So that means that the ordinary definition of the word and common sense applies. What's pragmatic? What are the consequences of implementing a measure? What are the costs of doing so to the sector that should, would be constrained by the action? And in the fishery context, the key question is whether the proposal prevents or eliminates the target fishery. The courts have said that bycatch minimization cannot be used as a tool for eliminating an entire gear type. Consequently, not all bycatch reduction measures that are possible meet this requirement of practicability. In this instance, the council has a lot of information about what is practicable because the Amendment 80 sector has reduced its halibut PSC usage considerably over the life of the program, and we know the tools that they use to get to that reduction. But we cannot assume that history will repeat itself. What you're hearing from the sector is that they have used all of the measures available to them to get to the prior reductions, and that they are out and that they are out and that they are out and that they are out. Sorry, I'm getting a huge echo. Are you as well? Yes, I apologize. Need that um, other members of the public to please mute their phones while I'm not testifying. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
So anyway, the sector is afraid that they won't be able to continue to fish without radically changing their operations to the point of tying up vessels. This is why practicability needs to be the driver of the council action. If practicability is made the focus, then the chances of coming up with a workable solution increase greatly. I am not suggesting that the council ignore the halibut stock or the halibut fishery, but rather that practicability cannot be set aside in a considered last. National Standard 9 requires a focus on what is practicable as an initial matter. The broader questions are part of your consideration of National Standard 1. Thank you for the opportunity to comment and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Mr. Kress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, uh, Ms. Larson, I, I guess um, one of my questions is if, focus, if we focus on nine, there are, uh, we've heard public testimony and, there, and, and in some of the analysis, we, we see that the, um, if practicable is used and the Amendment 80 sector continues fishing, uh, there is the remote, but it is out there, chance that uh, they could keep driving down to the point where there's no directed fishery. And under that nine, I think there is, you know, we can't, practicable can't uh, be above eliminating uh, an entire fishery. So how do we, how do we put those two together? Uh, to the chair, uh, thank you for that question, uh, Mr. Cross. You know, the, I can only go tell you about the case law and the case, the cases have really focused on what's the impact on the sector that's being constrained. And that's true also of the legislative history. Um, the sponsors of the Magnuson Act talked about bycatch uh, minimization, not intending to be um, a burden that eliminates the sector that's being constrained. Um, so that is really the focus of National Standard 9. I think the larger question that you're asking really goes to net benefits to the nation under National Standard 1 and in that more general consideration of op what optimum yield means. You know, the, the optimum is defined in the statute as um, the yield from a fishery that will provide the greatest overall benefit to the nation, particularly with respect to food production and recreational opportunities and taking into account the protection of marine ecosystems. So that's, so I think what we really have is a system that under National Standard 9, you have this mini balancing that's going on, if you will. So there's the internal National Standard 9 balancing where the goal, the policy goal of minimizing bycatch, which I think everybody can agree on, has to be weighed against what are the impacts to the sector that's gonna be constrained. And then in National Standard 1, under optimum yield, you have to look at all of these considerations and, and you know, the courts have described National Standard 1 as sort of the decision, focusing, the decision forcing mechanism where all of these sometimes competing national standards have to be weighed and you have to make a decision um, based on that balancing. And I think that's the direction that the council is rightly headed toward. But I think in this situation, your job is really complicated by the fact that you don't actually control the catch limits on one of the impacted fisheries. So I, I hope that answers your question. I think it's it's kind of mushy, and so I kind of gave a mushy answer. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Mr. Clayton. I'm sorry, I can't hear Mr. Twight. I'm sorry, yeah, he's uh, muted in the Adobe system. Stand by for just a, just a second. Thanks, Mr. Chair, um, and, and thank you, Ms. Larson, for your testimony. There's a lot of debate that we've been having um, 
around the, the issue of practicability. I'm sure you've listened to a lot of it over the last day and a half, just in this, in this public testimony as well as previous. And one of the elements that I think I hear in the debate is an, an idea that practicability as part of a standard uh, has had a, a meaning that has shifted over time. Um, since it was initially incorporated as, as part of one of the national standards in, in the original Magnuson-Stevens Act. And that as it shifted over time, part of that shift has been that it's been broadened to also include um, practicability from the standpoint of other users, not just the affected industry. And when I heard your testimony today, it, it seemed to me it was um, looking at practicability from the perspective of the affected industry, and you described some about the legislative intent as well as judicial intent as for why that is. But I, I'm interested in your thoughts about should we be viewing practicability as well through the lens of some of the other users and folks who are expected to, who, who are affected by this action? Uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Twite, thank you for that question. I, you know, I really don't, uh, I'm not aware of any legal support for that uh, expansion of practicability to include anybody other than the regulated entity. Um, I do think that it's quite clear in the legislative history and in the case law so far about National Standard 9 that the focus is on the fishery that will be burdened by the bycatch minimization. And that frankly is very consistent with environmental law generally. Um, if you look at, and the courts would look at other uh, regulatory programs um, such as the Clean Water Act uh, or the Clean Air Act. And practicability is always evaluated by the regulator in terms of what will happen to the regulated entity. And I think one way you can think about that is that the broader policies are set by the governing statute. So for example, in the Clean Air Act, you know, the governing policy is that we want to have the cleanest air possible. And with respect to the Management Act, we want to have sustainable fisheries. Um, we want to prevent overfishing. And we also want to allow a viable and vibrant and sustainable commercial fishery. So um, that's the broader policy. And as I was uh, saying in response to Mr. Cross's question, that's kind of a given. And that's your balancing uh, for optimum yield. But National Standard 9 is very specifically focused on the fishery that's going to be constrained by the bycatch. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clay. <clears throat> Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Larson. I um you pointed out the practicability provision of National Standard 9, and we've heard a lot of, of that in testimony today. And I, I don't disagree that that's, that's included in National Standard 9, and we need to appreciate that factor. I also I don't disagree that, that National Standard 9 is applying to the bycatch fishery or the regulated entity in this case. But I wanted to understand if your testimony was to that what the definition of practicable could be. In your testimony, are you assuming that practicable means that there are no chances or no risks or no years or conditions in which there would be a constraint on the directly regulated sector? Because I think that's a key part of us understanding what your intent under the word practicable is. Through the chair, uh, Ms. Kimball, um, that's a great question. And I think it really goes to the heart of what the council has to decide. Um, and I'm not suggesting that there can never be a year in which um, the regulated entity would be constrained. And I think, um, you know, the, the 
legislative history uh, speaks to what's an unfair burden on um, the fishermen that are going to be constrained and not wanting to drive um, the constrained uh, fishery out of being as a result of these um, uh, bycatch measures. But do I'm not testifying that um, there can't be more constraining years than others. That's certainly not my intent. And if, if I uh, gave that impression, I, I apologize. No, thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Kimball. Mr. Mezzaro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Ms. Larson, for your testimony. It's an interesting discussion so far. Uh, my question for you is this. In 2016, this council, which I was not on at the time, I was on the advisory panel, but this council took substantial action to reduce how the PSC to this fleet. And at the time, the council was unaware of the benefits of deck sorting, which is really the, the thing of all things in the last five years that's helped the Amendment 80 fleet keep their PSC levels low. So they made that decision without knowledge, complete knowledge of the benefits of deck sorting. So in this case, we're considering reductions in PSC without knowledge of future innovations that may reduce PSC. And so if the last council made that decision and it was in the realm of practicability, how would we not be if we make a decision based on one of the alternatives without knowledge of a future innovation or other behavior that may reduce PSC so that it won't impact the productivity of the amendment in place. Uh, through the chair, um, Mr. Mesereau, um, thank you for that question. So I think the difference between now and 2016 is that in 2016, deck sorting was actually something that had been done at, uh, or was being done as an experimental um, measure at that point and the initial returns uh, were were uh, encouraging. So I think the council did have some knowledge that that was a tool that um, that could have been used. Um, I just think that nobody knew how it was gonna work out. Um, I think you have a different situation now where um, you know how deck setting, deck sorting works and it looks like um, you know you can only reduce mortality by 50% just because of the amount of time that uh, halibut has to be out of the water and basic biology. Um, so you know we're I, I'm kind of rambling but what I want to say is now we have that experience and we know that there are some limitations on the tools um, that have been used between now and, and 2016. Um, so I am confident that if one of the member of the public, if someone from the agency, um, if someone on the council came up with a new tool um, that was implementable, um, that could result in a sustained measurable further reduction of halibut bycatch, that the sector would be very open to looking at that and seeing what could be done. But I think what the problem is, is that we all know that there's a, a line at which things are not practical anymore. And what we're hearing from the sector after these more recent years of experience is that they are either at the line or pretty darn close to it. So that is the problem right now. Thank you. Don't see any further questions. Thank you, Ms. Larson, for your testimony. Thank you for the opportunity. Next up is Arnie Fugelbach. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? We can. Good morning. Great. Uh, good morning. For the record, my name is Arnie Fugelbog. I work for North Star Fishing Company. We have four Amendment 80 catcher processors that fit fl fish, flat fish in the Bering Sea. 
We are a flatfish dependent company, one of two companies in figure 315 on page 102, that flatfish make up the vast majority of harvest and revenue. We fish flatfish year round as we only have small amounts of rockfish in the Bering Sea and the Gulf. So we don't have any other options to switch, switch to any other fisheries. As a flatfish dependent company, we are a halibut dependent company as well. From our perspective, alternative one is the only alternative that is practicable. We have used 90% of our PSC limit on average between 2016 and 2019. In high encounter warm bottom temperature years, we have used 93% of our limit. Therefore, alternatives two through four are simply impracticable for us. And this is not for a lack of trying, lack of incentives, or any resistance to reduce bycatch to the extent practical. We have embraced every tool and it has come at great cost to the company. There seems to be an assumption that Amendment 80 companies have been able to catch ground fish after the 25% reduction in 2015, and the current limits are therefore practicable. The truth is that we aren't catching our ground fish allocations now, and our company's catch has dropped substantially since 2015. The cost to minimize the halibut bycatch is substantial. We have looked at our ground fish production over the last five years since the council reduced the minimum 80 halibut PSC limit. Our total annual ground fish catch has steadily, steadily declined that is now 20% lower than 2015. Flatfish tax, meanwhile, have remained steady during these five years. Catch per hour, per tow, and per fishing day are down significantly since the council implemented the PSC limit reduction. Fishing trips are also proportionally longer, and it is extremely difficult to get more fishing days in a season with the shipyard requirements to keep old boats well-maintained. But we have increased our annual fishing days by nearly 15% since 2015. Our company's significantly reduced groundfish harvest, primarily driven by halibut bycatch measures, have reduced our average annual revenue by 15%, totaling $45 million over that time period, which is standardized for price. This loss of groundfish is inversely correlated with halibut encounter rates over the same time period peaking in 2019. When the council makes policy decisions, they are not in a vacuum. This action and previous council actions are part of the cumulative impacts on our sector. Our company, as well as others, have followed the intent of Amendment 80 and 97 to replace and rebuild existing vessels. We are currently um, have our new catcher processor on its way to Seattle to replace a 40-year-old vessel that we need to take out of service. We hope that as the council looks at the, this action, they consider the cumulative impacts of previous actions and the impact that that will have on our revenues in order to capitalize this new vessel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm open for questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pugabug. Mr. Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Pugabug, uh, given, um, you know, one of the things we're looking at is practicability and and things that we can do or that the Amendment 80 sector can do um, in the future is your, you mentioned your new boat, is is that boat got have any things technology-wise, innovative-wise um, that is going to improve halibut bycatch? Is it, uh, is the new boat have things that are going to make it uh, uh, better on halibut bycatch, easier to catch uh, flatfish. Give me a sense on that, please. Yes, uh, through the chair, Mr. Cross. Um, you know, you know, we have to replace these old boats as as the council has supported, and um, the primary reason to build a new boat is to um, make that they're safer, they're larger, they're more efficient. They have improved improved crew accommodations, modern processing factories. We have a meal plant on this one to improve utilization, and making us competitive, you know, to compete in the global whitefish market. Um, we have better stations for deck sorting, which will make it easier on the crew and easier on the observers, but it's certainly not going to change the functionality of deck sorting. It's not going to change the mortality rate. It's just going to make um, it less labor intensive. Um, you know, it, it's it's gotten really really difficult. The, this loss of production is really driven by the fact that we just we can't move the same amount of ground fish through the factory um, when you're doing test toes, when you're deck sorting, when you're doing short toes to maintain higher halibut viability, when you're moving after every high encounter toe. Um, just the loss of that production 
um, the time of deck sorting. We lose a tow a day doing that. We can't make up that production. There's not enough extra hours in the day. And there's, as we found out, we reached the limits of our fishing season. So while we can possibly get more efficient with the boat, I mean, that's the intent. Um, I, I don't see that new vessel being able to avoid halibut uh, bycatch or reduce mortality. It's, it's just, that's not the purpose of it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mr. Kress. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Fugelbog. I was having trouble connecting up a couple of the um, points that you made in your testimony. Um, you pointed out that you're averaging below the bycatch cap, and even in the tough years, there's still some room there. And at the same time, you said that since 2015, um, your company, at least, ground fish catch has, has decreased. And I'm left wondering why, if there's still room in the halibut cap, um, what are the factors that have, have, even though there is still room in the, to, um, for additional halibut bycatch under the cap, what are the factors that's prevented your company from maintaining a, a more of a stable ground fish harvest? In, in, instead of observing the 15% decline that you talked about. Um, thank you through the chair, <clears throat> Mr. Twight. Um, well, 90% of your cap isn't leaving a lot of room. And in um, years like 2019, that were really high encounter, the highest encounter we've seen in 20 years, we were more like 93% of our cap. And with buffers on the vessel, that's really not a lot of headroom. Um, you, you can't have the vessels hit their halibut limit, and you certainly can't have a company hit their PSC limit um, while they're fishing. I mean, the penalties for the company are severe. It's just, it's functionally not, uh, not something you're going to do. You need to leave some buffers. You need to leave some margin. So um, the real truth is that when production is down that low, we run out of time. There's only so many fishing days in a year, and you hit that point where you've got to bring the boat back the boat's back. You've got to do significant shipyard. Um, as we've seen with our old boats, you're throwing good money after bad when your average fleet age is between 35 and 40 years old. But in order to maintain those boats and keep them safe, um, keep them fishing as best you can, you know, you have substantial shipyard time. So we just, we run out of time. We don't run out of hell of it, but we are really, really close. And the fact that we're so close is forcing, you know, a lot of behavior um, you go into full-on halibut avoidance mode, and that's really what's driving the production is, the, um, is, is all the measures we're taking to avoid halibut um, has reduced our production from, say, 100 round metric tons a day to 70. And that, that loss on a daily basis spread out over those um, an entire fishing season means we just we can't get the ground fish. Thank you. Um, second question, if I may. Mr. Clayton. Thanks. Mr. Fuglevog, so under that situation, um, what benefit might, might there be to the council considering a uh, performance standard uh, in concert with um, an abundance-based approach to establishing bycatch caps? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Twight. The, the advantage to um, performance standards that I see is that it, it provides all the incentive. And, and, and frankly, you know, the, the purpose and need talks a lot about incentive. And I just want to put in a pitch that I personally believe that the council and the public have provided our fleet um, all the incentives that we need. We, we have all the incentive to reduce halibut to stay under our limit to catch our ground fish. We're currently not able to do that. But... Um, uh, performance standards give us flexibility. So what we saw in 2019 was a really warm bottom temperature. Flatfish were really dispersed. There was almost nowhere you could fish in the Bering Sea without having fairly high encounter rates. And um, on a year like that, we, you know, we, we may not be able to reach a performance standard. We would still be incentivized to do it. But that would give us the flexibility on a year like that without hitting a cap that would shut us down. 
I think we had a, a, another year that was cooler with lower encounter rates. We might be able to stay under that performance standard. So that's the biggest advantage I see. And I think the SSC recognized that advantage when they talk about that changing environment in the Bering Sea and allowing for flexibility. I mean, that, that's really the advantage of a performance standard um, in my eyes. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Cross, did you have another question? Okay. All right. I don't see any further questions, Mr. Fugabog. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next up is Mary Beth Tooley and Jason Anderson, and then Eric Belsko, then Nancy Hillstrand. Hello, Mr. Chair. This is uh, Jason Anderson. Can you hear me? We can. Good morning. Uh, good morning, um, Mayor Beth. You on? Yep. Hopefully, you can hear me. Okay. Um, I'm Jason Anderson, and I've got Mary Beth Tooley with me, and we both work for the O'Hara Corporation. Um, O'Hara is a hundred-year-old family-owned company. We own five trawl catcher processors in the Amendment AG, AG sector, and hold both Aleutian Islands and Bering Sea quota. Alternative one for us is the only practical alternative in this present document. On page 240 of the analysis, it concludes that the action meets National Standard 1 OY requirements because the cooperative structure provides bycatch reduction tools. This conflicts with Section 3.3.3, which, which describes the operational constraints that we face and the decisions that our captains make on, uh, on a daily basis to avoid bycatch. While Amendment 80 allowed us to, uh, to end, the, end the race for fish, we've also utilized tools such as excluders and deck sorting. We've slowed our fishing pace, uh, shared bycatch information, and operate under the halibut avoidance plan. We began participating in deck sorting development in 2009, which allowed us to adapt to the 2016 PSC reductions. We have no new tools for the reductions contemplated. Finally, I'd like to address the notion that we can move halibut among companies to absorb proposed reductions. According to the analysis presented in the Groundfish Forum letter, some or all of the Amendment 80 companies are constrained by these alternatives. While the cooperative facilitates quota transfers, halibut is limited for all companies, particularly when environmental conditions are unfavorable, the entire fleet is impacted, and companies will have no excess PSC to transfer. And Mr. Chairman, as uh, Jason noted, uh, we have quoted in both the Aleutian Islands and the Bering Sea. However, flatfish is our bread and butter, and all five boats, boats participate in that fishery. The AI is limited for three O'Hara vessels due to safety, inadequate horsepower, fuel capacity, and no Western Aleutian endorsements um, for any of those vessels. For the two larger vessels, um, Aleutian fisheries represent only about half of their year. Our ability to adjust target species catch is constrained by seasonal schooling behavior, regulatory requirements, fish quality, and market conditions. We do not see opportunities to make additional changes in our fishery plan under this action. We employ 400 crew on an annual basis. The income of these people are impacted by your actions. And we encourage you to further consider the practicability of the current suite of alternatives. And we remain committed to working with the council to achieve, to achieve a viable solution. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment and we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. From council members. Don't see any. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Belsko. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Chairman Kinney, members of the council, my name is Eric Belsko. I'm representing myself and other like-minded independent fishermen residing in coastal Alaska. I was born and raised in Homer and a second generation IFQ quota holder and own two vessels that participate in halibut sable fish fisheries. We've heard a lot of different arguments today. But it also should be noted that during much of the time while the ABM framework and analysis was being developed, 
the area and and while the area four halibut fishery continued to decline, the Amendment 80 sector benefited from consolidation, rationalization, and congressional actions that led to the extreme financial empowerment from their program's 2008 inception. And the fleet look, looks much different today than pre-Amendment 80. In 12 short years, we've watched the narrative from the Amendment 80 fleet at the council shift towards the prioritization of the OI element of National Standard 1 over all other MSA standards and essentially a displacement of the directed fishery. The analysis is clear in highlighting the loss of vessels in the area for halibut fishery over the last decade. If the council decides to continue this narrative, the National Standard 1 was prioritized over all other standards, one could make the argument that we don't need any directed halibut crab or fixed gear cod fisheries in Alaska. This relatively simple action to float PSC limits with halibut abundance, as we do with all other species the council manages, has become muddled in legalese and the threat of financial ruin for a sector that is building new vessels, buying up Seattle lakefront property, and appears to be thriving. Amendment 80 is one of the most highly rationalized fisheries in the world, and I believe they will be able to adapt to any of the PSC reductions currently under consideration. And it's their obligation to other stakeholder groups to do so. I would like to also reiterate to the council and directed halibut users that if we get into a situation where the directed fisheries closed and the entire allocation in area four went to PSC and the trawl fisheries, that the books would have to be essentially balanced from the Gulf of Alaska because of the way in which IPHC now manages on a total mortality or an SBR approach. Unfortunately, there is no deficit spending in regards to the halibut resource. The argument that encounter rates need to be considered further and that they can vary depending on the year are of no utility to this process. Encounter rates are a function of fishing effort and unfortunately luck. And as fish stocks shift, there's no way to pinpoint exactly where halibut may or may not be, especially while using an indiscriminate gear type and coupled with the changing ocean environment. I call this the risk factor in commercial fishing. And the less risk incurred, the more profitable and sustainable a sector can be. Gear type choice factors into this argument whether one sector likes to talk about it or not. Furthermore, no sector should get a free pass on not being held accountable to a standard of performance for encountering species that are not their target. I would call this managing a fishery, whether it's constraining or not, or if it inhibits achieving OI. Proper achievement of OI in the BSAI would encompass the balancing of all MSA standards equally. So at the end of the day, this is a policy decision for the council that they're going to have to decide which direction to go. And I want to leave you with a quote from Mark Kalanthi, because I've heard a lot of talk about uh, previous testimony about the quantity of fish generated by Amendment 80. And the quote says, cheap fish is part of the problem. Expensive fish is part of the solution. I'll let the council draw their own conclusions from that quote. And thanks for the time to speak. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions for Mr. Velsko? Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have a quick one. Uh, thanks, Mr. Velsko. I, you were on our advisory panel, and so I, I guess I was making the assumption, but maybe shouldn't, that you're supportive of the AP motion. Um, and part of that is an incorporation of the SSB comments that we received at this meeting, but not choosing to pick a PPA yet at this time. Is that, are you in support of that motion? Uh, through the chair, thanks for the question, Ms. Kimball. Yeah, I, I'm I'm in support of that. I mean, I I want to get this going just as much as anyone, but I think we we do still need to back everything up with an analysis, and if we can scrub the model from the analysis um, and clean up some other things, those three points at the end of the motion too, or um, if we can encompass all that, I think we're moving in the right direction. And if, this is something we need to get right. So if it takes another meeting or two, then then so be it. Thank you. Any additional questions? Thank you, Mr. Velsko. Next up is Nancy Hillstrand. Following Ms. Hillstrand is Becca Robbins, just Claire, and then Darren Vanderpool. Grand is not available. We can move to Becca Robbins, just Claire. We'll come back to Ms. Hillstrand later. 
Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the council. Uh, Becca Robbins is Claire with the Ocean Conservancy, um, providing comments this morning on halibut abundance-based management. Um, thank you for your time and attention to this important issue. Um, I think you've you've heard from, from many, many others before me, and I think it's it's well known to this council how important halibut is. It's the mainstay for coastal communities throughout Alaska. Um, it's uh, it's an important part of food security and culture for indigenous communities throughout the state. Um, and, and it's critical to communities who are tied both to the, to the species and the, and the places that they live in, and it's critical um, to the survival of these communities. At the same time, um, biomass of halibut has been declining, as you know, um, and directed fisheries have been reduced along with this spawning biomass. Um, at the same time, PSC limits have not been reduced. Um, and this really creates an absurd situation in which PSC is a, a greater proportion of the removals in a time when abundance is low. Um, since 2011, halibut bycatch removal has exceeded the directed halibut fisheries. This poses both a severe equity issue and a conservation concern. Um, an equity issue for communities who depend on halibut as the resource is cut off from them and a conservation concern as resources decline and the uh, PSD limits are allowed to stay the same. Um, and in thinking about this issue, I, I wanted to just take a, a step back um, for some perspective. And, and I think I, I come back to the North Pacific Fishery Management Council's um, sort of reputation uh, as the gold standard for science-based catch limits um, and managing fisheries based on those science-based catch limits is really the model that we've spread throughout the world. Um, and it was the basis for the last Magnuson-Stevens reauthorization. Um, and, and we really think about the core of this issue, that's exactly what abundance-based management is. It's managing bycatch based on the abundance of stock, just as we manage others. Um, and, and I think that's a really important perspective to remember because it, whether it's the directed fishery or the PSC, that is really a core principle for this council's management um, and for the model in the Magnuson-Stevens Act. I think here the, the focus has been on sort of the bottom range of bycatch reductions proposed and what would happen to the fleet. But I, it's really important to remember this isn't just a bycatch reduction, it's a bycatch index. And the point is to reduce bycatch when biomass is low. It's how we do it for directed fisheries. Um, and, and it really doesn't make sense to treat bycatch differently. This isn't only equitable and fair and good management, it's also what the national standards require. Um, and I wanna focus in on national standard nine and the requirement to minimize bycatch to the maximum extent practicable. And this this standard requires that bycatch is reduced, even if it costs money or requires changes in behavior from the fleet. And, and I would propose that all of the options before you are indeed practicable. Um, the right answer for bycatch is probably zero. And you've achieved practicability by offering uh, these measures of bycatch at, at various levels. Um, in conclusion, I, I'd just like to ask, the council has the science and the tools to index bycatch to abundance. We've done it for species that we have less information for. Um, and, and I think with halibut, I would urge you to continue to move forward with this. Um, at stake is the existence of communities who have no alternative to halibut and whose right to that fish are protected by the United States tribal trust responsibilities and numerous laws and executive orders. I would make, ask the council to continue to move forward with abundance-based management of halibut, a support revision of the analysis in accordance with the SSC recommendations um, and ultimately support alternative four which best balances the needs to reduce bycatch and to support directed halibut users. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Any questions from council members? Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks, Ms. Robbins, just Claire. At one point in your testimony, you said that the, the right number for bycatch is probably zero. Uh, and, and I'm trying to figure out what you meant by that, because it, it uh, 
I don't think we have a single fishery that we manage that actually has zero, um, where zero is, is, I mean, it's not even a question of practicability. It's a, it's a question of whether you can fish at all, that every fishery we deal with has some level to bycatch. And, and so it's figuring out where we are on that scale. It seems to me that it's figuring out where we are on that scale between current levels and zero, not just for halibut, but for the broad range of, of fisheries that we manage that is the trick. And, and so I, I guess I'm just interested in what you were trying to convey by saying that the right number for bycatch is probably zero. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Chai, and, and I agree. I think I think we've had this similar conversation on a number of species, um, and ultimately, I think if you're, you know, the council is tasked with with balancing a variety of different objectives here, and and ultimately, in the case of halibut, in the case of salmon, in the case of crab, when you have directed fisheries, distance users, uh, struggling biomass, you know, I, I think that that it, there's a, a legitimate legitimate case. Um, that, that you know the ultimate the the most desired goal in a perfect world would be the you know, catch. Um, I think this council's task is is to balance that um, with with the with other fisheries. Um, and so I recognize that uh, zero is not something that is likely to be chosen or achieved. But I think if we if we really were to to take this in context, that that is what we're being what we should be aiming for. And, and everything else is really balancing those various factors. Um, and so I think it's a matter of, of what, what your baseline is in, in terms of assessing the ultimate goal. Any further questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next up is Darren Vanderpool. Hello, I, I am here. Are you, are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. Good morning. Okay. All right. Thank you for allowing me to share my concerns today. Uh, I'm Darren Vanderpool, as you already know. A little background on me. Uh, currently a captain for Fisherman's Finest on the vessel America's Finest. Before that, I was captain on American Number no. 1 and U.S. Rapid. I started in 1984, went from farming to fishing at 18 years old with Arctic Alaska as a processor and worked into being a factory manager on the Aleutian Enterprise. From there, worked up on deck and worked up to be a mate on H&G and factory, you know, fillet factory trawlers. Um, then I moved back to captain, or moved to captain in 1993 doing shoreside, Pollock, NOAA survey charters, uh, did the first trawl survey in the Beaufort Sea, and then came back to Amendment 80 in 2012. So that's that's what my experience is. Uh, I'm very concerned about any more cuts in our halibut cap and the impact that that will have on our ability to catch all of our allocated target species. Somehow there seems to be a disconnect between what we see on the grounds for the smaller sized halibut numbers and what the surveys are showing uh, surveys are showing decreasing numbers by quite a bit since 2016. And we're seeing the numbers of halibut that go in the net go up substantially. Um, a pattern has been forming where we see this. Uh, I call it a wall. It's like this wall of small halibut that moves north in the spring and then, then works back south again in the fall. And we have to try to stay on the edge of this. To, to keep out of the bulk of it, but it's, it's getting harder and harder to do so is they they mix more with the yellowfin sole and the rock sole. For example, we used to be able to relax a little by moving up toward Kuskokwim and Togiak, and now when we follow the target fish up there, we'll get hundreds of small halibut a tow, and we have to fight to stay on the edge of it, but it's become very difficult. Um, we, it seems that it moves north earlier and profoundly more spread out and abundant. We also can't fish in the deep in the horseshoe anymore for like arrowtooth flounder because the, the volume of halibut is, is far too great. Uh, this is a big loss of very productive fishing area for us if it was manageable, but it, it's just not manageable. 
So we have to be so cautious through the year because we just don't know what to expect with all these small halibut. If we don't reach our cap, it's because we're sacrificing so much through the year just to make sure that we can get to the end of the year and to our target fish allocation, if possible. Uh, We're using all of our tools to their maximum value, and we don't have any more tools that we can use. We've we've got it all. Um, We've had to learn how to use them, and that's the only thing that's keeping us operating right now. Any further cuts will leave us unable to utilize more of our allocations. The volume of small halibut we see, they're going to overwhelm us at any point, and we have to operate with that kind of a mindset, and that's what just what we have to do. I truly hope that the surveys can start seeing what we see on the grounds. We need that to happen. Um, you need to be able to see what we are seeing because uh, the volume that we see will become a, a bigger problem, not just for Amendment 80 vessels, but for other species in the Bering Sea as well. Mr. Um, so thank you for your time and consideration. Okay. All right. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Vanderpool. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's, let's see if there's any questions. Mr. Twain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Van Pohl, thank you for your testimony. Uh, I, I'd like to ask you about one of your tools, deck sorting, and um, whether it, it's still a fairly new technology, it's still a fairly new process, and whether you think that there would be room for further innovations with deck sorting, uh, more reliance on electronics, for instance, rather than human measurements? Uh, Are there any other areas where there might be room to increase the efficiency of deck sorting, either to help you um, get your net back in the water sooner or to um, uh, increase the number of halibut that could actually be deck sorted? Well, we've kind of learned how to manage it to the the maximum of its potential. And uh, you know, it doesn't go perfect every time, but, you know, we try to do shorter toes. We do s- smaller toes. Um, we put more people out there. You know, we stop the factory to get uh, everybody out there to try to get through it as quick as possible. So we've learned to use everything that's available to us t- to make it as efficient as possible. Um, the smaller halibuts, you know, we do get a higher mortality rate than larger ones. Larger ones are easier to exclude. So the larger halibut are much more manageable to us, both for deck sorting and for excluding. But the smaller ones are, are where the problem lies for us. You know, they're, they're not as hardy, so we have to work harder to get them overboard quicker and have less pressure on them. Um, as far as what else we can do, uh, electronic measurement may help. Um, you know, you do get quite a bit of discrepancy between observers and how they how they grade the fish. So that may help even that out some. But we we really have, have learned to do about as much as we can with that at this point. I hope that answers your question. It did. Thank you. Mr. Vanderpool, Ms. Baker has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony. And Mr. Vanderpool, I think you're a good person to ask this question given your experience. Um, Sounds like you know a little bit about how uh, surveys are done. And so we have some information in our analysis that uh, looks like, um, from spatial plots anyway, that the at least the Eastern Bering Sea Trawl Survey um, does overlap reasonably well with generally where Amendment 80 fishing occurs. And so I'm interested in your um, comment that, you know, you, you hope or you're kind of confused why the survey isn't sort of um, showing the same type of encounters that you're seeing in the fishery. And so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, why while this, the fishing area and the surveys and, and your commercial fishing area seem to overlap, um, it doesn't look like the results are the same in terms of halibut encounters. Do you have any ideas 
or why that might be? Yeah, I, I do. I, I think of a lot of it has to do with, with timing. Um, when I when I talk about this wall, you know, if we get to the south, say the southwest of this wall that seems to be forming over the last few years, then we can get pretty, we can get really clean. If we can get above it, we can get really clean also. So we, we tend to have this band that is that it tends to move to the the northeast and then back down to the southwest and and that's what we have to stay out of and i think probably what's happening is that uh, i know that the, you know i know how the surveys work they're they're hitting all these boxes at the same time every year and they should be seeing more of what we're seeing so i, I can't explain that but the only thing that i can think is that it's a timing issue of when they're when they're doing the survey and when that fish is moving moving up and then moving back down again. Thank you. That's helpful. Good for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your question. Don't see any additional questions. Thank you for your testimony. All right. Thank you. Next up is Lauren Devine, then Pete Thompson, and then Heather McCarty. Good morning. Morning. Council members, for the record, I'm Dr. Lauren Devine. I represent the Aleut community of St. Paul Island. Since 2011, reductions in directed fishery landings have grossly outpaced reductions in halibut bycatch mortality. While our fishermen and thousands of Alaskan fishing families are struggling under the conservation burden of quota cuts due to declining halibut abundance, the Amendment 80 sector is building new vessels and expanding operations. The sector notes that deck sorting provides direct benefits to the directed halibut fisheries, yet argues, uh, as has been pointed out in um, this process by the SSC, abundance-based management will have no impact to the directed fishery or biomass. Another argument is that reductions in productivity due to deck sorting and avoiding halibut have come at a great cost to the sector. However, as Table 313, page 105 of the draft EIS shows, since the PSC limit reduction in 2015, revenue is generally trending upward. I think most uh, agree there's great appreciation for the reduction measures that have been implemented, but the fact is there are still tools that can be used to maximize revenue from any given amount of halibut PSC. And the sector has been making it work since 2015. The argument continues to be made that the Amendment 80 sector simply cannot practicably reduce bycatch any further. Practicability must be guided by this council, not the industry. It doesn't make sense to allow one industry to create their own rules, and it's not consistent with this council uh, nor the federal government's management authority. In the words of a previous testifier, Mr. Sear, Fishermen are smart and resourceful, and they can figure out anything if they want to. We heard in earlier testimony that tools will come with time after ABM is implemented, and that there will certainly be solutions to reduce PSC as needed. Similar rationale is being used to bolster optimum yield above all other national standards, and somehow optimum yield and total allowable catch have become equated in this action. The issue has been questioned by council members during earlier testimony. TAC does not equal OI. Exclusively setting one sector's TAC as achieving OI is simply not responsible management. The definition of optimum yield, as you have heard, <laughs> includes the amount of fish that will provide the greatest overall benefit to the nation, particularly with respect to food production and recreational opportunities. But it also goes on to say, taking into account the protection of marine ecosystems and as reduced by any relevant economic, social, or ecological factor. For time's sake, I want to just reiterate the social factors, which include preservation of a way of life for fishermen and their families, dependence of local communities on a fishery, effects that past harvest levels have had on fishing communities, the cultural place of subsistence fishing, proportions of affected indigenous, minority, and low-income groups, and obligations under federal law. The SSC and AP minutes reflect the uncertainty in the documents associated with this issue in their current state. There are very clear and concise recommendations to amend the analysis and that it should be brought back after these revisions are made prior to any further action by the council. Selecting a preferred alternative is not a requirement for a draft EIS and the council does not have to nor should they take action to identify an alternative at this time. 
Finally, I, I want to state the argument that seeks to convince you that a food production metric, quote unquote, uh, such as four ounce halibut fillets should be included in any part of this analysis is absolutely inappropriate. So we're all familiar, these fisheries are not comparable in that way. Assuming a metric such as number of fillets produced denigrates a very complex and multifaceted issue that gets back to the heart of systemic inequity in the fishery management process. Number of fillets produced, does not, for one, does not account for halibut obtained by subsistence during our directed commercial fishery activities. It completely excludes the myriad non-biophysical aspects of halibut as a cultural and traditional food. We detailed this exact argument in the white paper that we provided to council staff for revisions to the SIA or the social impact analysis. As a federally recognized tribe, we cannot understand the Western capitalistic viewpoint that seeks to profit at all costs, especially given what's at stake with this issue, losing longstanding family tradition, culture, customary ways of life that predate the council and the entire Amendment 80 industry. The prices of their products are artificially low because of the social, economic, and environmental costs that as of now are not considered or quantified in any documents associated with this action. The costs of maintaining status quo are real and they're unacceptable. The council does not have to continue to feed the beast or as Phyllis Wetzoff stated, the conglomerate Goliath at the expense of the little Davids. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Devine. Questions from council members? I don't see any. Thank you for your testimony. Keith Thompson. Uh, good morning. Could you hear me now? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Chairman. Kaneen and fellow council members. My name is Peter Thompson and I live in Kodiak. I've fished most of the major fisheries in the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea for the past 40 years, including bottom and midwater trawling. Currently, I'm involved in the halibut fisheries as a commercial IFQ holder, sport fisherman, and a subsistence user. I support abundance-based management of the halibut bycatch like we practice in all of the other directed fisheries. I support a science-based management approach and the revision of the analysis in accordance with the SSC recommendations. Also, I am in support of the council's alternative four because I feel it best addresses the needs of the halibut dependent communities and the directed halibut users. Throughout the state of Alaska, thousands of families, businesses, and communities depend on the halibut resource. This is not a species that is acceptable to waste as a cost of doing business for some. I have watched as my directed halibut fishery quotas have shrunk over the years and my family's investment in area four quota has been severely cut. The council needs to restore equity among user groups. The current management regime has caused the directed fisheries to lose access to a fair share of the exploitable halibut biomass. The reality is the current management results in halibut bycatch removals in the Bering Sea that have exceeded the directed fishery since 2011 and that is wrong on many levels, in my opinion. What adds to this concern is that the IPHC data has shown that the Bering Sea is a known nursery grounds and a significant number of halibut migrate to other areas of the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska. The bycatch there is typically smaller halibut and this represents an even greater impact with the loss of spawning potential through lost egg production, which then ultimately affects all of the halibut user groups. I'd like to leave the council with this thought. You know, we as fishermen are a pretty adaptable and resourceful group and we have to be. Regulatory bodies such as the council and the board of fish have heard us whine many times over the years. Statements like, it, it is impossible to change. We're doing our best. We cannot do anything more. It will ruin us, etc." But the truth is, when it comes to change, typically no one likes it but the trawl fleet will adapt and figure out how to make it work when there is a call for change. And that is what I'm being, that is what I'm asking for now. And I thank you for addressing this important issue. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Thompson. Let's see if there's any questions. Don't see any. 
Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Heather McCarty. Following Ms. McCarty will be Ryan Horwitz and then Teresa Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to draw the attention before I start to the um, handout that I have sent in and is attached to your agenda. It's uh, several tables that I'm going to refer to later in testimony. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the council, um, I'm Kevin McCarty and I'm speaking on behalf of the Central Bering Sea Fishermen's Association, one of the six CDQ groups. First, uh, we support the AP motion and we ask that all the recommendations from the SSB be carefully considered and the analysis be revised as they suggest. To address the basics, um, council action, as we all know, is driven by the purpose and need statement, a problem statement. And in the case of Halibut ABM, the essential problem is clearly stated. We've heard this before. When the BSAI halibut abundance declines, PSD in the amendment 80 fisheries can become a larger proportion of halibut removals in the BSAI, particularly in area 4 CDE. The eventual, the eventual strength and durability of this action will rest on how well the action solves this problem while meeting the needs of the national standards. The analysis is intended to provide information that allows the council to make their own judgments about those basic issues, because this will be a judgment call a call based on technical principles of fishery management, but also on the principles of social and racial equity and access that are embodied in the national standards, and the elements of fairness and community protection carefully placed in the MSA by Senator Stevens. We have provided information over several years that details the effects of various levels of bycatch on the halibut fishery in 4CD and E, but that information has never been adequately reflected in the analysis. The council instead depended on a simulation model with a variety of shortcomings that formed the basis for the analysis. Two major arguments employed by the A80 sector resulted from some of those model outputs. One is that the alternatives have no effect on the spawning stock biomass. I think previous testifiers have fully explained that one. The second is the alternatives only hurt A80 and do not provide much benefit to the directed fishery. We have provided you here with another set of tables based on math that detail the effects of the alternatives on 4 CD and E and their relative benefits. You have them in front of you. In the interest of time, I'm going to the third table, which is a series of vertical bars with a dotted red line at the top. The dotted red line is the historical dependence of the 4 CDE directed halibut fishery 10 years before the decline began um, that has been steadily increasing. In those days, um, the fishermen in Area 4 CDE were harvesting 43% of the total halibut removal. The blue bars show the percentage of the directed halibut fishery uh, total removals under each of these years. The orange, gray, and yellow bars show how each alternative results in a change to directed fishery harvest or share of total removals if we replayed history with the PSC limits specified in those alternatives. You can see that alternative two results in savings in one out of the last five years, alternative three in savings of three out of the last five years, alternative four have savings in every single year and is fairly consistent in terms of the proportion of removals in the directed fishery. None of the alternatives yields enough savings to restore the directed fishery in 4CDE to what it has historically depended on shown by the dashed red line, but alternative four comes the closest. So to summarize, regarding the choice of alternatives, as you have seen, CBSFA strongly supports alternative four. It's the only alternative that comes near to restoring equity to the directed fishery. Regarding indices, if we are now going to go back all the way to reconsidering the indices as suggested by Dr. Fina, let's have the revised analysis include the use of one index as well as the current two indices, so that the council can compare the results. And we suggested the use of a single index, the set line survey, a long, long time ago. Um, regarding the options, we support retaining option one and three and removing option two and option four. Option three's performance standard concept lends itself to providing incentives for the fleet but this option must be applied to an alternative that addresses the need for meaningful reductions at lower levels of halibut abundance, not being attached to a meaningless alternative. 
So to address the point in, in, in conclusion, discussed today, over the last five years, according to Table 2.4 on page 53, the A80 sector has averaged 1,286 metric tons of halibut PSC. That's 100 metric tons less than the 1,396 metric ton breakpoint identified as constraining the A80 sector. I understood an A80 representative to say earlier today that this breakpoint is arrived at because not all the A80 companies can adhere to fishing practices that avoid halibut. I would ask the council to consider that Amendment 80 was put in place in part to allow cooperative practices and behavior on the part of the bottom trawl sector in exchange for the granting of fishing rights. Cooperatively managed fishing quota programs are the hallmark of Bering Sea fisheries management. I also noted yesterday that 135 people were listening to the testimony, including marketers and publicists who work on selling trawl caught species to the U.S. and global markets. These fisheries and markets are beneficiaries of the excellent federal management of these ground fish species and the MSC certification that is based on that management and that allows those fish to be placed on the shelves at Walmart and elsewhere. We believe that because of the commitment of the Walton Foundation and other prominent groups to sustainable fisheries and certification programs, that Walmart will not continue to sell fish that was caught at the expense of the small boat fishermen and the Alaska Native communities in Alaska. With this action, the Council will be sending a message to the world as to how they intend to manage ground fish fisheries going forward, and we are confident that the Council will find a solution that preserves the ground fish fisheries in the Bering Sea and preserves halibut. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. McCarty. Questions? Mr. Merrill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just while it's my view. Uh, thank you, Ms. McCarthy, for your testimony. I wanted to make sure that I understand how we measure equity from CBSFA's perspective. In other words, is equity achieved if there is a specific proportion of the um, available catch in area 4 C, D, and E that is harvested? Is it a specific catch limit that's available to harvesters in 4 C, D, and E? How, how do we know that we've achieved equity, I guess, from your perspective? Um, thank you, Mr. Merrill, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think that we have attempted to show how we are thinking of equity in this chart of this table that I spoke to earlier. We cast about at the beginning of this action for a way to compare how the directed fishery looks now to how the directed fishery looked before the substantial decline in halibut abundance. And we settled on this 43% of the total halibut removals, which the directed fishery um, had access to before that decline. And so that, that's just a, an average over several years, 10 years before the decline of the halibut resource, which is 2002 to 2011. So we just attempted to have some measure because obviously it's very <laughs> subjective as to how equity is determined. And we just use that as a measure. And it's not so much that we're happy with 43% of the total held removals in, in 4CDE, but that that was one way to show how far that proportion has changed since then. And so I, I don't know if that's an appropriate way to do it, but that's what we fastened on in order to show the contrast between the past and the present since the precipitous decline in halibut abundance. I hope that I hope that's appropriate and that I explained it clearly. Thank you, uh, Ms. McCarty. Uh, if I may, a follow-up question. A follow-up question. There might be several ways that we could achieve that 43% uh, split, if you will. Uh, one would be through the International Pacific Halibut Commission process to consider allocations in area 4 C, D, and E when we are setting the catch limits for that area. That could be done 
without necessarily modifying our existing management. Would that achieve equity in your uh, from your perspective? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Merrill, you're, you're a little bit gobbled, but um, I'm hearing that you're asking whether if the ITHC were to set catch limits in 4CDE that led to that percentage or close to that percentage, is, is that what you're asking? That whether that would be yes. acceptable to us? I, I well, guess my question, would that, would that be uh, considered equitable from your perspective? Well, I don't know that it would because it doesn't necessarily mean that those that those um, attempts by the APHC would have been uh, science based. I, I I'm not entirely sure what you're suggesting, but certainly if they're not um, science based and based on uh, on the status of the stock, um, particularly in 4CDE, then it it would be. I guess it would be dependent on that, um, whether those were science-based decisions made at the IPHC. Further questions for Ms. McCarty? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next up is Ryan Horwath. Not available. We can move to Teresa Peterson. Um, yes. Good morning, Chairman Kaneen, Council Members. I'm Teresa Peterson with the Alaska Marine Conservation Council. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We continue to support abundance-based management of all of halibut PSC and an ecosystem-based fishery management approach to bycatch, which is responsive to the status of the stocks, indexing halibut PSC to abundance. abundance. Using both sources of survey data represents a science-based management approach, which provides the tools to manage halibut for the long-term health of the resource. In, in a changing Bering Sea environment, which reflects the actual status of the stock. The current fixed halibut PSC limits are inconsistent with, man, with management of all other species, which are managed on abundance. The current use of a static cap for halibut PSC is both antiquated and inequitable, and it's time for a change. The outcome of status quo bycatch management has resulted in a fisheries management system glaring with inequities. One sector grows while another slowly erodes to a point where communities adjacent to the resource no longer participate in the fishery. As we slowly work through this issue in the council process, it's rather astonishing that an ABM approach for halibut wasn't introduced decades, decades ago. I understand the challenge with halibut with two management bodies responsible for the management, but, but we allowed this to happen and, and now we need to fix it. The current pressure to conserve the halibut resources borne by the directed halibut fisheries and the adoption of requiring lower bycatch limits at lower levels of halibut, halibut abundance will help share the conservation man mandate and sustain economies of halibut dependent communities. The current system is out of balance and, and now it's time for change. And looking at this issue in the context of MSA and national standards, it's important to reiterate the need to balance the standards and recognize that no one standard supersedes the importance of the others. As others have noted, the national standards have principles that must be followed in any fishery management plan to ensure sustainability and, the res and responsible fishery management. The national standards work together with trade-offs that result in healthy fisheries and healthy communities when properly balanced. This is mandated by the MSA and a cornerstone of the premier marine fisheries law guiding sustainable fisheries management. National standard one, optimum yield, is not meant to be achieved at the expense of the other fisheries, 
and the sustained participation of fishing communities. The guidelines to National Standard 1 note that the determination of OY is a decisional mechanism for resolving MSA conservation and management objectives and balancing the various objectives that compromise the greatest net benefit to the nation. In weighing National Standard 1 and National Standard 8 equally, it is clear that halibut ADM will help to balance the national standards in an equitable manner. National Standard 8 requires management and conservation actions to consider effects on fishing communities. Consider how to ensure sustained participation of fishing communities and to the extent practicable, minimize adverse economic impacts on such, in, on such communities. Under the current use of halibut bycatch, Fishery, fishing communities in the Bering Sea are dropping out of the fishery with nine out of 17 Bering Sea communities no longer participating in the fishery. It's really impossible to quantify the magnitude of loss to a community when access to the halibut resource is lost. The importance of cultural heritage and community well-being is captured in the wisdom of National Standard H and it's up to the council to implement policies which recognize the equal importance of this standard. In thinking about National Standard 9 and the, the, the language minimized bycatch to the extent practicable, it, I feel like the subjective understanding of to the extent practicable is perhaps the most problematic language with barrier user groups interpreting this, what this standard means. From the perspective of AMCC, to the extent practicable does not mean limiting bycatch reductions only to a level which does not constrain the target fishery or result in a financial loss. It's a statutory obligation which means balancing all the national standards equally and in the context of all the standards to, to determining what is practicable. I don't see anything in the analysis eliminating a gear type you're constraining guests, eliminating doubtful, or perhaps with status quo in the directed fishery, we're kind of close to seeing that fishery eliminated. It, it is the responsibility of the council to make judgments based on principles of equity and environmental justice, as well as business considerations. And looking at the review of the analysis, I think we've, we've continued to support alternative four with the lookup table and option three, which provides incentives for the amendment 80 fleet to, to minimize bycatch. At this juncture, we encourage the council to revise the analysis based on input from the SSC and the information received throughout this meeting and bring it back to in, inform next steps. We've put a lot of time and energy into moving this forward. AMCC believes this is on the right track, but at this point, we really need to step back and incorporate the information from the SSC prior to moving this forward for final action. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Are there any questions? Don't see any. Thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, I think we may have uh, Brian Horwitz on the phone. And um, after we take one more uh, testimony, then let's go ahead and uh, break the lunch and then we'll come back afterwards to finish testimony. Ryan Horwitz? Can you? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. All right. Good morning. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for letting me testify here. This isn't gonna be polished or long, but I just wanna say um, I support abund abundance-based management and um, alternative four. I'm a small boat fisherman that fished in Kodiak for about 17 years. My uncle fished 30 years before me. He had the opportunities to go on halibut derbies and, uh, and uh, that quickly dried up once I got up there. Um, about 17 years ago. Um, I've also been on trawl boats and, uh, and, and I get that all, all fishermen want to keep fishing. Uh, to say that we can't innovate and figure out ways to keep harvesting at a, at a, at a place that sustains our business is just is false. Um, 
we're going to Mars soon. Um, I'm down here direct marketing my fish uh, from Kodiak and from some of my friends. Um, you know, we can figure this out. There's new technology out there. You guys are going to have Starlink up there. You're going to have internet that can help, um, you know, solve some of our bigger issues. And, uh, yeah, I just want to say um, to not have abundance-based management in our, in our fisheries um, decisions just seems archaic. And uh, I hope we don't go on the, on the record as being idiots, uh, being the ones who wiped out the resource because we couldn't, we couldn't change our ways. So I appreciate your time and let me testify. Um, thank you. All right. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Horwood? Don't see any. Go ahead and break for lunch. We'll come back at uh, 12.35 Alaska time and finish up with public testimony. It looks like we have nine, nine people left to testify. Figured they'd go through till noon. So that they can, uh... The meeting is now over. All the participants have been disconnected.
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We are ready to uh, continue with public testimony on Halibut ABM. First up will be Jeff Kaufman, then Chris Tran, and then um, Karen Gillis. And I'd like to, to thank everyone for the public testimony so far and, and encourage testifiers to uh, keep comments constructive and civil. Mr. Kaufman, are you available? I am, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, council members. Uh, my name is Jeff Kaufman, and I'm testifying on behalf of myself today. I've commercially fished halibut for 36 consecutive years in the waters surrounding St. Paul Island, where I was raised and where I raised my kids for 14 years. I'm a proud small boat fisherman from St. Paul, and I'm advocating for equitable management of the halibut resource, as I have for the last decade and prior years. I wholeheartedly support the AP motion for all the reasons stated in the AP rationale on this issue. I also support recommendations from the SSC. Having said that, I support Alternative 4 moving forward as part of the alternative set. Alternative 4 is the only alternative that will provide meaningful benefits to the directed and to the Albert dependent communities and fishing families across the range of the stock, particularly those 17 most. Chairman, am I okay? I have Mr. Kaufman. Yeah, there was some feedback from somebody who wasn't muted. Um, members of the public, please mute your phones. All right, Mr. Kaufman, let's try again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. So uh, I support alternative four moving forward as part of the alternative set. Alternative four is the only alternative that will provide meaningful benefits to the direct, to the halibut dependent communities and fishing families across the range of the stock, particularly those 17 mostly indigenous BSAI halibut dependent communities recognized in the SIA. Alternatives two and three, when overlaid on the years 2016 to 2020, would have fallen well short of producing bycatch reductions large enough to move the needle and address the inequities that have occurred as halibut abundance declined and PSC became a larger percentage of total removals. Regarding using encounter rates to set PSC limits, the council does not manage allocations, PSC or otherwise, based on encounter rates. All fishery allocations under the management of the council are based on abundance because it is absolutely the right way to manage allocations, including those made as PSC. Please do not fall into this trap. It is not responsible resource management and does not bring much needed stability and equity for affected halibut fishermen and businesses. Mark Fina spoke earlier about using the IPHC set line survey as a measure of abundance. The set line survey in itself does not capture abundance of small halibut. As a standalone, this raw data is not sufficient to set abundance-based PSC limits and does not incorporate um, the abundance of juvenile halibut. The IPHC stock assessment, however, incorporates both the set line and EBS trawl survey as part of the assessment and may be a tool that could allow PSC to float with abundance that is more closely aligned with the directed fishery catch limits. The IPHC stock assessment takes into account all sizes of halibut, including small fish encountered in the Eastern Bering Sea Trawl Survey. Certainly, the IPHC stock assessment is a good measure of abundance and is scientifically sound, but the council would need to accept the IPHC stock assessment as the best available science and index of abundance for setting PSC limits. This is a hurdle that was not overcome in earlier iterations of this action. However, it might be worth another look, and I would support looking at the IPHC stock assessment as a single index of abundance in the next iteration of the analysis. I ask you to follow the SSC and AP recommendations and roll them into the analysis to make a stronger, more accurate, and more defensible document on which to base our decisions. Without meaningful reductions in PSC, this action doesn't work. As I sit here today, I wonder to myself, is the council going to fail dozens of halibut dependent communities, over 2,300 IFQ holders, and hundreds of fishing families from across Alaska and elsewhere? Or is the council going to stand up for coastal communities and small boat fishermen and make meaningful bycatch reductions in the BSAI that will provide for a brighter and more equitable future for all of us that are historically dependent on the halibut resource? I hope for the latter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Kaufman. Council members, any questions? Thanks again, Mr. Coffin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right, next up uh, will be Chris Tran. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good afternoon, Mr. Tran. Welcome to the process. Hello, Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hello, Chairman and members of the Council. My name is Chris Tran. I will speak on behalf of Pat Blankoff due to medical reasons. Uh, Pat is the mayor of the city of St. George Island, located in the Pivot Island, Bering Sea. <clears throat> we appreciate the opportunity for comment. 
Um, enactments have recognized the Pavovian Nungan special federal rights to the allocation of fish harvests in which US, the U.S. is ob obligated to protect them. Shortly after the 1867 Treaty of Session, by which the U.S. acquired Alaska from Russia, Congress reserved fishing rights of the Pueblo people and included that the islands of St. Paul and St. George were, quote, declared a special reservation for government purposes, end quote. In 1870, Congress directed the Secretary of the Treasury to manage the northern fur seal population, quote, having due regard to the interests of the government, the native inhabitants, the parties heretofore engaged in trade, and the protection of the seal fisheries, end quote. The act also directed the Treasury Secretary to, quote, make all useful rules, all need, quote, to make all needful rules and regulations for the comfort, maintenance, education, and protection of the natives of said islands, end quote. These laws were re reiterated in 1966 when the responsibility was shifted from the Treasury to the Secretary of the Interior. As well, in 1983, Congress gave the Secretary of Commerce the duty of administering the IRNs, but required, quote, consultation with the Secretary of the Interior to ensure that activities of such islands are consistent with the purposes of conserving, managing, and protecting wildlife, and for other purposes consistent with that primary purpose, end quote. We have presented these entitlements before, and to this day, they have not been honored by governmental management bodies fulfilled upon our request. Therefore, it, exacerbated, it has exacerbated the decline of, of the Pivot Islands marine ecosystem, with fewer and fewer halibut for seals and seabirds ever observed. We recommend management measures that will assist in addressing, addressing the shrinking populations of St. George Marine Island species, St. George Islands marine species. Uh, we are grateful that the government has taken the time and resources to conduct studies in our ecosystem, such as the fact that the Pivot Island first seal first seals need 400 metric tons of prey species to thrive and survive. But these needs are not currently met. Um, this is an opportunity to heed our rights. We support halibut abundance-based management with alternative four that best addresses conservation of the halibut resource and of course that the council must take actions to assist the Pibboff Island's marine ecosystem rebound. Halibut has always been a cor cornerstone of our community and is an integral part of our diet and way of life. Our remote island does not have the same resources and opportunities that those living in metropolitan areas. Without responsible management of the halibut resource and support for our directed fisheries, our young people will have no future and it will expedite, expedite the decline of our economy and population. Our community lives in constant fear of extinction and have few options against the legacy of the government's regulatory measures that have limited our human equality and our ability to become self-sufficient to this day. A static cat is not how any other fisheries manage. The men in 80 fleet are catching more and more proportion of the halibut as the resource is going down. Um, we echo previous testimonies that the men in 80 fleet are resourceful and can adapt to the reductions of bycatch. Um, halibut ABM will create a fairer halibut fishery and survival of all users. Um, we also echo recommendations to the council to be compliant with existing federal laws regarding Alaskan Natives and Native Americans, such as the Magnuson Stevens Act, National Standards, Foreign Aid, um, the Presidential Executive Orders, NEPA process, and um, that's all I have to say. Thank you for, the, for your time, and I uh, waive my opportunity for questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for uh, your testimony, Mr. Tran. We, we appreciate hearing your, your comments. and. Um, Again, thank you. So with that, um, we will move on to Karen Gillis. Following Ms. Gillis will be Angel Janika and then Peggy Parker. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Kaneen. Council and committee members and the hardworking council staff for your continued efforts toward responsible halibut bycatch management in the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands. We appreciate the opportunity to comment on agenda item C2 today. My name is Karen Gillis and I'm speaking to you as executive director of Bering Sea Fishermen's Association. BSFA serves 128 communities in the Bristol Bay, Arctic, Yukon, and Kuskokwim regions of Alaska. Since 1979, we have engaged communities in the areas of economic development, interdisciplinary research, 
policy and regulatory design and implementation, as well as to incubate initiatives which serve to support residents and the regional entities striving to build and continue engagement in their local economies. The current management regime has resulted in a devastating loss of acceptable access to um, and an equitable share of the exploitable halibut biomass. As an organization created to ensure access for small boat commercial fishers, we recognize the delegate balance of play. Today, I echo previous testimony, which has eloquently clarified how status quo is forcing communities out of the halibut fishery and how an abundance-based management approach is the best and most equitable solution. You are the guardians of the sea and you are provided with layers of direction. When you employ national standards, the recent executive order, the social impact analysis and other federal mandates, we believe they point you directly toward a decision in line with our ask and the ask of dozens and dozens of individuals and organizations you've heard from today, yesterday, a month ago, a year ago, five years ago. Individuals who rely on halibut for sustenance, livelihood, and community identity need leadership to put words and commitments into action here to support their very right to exist. When total halibut bycatch exceeds the harvest of the directed fishery, we must seek a swift resolution aligned with the mandates designed around employing the best available science, preservation of equity, and conservation of our resources. The need for precision fishing is essential. It's driven by environmental, commercial, regulatory, and ethical factors. We see the fishing industry investing in research and development of gear technology and practices to address bycatch and understand that the return on those investments are diminishing as we approach the limits of gear modification to reduce bycatch. But when the fleet states that they've exhausted their efforts to curtail bycatch and seek status quo or business as usual, what we hear is that their need is greater than ours and we will just have to come to terms with it. The SFA believes the analysis and the simulation model that informs it fails to capture the impacts and benefits of the various alternatives. We ask the council to reassess the basis for the BSAI abundance-based management analysis. We request and utilize or the council should request and utilize the IPHC's model as the best available science and revisit the analysis for this action. We ask that you recognize the extreme burden Alaska's small boat fishermen and fishing communities are carrying. And we ask you to hold other fishing sectors to the same standards and acknowledge the need to take more drastic measures in indexing how the PSC limits to abundance in Alaska's 12 fisheries in the Bering Sea. We support addition of, a, of information requested in the advisory panel motion and support the SSC discussion um, as reflected in their minutes. Should the council choose to move ahead with a PPA at this meeting, despite concerns shared by halibut harvesters and their stakeholder groups, the SFA supports alternative four, as it provides, in our opinion, the best proportion between the directed halibut fishery and halibut bycatch for area four CDE obviously most of the Bering Sea. Ultimately though, we do not believe the council has adequate information on which to select a primary preferred alternative. And we encourage you to prioritize this action and continue to dedicate the time and resources to see this through and select a meaningful alternative for ABM of halibut bycatch. I was also asked today um, to convey the position uh, from the Bering Sea Elders Group and would like to use the remainder of my time to make a comment that was um, uh, provided to me, if that's okay. Yes, Kelsey. Yep, it's your time. So overall, the Bering Sea Elders Group supports abundance-based management of halibut bycatch. The harvest of every other fish and crab species in the North Pacific is managed based on abundance including the directed halibut fishery. 
the Bering Sea Elders Group supports the revision of the analysis in accordance with the SSD recommendations. They also support the Council's alter Alternative 4, which best addresses the needs of directed halibut users and halibut dependent communities. As mandated by the Magnus and Stevens Act, National Standards 1, 3, 4, 5, and 8 collectively require conservation and management measures to prevent overfishing, rebuild stocks, and ensure the long term health and sustainability of fishers. I have one more sentence. Any lack of conservation not only impacts their communities, but their indigenous way of life, as they have no other resources if the stock is depleted. They don't have the luxury of going to a store to replace their food sources. Thank you for hearing me out there. All right. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Gillis. And uh, Ms. Gillis has elected to, to waive questions. Thank you again. Next up is Angel Drabnika. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, members of the council, my name is Angel Drabnika, speaking on behalf of the CDQ group, the Aleutian Pribilof Island Community Development Association. As you are aware, our organization represents halibut dependent communities in Area 4, and we also participate in most ground fish and crab fisheries in the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands which provide important revenue uh, to support our programs and operations. Uh, I want to start off by acknowledging um, the FIA, which did um, a remarkable job of highlighting the dynamics in the matter and the um, relationship of our communities um, and, and, and um, program uh, have with halibut as well as men and fisheries. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Downs um, and the other contributors for their work. Um, this document is going to be uh, clearly very important in informing the policy trade-offs of this action. So our, our comments right now are not uh, terribly substantive, and I, I know that you've heard from a lot of other people over the past couple of days, um, so I can keep this very brief. Um, I'd like to continue to express our, our support for moving this action forward. Uh, we continue to believe that abundance based by catch management makes sense. It's consistent with how we manage other species and that action is necessary to minimize the risk that our area floor fisheries will be preempted by bycatch and to help aid in maintaining stable harvest opportunities in times of low abundance, uh, which have been the primary areas of focus for us and the main drivers of our concern regarding this action. Um, at this time, uh, we also support the AP motion, uh, which was a package forward without the selection of PPA. Um, considering the recent change in direction with the action to a more simplified approach, uh, which we uh, greatly appreciate, as well as the backing away of the operating model and the SSC recommendations that came out of this meeting. Uh, we think that the public would benefit from seeing the revisions and any additional context that may be added as the EIS is finalized. Uh, additional time with the document may also be helpful in increasing the understanding of how we should be reviewing the results um, under any remaining limitations and caveats and they continue to exist. So with that, I um, really uh, appreciate the opportunity to comment um, and would like to uh, thank staff and the council for their work throughout this complex and contentious process. Uh, we realize that you uh, have an incredibly challenging job um, and appreciate the time and thoughtful consideration you put into your duties under Magnuson um, and in considering the perspectives of the many, many stakeholders and communities involved in this action. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Stradnik, and for your leadership at the advisory panel. Um, questions from council members? Thank you. Thank you. Peggy Parker. Following Ms. Parker will be Kavik Anderson, then Malcolm Milne. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? And good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Kneen and to the council, my name is Peggy Parker. I'm the executive director of the Halibut Association of North America. We represent processors in Alaska who are first purchasers of Pacific halibut. I want to thank the council staff and the ABM work group for their excellent work and patient responsiveness as directives have changed during this lengthy process. We agree with the comments and the recommendations given by the SSB, including avoiding absolute numbers in any lookup table. I'd also like to thank the, um, 
I'm sorry, I'd also like to quickly respond to my friend, Mr. Woodley, who suggested the tools available to the IPHC to deal with static halibut bycatch in the Bering Sea are lowering the size limit or reducing the allocation to Canada to account for this bycatch. These are not abundance-based measures and are not likely to be implemented, although both have been discussed over the past several years. You may have noted in Dr. Stern's description of the draft EIS a note about the words direct impact, which I especially appreciated because it helped me realize for the first time that when that phrase is used in the analysis, it refers to jurisdictions, not to a logical conditional statement like if P then Q. The fact that the level of halibut bycatch taken by A80 has no direct impact on the halibut fleet is true in the context of the analysis only because A80 and its halibut bycatch are managed by the council and the directed halibut fleet and its catch is managed by the IPHC. Now I get that. My point here is that in normal English, A80's bycatch does have a direct impact on the directed fleet's halibut bycatch, sorry, halibut catch just as surely as if P then Q is true. I can show you this in the attachment to my testimony, which is a document from last February's annual meeting at the IPHC. If you scroll down to page three, you'll see a table of all of the, in millions of pounds, all of the mortality. I apologize, Ms. Parker. Uh, members of the public, please mute your phones if you're not testifying. Thank you. Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, so if you look at this table, I'm gonna use area four CDE as an example. Go down to the very last row that says total mortality. And in that cell, you'll see 4.76 million pounds. That's the total mortality that is allowed under IPHC scientifically based abundance based management uh, policy. So 4.76 is what we start with. We then subtract the overall U26 of non-directed discard mortality. That's the sublegal size that is caught in bycatch. And that's 0 0.78, 780,000 pounds. So that leaves us with a total constant exploited yield, constant exploitation yield of 3.98. And from that, we subtract off the top, go up to the top three rows, actually four rows, the directed commercial discard mortality of 80,000 pounds, the second row, the over 26 non-directed discard mortality, which is bycatch, in that area alone of 2.2 million pounds, recreational, which is zero, and subsistence, which is 30,000. And we get a total non-fisheries constant exploitation yield of 2.31 million pounds. So from that, we, um, let's see, so that leaves us with go further down to, until you come to commercial landings, that leaves us 1.67 million pounds for commercial landings in those three areas. So those three areas um, are then divided um, for C, for D, and for E, each get part of that 1.67. So that's how we reach these numbers. And it is a direct off the top um, reduction from our, uh, what we originally are given by the IPHC. Um, if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer. Um, I wanted to also make a point because my ears really pricked up at Captain Vanderpool's testimony. We happen to be, the halibut fleet is in the middle of a four year leap over a deep trench. That trench is called no recruitment. When I heard Captain Vanderpool talk about a wall of young halibut moving northeast and southwest over the course of an A80 season through the Bering Sea, my first thought was I hope these year classes have a chance to grow to sexual maturity and reproduce. Um, Hannah supports 
a couple of things in addition to the SSC's changes to the analysis. We think it would be wise for the council not to choose the PPA until we see a final version of the draft EIS. Uh, we support the AP motion and would I would include the recommendation that has been made by others that the council consider requesting the IPHC's model to be finalized and used in the, um, in the next version of the analysis. I think that would be hugely helpful and illustrative. I see I've gone over my time. I apologize. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Parker. I'll give you a little extra time due to the interruption. Um, okay, uh, let's see if there's any questions. Don't see any. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you. All right, next up is Kavik Anderson. Um, good afternoon, Kavik Anderson here. I'm going to kind of bumble through this. I'm not a real good uh, speaker or reader here, but uh, good afternoon, Chairman Kingsley and Council members. My name is Kavik Anderson, and I'm a lifelong fisherman from Kodiak. I'm involved in a variety of fisheries with a variety of gear types, and I appreciate all segments of the fishing industry. I am fortunate to be a diversified fisherman and have worked hard to position myself to weather ups and downs. I currently fish for salmon, cod, crab, when there's a season in Kodiak, and halibut. We make a living from the sea because of healthy stocks, and we all have to be responsible to speak up when we see something that isn't right. What I want to see is a fishery managed in accountability. All sectors need to be responsible for what they catch, including bycatch. If the gear type you are using can't control their bycatch and we end up with the situation in the Bering Sea where more halibut is caught by trawlers and bycatch than the directed halibut fisheries, something has to change. When we see a trend where the proportion of halibut harvest slowly transitions from the majority harvested by the directed fisheries to more of a used as a bycatch, it is long past time to do something. We, we can't allow one sector to literally mow over and throw away another sector's livelihood. I would not call that being accountable. As it stands now, the conservation of the halibut resource is borne entirely by the directed fleet fishermen as the IPHC ramps down the catch for halibut as abundance declines, the static cap for the trawlers have is not working for the rest of us. I support abundant based management of the halibut bycatch by as a solution to address this inequality we have in the Bering Sea. The harvest of every other fish and crab species and the North Pacific management, thousands of families and businesses, communities depend on the health of the halibut resource. People travel to Alaska in hopes of catching a halibut. With iconic species, the fisheries management has to be responsible to protect it. Halibut abundance goes down, bycatch goes down. Abundance goes up, bycatch goes up. It is pretty straightforward fisheries management 101. We catch what we are allowed based on the status of the stocks. Among other user groups must be restored. The current management system has resulted in a directed fishery losing access to the fair share of the exploitable halibut biomass. With halibut bycatch removals exceeding the directed halibut fisheries removal since 2011, this isn't right and the council needs to address it and work towards a fair solution. Keep this moving forward on the SSC recommendations. I support the council alternative for which best addresses the needs of the directed halibut user. Counting on the council to make the right choice. Thank you for your opportunity to speak today. All right. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Anderson. Let's see if any council members have questions for you. Don't see any. Thanks again. 
thank you for your time. I appreciate being able to speak. Okay. Um, that brings us to Malcolm Milne. And we will uh, circle back to those who we've missed. And that is uh, Dia Kuzman and Nancy Hillstrand. So Malcolm Milne. Hey, hello, Mr. Chairman. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Hello, uh, Mr. Moon. Uh, before you get going, I'd like to again remind members of the public to please mute your phones, except for you, Mr. Moon. Yep, Whenever you're you. ready. Okay. The, yep. Is that echo gone? Sounds like it. I was I was threatened to be heckled, so maybe they're following through. Okay. Um, hello, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. My name is Malcolm Milne, and I'm president of the North Pacific Fisheries Association, based in Homer, Alaska. Many of our members participate in the directed halibut fishery, some in the Bering Sea, and many in the Gulf of Alaska. The community of Homer, where I have resided for 27 years, has a long history of halibut fishing. Charter, sport, and commercial sectors are all strongly represented here. As you know, the IPHC process sets a total of constant exploitable yield and then leaves it to each country to stay within that number. The status quo deducts the actual bycatch number of 032 fish from that TCEY, and what's left over goes to the directed fishery. If the council does not link the halibut PSC removals to abundance, there could be a situation where there is no directed fishery in areas 4C, D, and E in the Bering Sea due to the static prohibited species cap as we have now. There is a possibility that the IPHC could adjust limits to provide for a directed fishery, but at that point, it comes out of the directed longline and charter fisheries and other halibutory regulatory areas, including those surrounding Homer. Additionally, even without this drastic scenario, my understanding of the IPHC process is that the under 26 inch halibut removals in the Bering Sea affect the catch limits in all other areas as the stock is managed on a coastwise basis. And I don't think this was reflected um, properly reflected in the analysis. Now, respecting how complicated it is, I firmly believe the analysis does need to be does need to more directly and completely explore the effects to both 4CD and, e and the other IPHE regulatory areas in order to inform compliance with MSA National Standards 4 allocations and National Standard 5 communities. I think the SSC did touch on this in their comments. And I believe that's reflected in the AP motion. So I'm hoping the council will pick up on that. So as far as national standard nine bycatch, I spent some time looking at the public comments that were submitted for the 2015 council meeting in Sitka. I suggest you do the same, although I'm sure the last thing you want to do now is read more comment letters. Uh, many of those comments claimed that 2015 halibut bycatch had already been cut to the extent practicable and no other cuts could be made were tolerated by the Amendment 80 fleet. The council did make cuts at that meeting and clearly signaled that those were first steps and additional cup cuts would be explored through other methods, including abundance space management. So since then, the Amendment 80 fleet has adapted and they've done a very good job of staying below those caps. I know that they put a lot of work into it. I've followed the whole scenario along the way and I, and I do, appreciate the efforts that have gone into that, including the health attack sorting amongst others. Is that a, okay, I'll keep going there. I, yeah, please, Mr. Miller. Okay, Apologies. thanks. I thought I starting to get some Led Zeppelin feedback. Okay, so going forward, um, so I did want to point out that, yeah, the, so the fleet has adapted and stayed below those caps. Um, so slide 26 from the staff presentation shows the Amendment 80 sector revenue and the harvest in 2010. Uh, I will acknowledge that the cost associated with bycatch reduction effort is not reflected in this table. It just shows the revenues and catches, but it does seem to demonstrate that the cuts in 2015 did not result in lower sector revenue or catch, or at least significant, significant. And that those cuts that were done in 2015 were indeed practicable, contrary to the, all the comments that you can go review. Additionally, the Amendment 80 fleet has seen significant capitalization since 2015. New boats have come online, which is another sign of the practicability of those cuts. As far as additional tools, um, the council did review an FMP in February for halibut excluders. And uh, I believe they, that you endorsed it or passed it. Um, I did want to quote from the application of that for that uh, EFP, and it said, 
from, so this is page six from that application, which you reviewed. During discussions at the Alaska Seafood Cooperative Annual Captains Meeting, attendees expressed a strong interest in collaborating on halibut excluder designs and were supportive of rigorous field testing to generate sound data to inform trade-offs between reduction in halibut bycatch and loss of target catch with different excluders of known design. There was also considerable interest in working on and testing of new excluder designs that might better address the selectivity issues fishermen are encountering with current fishing conditions. That's the end of the quote. So I realize this is not a silver bullet. It is not going to immediately solve the bycatch issue, but it does point to their continued efforts by the amendment fleet to develop new tools and work on ways to make this a practicable uh, action. So with that, I do want to acknowledge that I, I think performance standards might be a good way to move forward that would allow time for adaption in the fleet and not have a drastic uh, limit where they're immediately just shut down, but does allow for further innovation and um, adaptation. So in closing, I want to say I appreciate the council indulging all these public comments for everyone being professional at this meeting and especially all the staff time that went into the analysis. I, I know this has just been a huge, huge lift and a, a lot of work. So I appreciate all that. And so finally, we're, we are, the North Pacific Fisheries Association is supportive of the AP motion and we urge the council to continue to move this action forward. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Milne. Any questions from council members? I don't see any. Thanks again. Yep, thank you. Okay, that brings us through our list. And so we'll circle back to the couple people that we missed. Dia Kuzman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, my hello, Chairman, Council Members. Uh, for the record, uh, my name is Dia Kuzman. Dia Kuzman. I'm a third generation Alaska fisherman uh, from Delta Junction, Alaska. <clears throat> uh, today I'm testifying uh, on my own behalf. Uh, I started fishing uh, with my dad at early age. Uh, at 16 years old, I was already running my dad's boat in Cook for salmon. <clears throat> uh, at age 22, I had an opportunity to buy uh, my dad's 47 uh, foot boat called Automatic, uh, which I'm still fishing on to this day to support my own family of, of five and a half kids and counting. <clears throat> I'm a second generation halibut IFQ holder. Uh, my first investment was in 2011, uh, which I financed almost uh, 4,500 pounds of Central Gulf IFQ halibut quota in 3A and 3B, and today I have less than 2,000 pounds. <clears throat> Even uh, with a big down payment, long term financing, I still have to compensate my 3A and 3B IFQ payments from other fisheries in the last five years. <clears throat> Six years ago, I invested in Bering Sea, 4C, 4D halibut IFQ quota because there was better opportunity out west and the halibut quota was a lot cheaper than other areas. <clears throat> the first five years, I made uh, enough money to pay the bank for halibut quota and my crew and enough support to, uh, to support my family. <clears throat> uh, last year, uh, my 4C, 4D quota uh, went down like 15% and including the halibut dock prices. <clears throat> I barely broke even on my halibut IFQ payments. <clears throat> I urge the council members to strongly consider options for halibut ABM to restore equity among all halibut users. Uh, maybe the council members should consider shortening the Amendment 80 trial season a couple months out of the year to conserve halibut. <clears throat> when the Amendment 80, we will have more time to figure out how to reduce halibut bycatch and more time to look for better tools in the toolbox. <clears throat> if the 4C, 4D quota goes any lower, which it did another 3.5% this year, I might have to start looking for a new job, maybe become a farmer. <clears throat> So please restore equity among all halibut users so I have to become a farmer. Thank you for letting me testify. All right. Thank you for uh, your testimony and joining us this afternoon. Any questions for Mr. Kuzin? All right. Thanks again. No, thank you. Uh, Last testifier uh, would be Nancy Hillstrand. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Hillstrand. I'm the owner and operator of Pioneer Alaskan Fisheries. We're a value-added seafood processor, primarily of halibut. 
We service many small boat fishing families in diverse sectors, so have witnessed up close the shared efforts and angst of these directed fleets as they navigate conservation. We support Alternative 4 to require lower wanton waste limits dependent on the halibut abundance. Conservation is achievable by the Amendment 80 fleet. They are very resourceful and they will find the tools as they did from 30 years ago when we heard the same excuse of conservation not being achievable, of reaching uh, their limits and tools uh, not available. Well, lo and behold, practicable adjustment has been achievable in a constant shifting tactic, so it is time to evolve further. Wanton waste under the more palatable bycatch continues colonial-style exploitation while the directed fleets have been forced to watch and wait for decades as, and I quote, freewheeling disposal of public resources on what is wasteful, biologically exhaustive, rooted in special privilege, narrowly selfish, and contrary to the rights of others and to the public interest. And those are not my words. Those are paraphrased from what created the Constitution of Alaska. Please assist the trawl fleet to accommodate further conservation, to share with the other thousands of other direct fisheries citizens and for them to acknowledge these other people. So please adopt Alternative 4, and thank you so much for letting me testify. Thank you, Ms. Beltran. Questions? Don't see any. Thanks again for your testimony. That, uh, that concludes public comment. Um, let's go ahead and uh, take a take a break here while we uh, get that organized for the action. Uh, come back at uh, 1.40 Alaska time.
Hey everyone, just a, a quick update here. Uh, need a little bit more time before we're ready for action. So if we can update the uh, the return time until 1.55 Alaska time. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Council, please come back to order. Ready for action on ADM? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do have a motion that has been sent to council staff. Thank you, Ms. Baker. We can stand by while it's posted. Whenever you're ready. The council recommends releasing the analysis for final action after incorporating the SSC comments to the extent practicable. The council revises the alternatives as follows. Additions from the October 2020 council motion are in bold and underlined font and deletions are in strike through font. Alternative one, no action. Alternative two, a three by two lookup table with PSU limits that range from the current PSU limit to 27% below current limit. PSU limit is determined annually based on the most recent survey values. No change to the table. Alternative three, a four by two lookup table with PSU limits that range from 15% above current PSU limits to 30% below current limit. PSC limit is determined annually based on the most recent survey values. No change to the table. Alternative four, a four by two lookup table with PSC limits that range from current PSC limit to 45% below current limit. PSC limit is determined annually based on the most recent survey values. No change to the table. Options may apply to all action alternatives. Option one, no change. Option two, in the first year of implementation, the PSC limit varies no more than 10% or 15% from the status quo limit, 1,745 metric tons. Option three, establish an annual limit of 80% or 90% of the PSC limit generated by the lookup table in three of seven years, the MM and 80 sector may exceed the annual limit up to the PSC limit generated by the lookup table. If the MM and 80 sector has exceeded the annual limit in three of the past seven years, then the annual limit is a hard cap for that year. The second, I'll speak to it. Second, Mr. All right, thank you, Mr. Mesereau. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, overall, uh, this motion really does just a couple of different things. Uh, first off, I'm recommending that the council release uh, the analysis for final action after incorporating the SSC comments to the extent practicable. Uh, I know we've had a lot of discussion about uh, whether the analysis should be released for final action at this particular meeting. We heard a lot of testimony uh, on that specifically uh, in terms of whether we should go further than just incorporating the SSC comments, whether we should uh, do some pretty substantial uh, revisions to our analysis in terms of perhaps looking at other models uh, and things like that. I think uh, we heard very clearly from the SSC, or at least I heard very clearly from the SSC uh, that all of the discussion we had and all the work we did on the halibut operating model, uh, while uh, potentially valuable in, in some regards, uh, those model results are not necessary uh, for us to go forward with this analysis. Uh, the SSC was pretty clear that with uh, the revisions that they uh, recommended for the analysis that there was sufficient information to move forward uh, for the council to release the analysis for final action. And uh, I agree with that assessment. 
And, and so I'm recommending that the council do that at this stage. I think over uh, certainly at this meeting uh, and at previous uh, meetings discussing this action, uh, we've heard a lot of public testimony in terms of uh, the great need uh, for the council to implement an abundance-based management program for how the PSD. And I think we're uh, pretty regularly reminded of the time that it has taken us uh, to move forward on this action. And so I'm very cognizant of that uh, in terms of, of where we are in this analytical process. And I would uh, really hope, since I feel like we do uh, with these uh, revisions uh, recommended by the SSC, if those uh, are incorporated into the analysis, I feel like uh, we do have uh, sufficient information uh, to understand the impacts of our decision uh, under the current alternative. And so uh, any revisions that I did make uh, to the current alternative and options, I don't consider substantive. They really are just for clarification. Uh, so I will just walk through those really quickly. Uh, in, in the uh, introductory text, alternative two, three, and four, um, it's, there's no change in intent, uh, adding uh, the word uh, the most, so the PSD limit is determined annually based on the most recent survey values. Uh, we discussed this a little bit at the October 2020 council meeting in terms of uh, since we would be linking uh, the PSD limit to uh, the indices, the set line uh, survey from the IPHC and the Eastern Bering Sea Shelf Trawl Survey, uh, we did have some discussion back in October and then again at this meeting. Um, that it is possible, as we found out uh, in 2020, that there may not be a survey in any one year. And so we just want to be very clear uh, that we understand that possibility. And so uh, I'm just suggesting uh, this minor text revision in the intro to all the three alternatives to make that really clear. Um, moving along to the options, uh, I'm only suggesting a, a change to option two. Um, I think. Uh, really, in my mind, as I, as I reviewed the analysis and thought about uh, this option a little bit more, uh, I know that it was put in, in the uh, set of alternatives as an option uh, to sort of implement or, excuse me, um, minimize variability uh, between uh, states of the indices and potential PSC limits. I think with the PSC limit in the current alternative that we are looking at, I don't think that annual uh, limit in variability uh, necessarily, necessarily is really needed where I envisioned it most um, potentially coming into play was in the first year of implementation. Uh, some of the alternatives that we are currently considering um, could result uh, in, in a reduction in the PSC limit that uh, may be larger than that 10 to 15 percent. And so uh, I have uh, clarified at least uh, my intent for option two that in the first year of implementation, uh, the PSD limit would vary potentially no more than uh, 10 or 15 percent from the status quo limit uh, to give an adjustment period uh, for uh, the, uh, the ABM program uh, to uh, be fully implemented. And so the, just making sure I cover all of the changes here. Oh, and in option three, uh, again, no substantive change, uh, just a little bit of revision to the language to make it a little bit clearer. Um, I noted that the original option three just repeated uh, the sub options for the annual limit, 80% or 90% of the PSC limit generated by the lookup table. So I've just suggested uh, replacing that text in the second to last sentence with the annual limit um, for, for clarity and brevity. I believe uh, those are the things that I wanted to uh, describe to the council, Mr. Chair, so I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Are there any questions on the motion? Mr. Cross. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Baker, for the motion. I, I, I'm a little disappointed in, uh, but we had a lot of public testimony from the Amendment 80 sector about the um, practicability of 
reaching some of those goals. Um, I, I'm wondering how you are uh, viewing uh, that particular aspect of being practical and the options that you have in the lookup table. Thank you, Mr. Cross, for the question. Um, I think and I agree uh, with the testimony that you're referring to in the sense that um, it is very important for this council uh, to consider the National Standard 9 requirements uh, in terms of minimizing uh, bycatch to the extent practicable. I think it is important for the council to consider all of the information that's in front of us, including what's in the analysis. I think some of the comments um, and, and testimony that we heard suggested that perhaps a, a little bit uh, more information uh, could be provided in the analysis in, in terms of practicability under some of these alternatives. But at this particular point in time, I feel like uh, the information that we do have in the analysis uh, shows that um, I, I think that given all of the issues and the different things that we need to balance within this action, uh, that practicability doesn't necessarily mean that there just won't be any impact uh, on the MM and AD sector, as we heard earlier. I'm not saying there won't be under uh, these alternatives, but at this point, I think uh, they give us a sufficient range to analyze uh, in terms of practicability that I feel comfortable going forward at this time with the Thank you. Mr. Merrill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Baker, uh, I may have missed it, but what was your rationale for striking option four? Thank you, Mr. Merrill. I did not uh, cover that, so thank you for uh, pointing that out. Uh, option four, um, I think the, the analysis um, it, it, and staff, I think, told us this in the presentation. Uh, they had a little bit of trouble conceptualizing it. And, and I think the reason, at least my interpretation of the reason, was that while the, the rollover concept is something that the council has used before uh, in, in terms of providing some flexibility uh, for PSC limit uh, programs and PSC management programs, I think the, the construct of the current ABM alternatives in terms of the fact that the PSC limit could potentially change every year, depending on where you are in the lookup table, it, it essentially makes that rollover construct not work because you could, you could potentially end up uh, with the fleet being able to uh, save halibut PSC, if you will, and then in the, and roll up up to 20%, but then that next year, uh, the PSC limit is higher, it goes up and that rollover is not needed. And so it didn't, while the concept I think um, was worth exploring, my assessment was that it did not fit well within the structure of the ABM alternatives that we have. Mr. Cross. Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is about um, option three of the performance standards. Um, the construct in there um, is really um, does not provide um, any real incentives to industry to um, uh, try to minimize bycatch in those years when they go over, since essentially a one ton overage functions the same way as, as a thousand ton overage. Um, and similarly, the um, option three performance standard as it's constructed doesn't provide any real incentive to the fleet to um, keep bycatch levels low in the years when it's clear that they're gonna come in under the performance standard. There's no incentive for them to come in further below the performance standard. Since coming in 100 tons below doesn't give you any more credit than coming in one ton below. And I'm wondering why um, 
the motion doesn't include the opportunity for other um, ways of crafting a performance standard that would provide a lot more incentives and make a performance standard a lot more useful. Thank you, Mr. Twight, for the question. Uh, I agree uh, that you potentially could have that outcome uh, under the option three uh, approach to a performance standard. Um, and, and I did uh, and think about uh, ways to perhaps uh, provide a, a more flexibility. Um, like you mentioned, I think the challenge was, and we've said from the beginning, uh, that the council recognizes uh, that there is a trade-off in terms of having a, a pretty coarse approach uh, like we have in these lookup tables. Uh, there are pros and cons uh, to having that approach, but we have decided uh, that with this general approach, um, it, is, it is probably going, um, we're trading off sort of transparency and a, a little bit of certainty in what um, limits are going to be uh, in, in, in terms of perhaps trying to provide for more uh, precise uh, performance standards for things that, quite frankly, I just didn't have any information uh, that I could find to help me craft something oh, that would provide a little bit more flexibility. That's not to say it can't be done. Uh, I just was not able to do it. Thanks for the question, Mr. Floyd. Thank Mr. Doan. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Baker, for your motion. Um, I have a, a, a couple of questions for you. So my, my first question, I just am comparing this quickly on my, uh, I've got the AP motion up here. Um, being that much of the public testimony that we heard was about the effects uh, to the communities and the people uh, of area 4, C, D, and E primarily, but um, the, I, I'm wondering, um, your motion didn't pick up the additional material or the additional information that was asked for in the AP motion under their items that three A, B, and C, they had those three items there. So I'm wondering what happens to those that, that in other words, my question is we, we got rid of the model, which was intention that one of the, one of the outcomes of the model uh, usage could have been a way to look at what the effects on, on that area and those those uh, fishers would be uh, the direct fishers, um, and so I guess that's my question: is is does that is that do you feel like that's incorporated in what you've asked for in the SSC, or is that left out, or is that just going to be left up to the analysis the analysts? I'm I'm I'm, uh, um, I'm just thinking in my mind how this is all going to come together. What we might see in the last analysis uh, uh, upon those request being that it was in the AP and we heard a lot of public comment on that. So I'd appreciate your thoughts on that, Ms. Baker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Down. Um, I, I did uh, notice uh, that recommendation, including in the AP motion. I, I also had uh, a discussion with Mr. Upton yesterday when we got the AP report and, and I also took away uh, from the staff presentation that um, staff weren't able to do those three things requested <laughs> to any large degree in the AP motion. And so uh, I would happily stand corrected if I'm wrong. Um, and, and so I, I purposefully didn't include them because I heard staff say uh, that they're not able to address those particular points. Um, if we would like to clarify that with staff, I, I'd be happy to do that. Um, but I guess I would just say also a, another point, I, I understand the intent uh, behind particularly the first two requests in the AP motion about the specific impacts to area four CBE. I, um, I feel like uh, the impacts to uh, individual communities are, are covered quite well uh, in the main portion of the EIS and particularly the uh, social impact assessment. I, I guess um, it's, I, I understand the, the unique situation for area four CBE, but also I guess I would remind the council that uh, this action is 
is abundance-based management for uh, halibut PSD in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands. And so fundamentally, we have that different, those different management areas for ground fish and halibut. So I, I feel like it's important to uh, refer to the entire analysis of the impacts on Area 4 directed halibut fisheries as captured in the EIS and the SIA. Well, thank you for that, and, and I don't I don't know if we need to have clarification from staff on what they they can and can't do. I think we we may find that out, but I suppose my point of and I uh, I'm certainly not not pushing here, Miss Baker. I, I like your I like your motion. I think you've done a good job here. I'm just uh, um, anticipating kind of what we might get when we see this back, and being that you didn't problem statement, I think speaks to to this question that I have about how we're going to measure the effects on, on area 4 CD and E, at least I believe believe it does the way I read it. So um, uh, that uh, um, that I, I suppose the answer you give me is, maybe the answer you give me is fine if you have any more comments on that, but just as how how you see our, uh, the, um, the, lack of the ability for analysis to match up with the problem statement. Baker, I don't know if you have any additional response. If not, we can move on to Mr. Cross. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, I guess I'm not, um, not quite tracking um, sort of the question. I, I feel like, I, I guess what I'm saying is, I heard staff say those those three requests in the AP motion were uh, not possible uh, to fulfill. I did not put them in my motion. If another council member feels they're essential uh, for our analysis going forward, um, I would welcome an amendment to that degree, I, I guess, but I'm, I didn't feel it was appropriate to put in my motion. Yeah, maybe those secondary comments by me, Mr. Chairman, were, were pretty convoluted. And so, Ms. Baker, I, you did answer me on the first go round, and so I apologize for uh, for that. I just was trying to get this uh, straight in my own mind. So I appreciate your answer, and, and that's, that, that's fine. I, I feel like you've answered my question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and Ms. Baker, and I apologize for not uh, understanding. On option three, um, it has at the end, if the Amendment 80 sector exceeds the annual limit in three of the past seven years, then the annual limit is a hard cap for that year. I I'm not sure what that year means. Up you're on mute. Thank you, Mr. Cross. I, I, the analyst did bring that up in the analysis, so thank you very much. It, it should say for, um, it should read then the annual limit is a hard cap for the following year. Uh, and the analysis, and I don't have it right in front of me with that particular section, the analysis um, describes the intent correctly. We, we would not change uh, a, P a PSC limit or an annual limit within a year. It would be for the following year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Any additional questions on the motion? Mr. Merrill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Baker. Just to follow up and make sure that I have this based on the uh, back and forth with Mr. Cross. So this would mean that if you exceeded the limit in a rolling seven-year period for three years, after that third year, the following year, you would establish a new PSC limit that would be either 80 or 90% of whatever the PSC limit is for that year after you exceeded the limit. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. That is correct. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Any additional questions? 
additional questions for Ms. Baker? Mr. Krauss. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Following up on that, um, and just, I, I apologize, I'm just trying to figure this out. Um, Ms. Baker, so the on the fourth year, the annual limit is the hard cap, and then it's just for that year, then what does it go back to? The annual limit would stay a hard cap if the PSC did not stay below the annual limit that following year. The performance standard is, is applied on a rolling basis. So if in that following year where the annual limit becomes the PSC limit, the hard cap, if PSC is below the annual limit, and that resulted in the sector not exceeding the annual limit for three of the previous seven years, then the PSC limit would go back up to the lookup table value. Okay, thank you. Mr. Clay. We'll follow up to that. Does because the in that year the annual limit becomes a hard cap, the the catch has to be below it, right? And so wouldn't it just have to go back, revert to the there would then be a year of good performance just by regulation. Mr. Twight, um, thank you for that question. I'm just making sure I'm just finding the um, portion of the analysis to make sure I'm following. So um, yeah, I think, sorry if I misspoke, uh, in any given year, the MM and AD sectors PSC is assessed against the annual limit. Um, so it's just, yeah, essentially an, an annual pass or fail the results from that year plus the results for the six preceding years will be assessed in total uh, to determine whether the annual limit was exceeded in three of seven years on a rolling basis. Mr. Marks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Baker. It, sorry to belabor this, but I'm, I'm still trying to wrap wrap myself around this. So if, if I think about this differently, the effect is 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 would be the same as as reducing the the uh, cap identified in the table by ten to twenty percent, but in three out of seven years you could exceed that level by 10 or 20%, whatever that assigned rate was in option three. I'm just looking at it differently. I mean, if you'd taken each of these cells in the in the tables and drop them by whatever rate, uh, 10 or 20% if through option three, that really sets your cap, but, but you'd be able to exceed that uh, based on my interpretation of option three in three of seven years. Thank you, Mr. Marks. Um, that is my understanding, but I'm perhaps not doing a, a very good job of uh, explaining this. I wonder if I might, would it help to ask staff to help us with this? Or I, I agree with the interpretation that staff provided in the analysis, um, and maybe it would help uh, to have Someone else other than me explain it. I'm sorry, I'm not doing a great job. No, that's, that's fine. Thanks. Uh, we have Dr. Graham and Ms. Henry available to jump in. Mr. Chairman, this is Diana. I'm happy to jump in if it helps. Um, okay. I, I think that you 
our understanding it correctly. When we tried to provide an example, we were providing it on a historical basis. And so what we show is um, when the annual limit is exceeded and then becomes a hard cap, what we're not, we were not showing, um, but is correct is what Mr. Twight was saying is that when it becomes a hard cap, then you get one year of credit immediately in that year because you can't exceed it, but you still have to make your way out of the three out of seven year average. So it is still a hard cap until you have gotten enough years under that to get out of having exceeded the limit in previous years. So it remains a hard cap until for, enough, for as many years as is necessary to get out of the three bad years where it was exceeded. Thank you, Dr. Strand. Further questions on Mr. Kress? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Dr. Stram, thank you. Uh, and I really apologize. I'm, with the salmon one, I, I understand it. Um, I'm having difficulty. So when does the seven years start over? Um, so if, if, you, um, if you had two years of three years of bad, and then you have that one year of good, is the seven years starting with the, the, the first three that were bad? Is that when the seven starts? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Cox, that's correct, as we understood it, so that you would need, if you had three years in a row immediately that were bad, you have to get out of that rolling seven years in order for that to revert back to an annual limit instead of a hard cap. Okay, thank you. Mr. Merrill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Dr. Stram. <laughs> so I want to make sure that I understand your reading of this provision and, and whether or not the words that we have in this provision match that description. So I, I believe you had noted that you would be subject to a PFC limit that would be the same of the annual limit, quote, until you get out of the three and seven year period. Um, the wording that we have in option three, I think, is that the annual limit is a hard cap for that year. It, it's only specific to like, the year following the year in which you exceeded the three and seven average. So I'm wondering if the reading of the motion as it's currently written is consistent with your understanding of how this operates, or do we need to realign the wording of this to better align with what has previously been analyzed under option three? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Merrill. I, um, I think because the example that we were using was historical where it was continuing to roll forward and be exceeded, but as I understand it, and as you were just explaining, it is a hard cap for the subsequent year. It would then not be a hard cap the year after that. However, if that next year is exceeded, then you're back in, you're still within your seven year period. So I'm sorry if I explained that incorrectly just now, but that, yes, that is exactly correct. It doesn't continue to be a hard cap until you get out of it. It is a hard cap the subsequent year. However, your performance the year after that is going to still be within that seven years. So that will make a difference as to what happens in the next year. Hopefully that clarifies that. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, just a quick follow up on this. In that year in which the annual limit, the performance standard, if you will, becomes the PSC limit, you don't have a separate new 10% or 20% lower uh, annual limit that's established. The annual limit and the PFC limit is exactly the same thing. So you would not exceed that annual limit unless the amendment 80 sector as a whole exceeded its overall PFC limit. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Merrill, yes, that's the way we interpreted that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Stern. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. 
Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Stram. From all of that exchange then, is, is it correct to understand that still the only potential change we would need to the motion language to make it consistent with how it's been analyzed is to remove the word that at the end of that sentence and, and insert the words the following. Everything else in what you've explained, I think, is how it's been been analyzed to date, and maybe you've already, you know, explained that there could be some further examples to show how it would work, and that would help us in the future. Am I understanding that correctly, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Kimball? That's correct. We pointed out in the analysis that this was how we were interpreting it, so that it is for the subsequent, it is for the following year, and we only noted to the council that if you did not intend for that, that you would need to make a change. So you can either clarify that in this motion or that is how we interpreted it all along. Thanks. Okay. Any further questions? Um, while we have Ms. Kimball? Yes. Uh, this was not a question for staff if we were still pursuing that. Mr. Chair, I can wait. I think we're ready to move on. Ms. Kimball. Thank you. Ms. Baker, just a question on your motion and a reminder of where we are in the process. It's, it's clear your your um, motion and talking points talk about having enough information to, once we've incorporated these changes from the SSC, to, to release it for final action at our next you know, juncture. And so I know you also did not choose a preliminary preferred alternative. And I just want to confirm that not choosing a preliminary preferred alternative at this time does not mean that we couldn't take final action the next time we see this analysis. We would have that option open to us as far as I understand the EIS process laid out to us by staff. Is that your understanding as well? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Kimball, for the question. That is my understanding. Uh, the council is not uh, obligated uh, in any case, is my understanding, to pick a preliminary preferred alternative. In some cases, it is uh, appropriate to do so. I uh, just did not feel uh, with some of the outstanding revisions to the analysis recommended by the SSC. Uh, and potentially some of, um, I mean, especially related to the changes uh, that the SSC re recommended in, in terms of some of the impacts analysis. I, I really just felt uh, it was it was premature uh, to pick a preliminary preferred alternative and I am not recommending that we do that. Thank you for that explanation. Further questions on the motion? Let's move to amendments to the motion. Members of the public, please put your phones on mute. Thank you. Mr. Merrill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just for clarity and to reflect uh, the discussion that we had with staff, I would uh, propose amending the last sentence in option three to read as follows. The annual limit is a hard cap for the following year. So strike that and replace it with the following. And with a second, I can speak to it. Second. Second by Mr. Uh, Jensen. Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just very briefly, I think we've already had the discussion. I think this just makes it perfectly clear to the public uh, based on this. I, I think this won't be inconsistent with the analysis that we've already had, but uh, given the confusion that we had around the table, I think it may be helpful for the public to uh, have a clear understanding of this issue that reflects that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. That's good clarification. Any um, questions on the amendment? or amendments to the amendment. And Mr. Twight, let me, I think your hand is up for a different amendment, but let me know if otherwise. Um, okay, any comments on the amendment? Um, 
there any opposition to the amendment? With none, the amendment passes. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have an amendment that's a little longer um, that I sent to staff a little while ago. So um, I'll wait um, while they bring it up. That's my amendment. Um, so my amendment is to add the following after alternative four. Alternative five, the four by two lookup table with PSC limits, a performance standard with an annual limit and a requirement for a halibut avoidance plan to be provided annually to the council. The PSC limits range from 5% above the current PSC limit to 15% below. The PSC limit is determined annually based on the most recent survey values, and the annual limit is 80 or 90. And those are two options for analysis of the P percent of the PSC limit generated by the lookup table. In the lookup table, the, um, the two columns under EBS shelf trawl survey index are the same as the columns in a couple of the other alternatives. There's a low uh, category of less than 150,000 and a high category of greater than or equal to 150,000. There's four rows titled IPHC set line survey index in area four, A, B, C, D, E. Um, and it's weighted per unit effort. Um, the first row is high, greater than or equal to 11,000. The second row is medium between 8,000 and 10,099. The third row is low, 6,000 to 7,999. And finally, the bottom row is very low, less than 6,000. The individual cells uh, read down um, each column, starting with the low column. The top cell is uh, for the, the high row in the low column is 1745 metric tons, which is the current limit with then that's the bycatch cap. Then the two options for annual catch limits for the performance standard are either 1396 metric tons or 1571 metric tons. Reading down from there for the medium row, uh, the bycatch cap of 1658 metric tons, which is 5% below the current limit. And the two options for the performance standards are either 1326 metric tons or 1492 metric tons. Third row under low trawl is 1571 metric tons by catch cap, 10% below the current limit. With the two options for performance standards, either 1256 metric tons or 1413. Finally, the bottom row of that column 1483 metric tons for bycatch cap, which is 15% below the current limit, with two options of either 1187 metric tons or 1335 metric tons for the performance standard. Moving to the right to the high column, <coughs> and starting with the high row, uh, 1832 metric tons would be the bycatch cap, which is 5% above the current limit, with two um, performance standard options of 1466 or 1649 metric tons. Next row down, 1745 metric tons, which is the current um, bycatch cap. And then the two options for the performance standards of either 1396 or 1571 metric tons. For the low row <coughs> um, in the high column, 1658 metric ton bycatch cap, which is five percent below the current limit with rows, uh, the performance standards of either 1326 or 1492 metric ton. And finally, for the very low row and the high column, 1571 metric ton bycatch cap, which is 10% below the current limit and performance stand 
standards of either 1,256 metric tons or 1,413 metric tons. The halibut avoidance plan, the Amendment 80 sector will develop a halibut avoidance plan that describes the incentives for vessel operators to avoid halibut bycatch under any condition of ground fish and halibut abundance in all years. <laughs> Rewards for avoiding halibut bycatch, penalties for failing to avoid halibut bycatch, how the avoidance plan will promote lower halibut bycatch rates and how vessel operators will manage halibut bycatch below the performance standard. This halibut avoidance plan would be required as part of the annual cooperative application or by November 1 for any vessel participating in the Amendment 80 limited access sector. At the second, I can speak to my motion. Second. Seconded by Mr. Cross. Mr. Twight, and uh, the, the amendment is a link to the amendment is posted in the, the IT chat box. Okay, Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Cross. Hold on, I'm trying to make this large enough that I can actually read it. Um, The problem statement for this action has a focus on establishing an abundance-based bycatch management program in the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands and references both national standards one and nine. The problem statement concludes by noting that adoption of an abundance-based program may provide additional benefits of resource conservation and additional harvest opportunities for the directed halibut fishery. The SSC review of the analyses to date have consistently noted that any potential resource conservation benefits are likely to be small or negligible and inform the council that this action appears to be primarily allocated. I'm offering this additional alternative as I'm concerned that all of the four alternatives that are currently under consideration appear weighted heavily towards reductions that will reduce capacity to achieve OY and go beyond what is practicable. I'm also concerned that none of them take, take advantage of the bycatch reduction value that can be gained through implementation of an approach that combines a performance standard and avoidance plan with bycatch caps as a backstop. Hard caps, such as are contemplated in all the alternatives, including in my amendment, are not a good tool for achieving the kind of balance between national standard one and nine that the MSA requires. Set too low, Hard caps instigate a race for fish, in this case, a race for bycatch, which ensures that bycatch levels will consistently rise to the level of the cap and that amounts of harvestable groundfish will be left in the water. This situation accomplishes neither of the national standards and fails a few of the others. The cooperative structure breaks down under these conditions, triggering a return to the Amendment 80 limited entry fishery, which would create other problems with co-op based agreements with other sectors to promote orderly fisheries. <clears throat> Set at appropriate levels, hard caps on bycatch can serve as a backstop for performance standards and avoid triggering a race for fish. As we have seen with the Chinook bycatch avoidance program, performance standards actually strengthen efforts to minimize bycatch and maintain the cooperative structure of the fishery. Effective performance standards ensure that bycatch will rarely, if ever, rise to the cap level and provide maximum flexibility for achieving OY. They aren't a guarantee of either, but they provide the environment for success at addressing both national standards. The alternative I'm proposing is intended to strike that balance with an abundance-based approach. It varies bycatch levels using the same four by two matrix approach <coughs> of most of the other alternatives using a cap and standard approach. My tables don't look quite as fancy as the state's tables. My skills at creating understandable tables aren't quite up to their level. And they're a bit more cluttered as I thought it was important to show both the bycatch cap and the performance standard at each step. Since the emphasis of my alternative is really on the performance standard. For the low troll abundance column, the cap starts at the current level, but is reduced by 10 to 20%, depending on the performance standard chosen by the council in option three of the main motion. For each step down on the set line survey index, the cap drops by 5%, always decreased further by the performance standard amount. In the high trawl abundance column, 
the cap starts at 5% over the current level, since that is a high, high condition of halibut abundance, and decreases by 5% for each step down in the set line survey abundance, also with an 80 to 90% performance standard at each step. This alternative best addresses the problem statement by making most effective use of the performance standard approach. The other alternatives, particularly at low and very low set line survey abundance levels, and in particular alternative four, provide no platform for a performance standard-based approach. As we know from our own experience and as we heard in public testimony, performance standards work when there are built-in incentives and when they allow the affected sectors to use them to control their performance and adapt to annual variations in catchability of both the target species and the bycatch species. Alternative five is structured to provide those incentives and will be most useful for understanding how performance standards could work at low and very low abundance level. Analysis of the other four alternatives will provide useful insight into conditions under which performance standards do not work. The council intends to establish an abundance base. Oh, excuse me. I'm done speaking to my motion. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Questions on the amendment? Ms. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Twight, what year do you anticipate that this action will be effective? <laughs> you, you're speaking to the entire abundance-based approach? Yes. So assuming we stick to our schedule of October of this year for final action by the council, and hoping that this can move through the regulatory process in relatively short order, I would assume that it would take effect in January of 2023. Mr. Merrill. But I don't know, I, I'm sorry, I may have missed something in that. I, I'm not sure how that affects the amendment that I'm offering. I, I don't, I'm, I, so I'm, I may have missed something in my answer. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to explain how it affects the amendment he's offering, but I might be wandering well past the time for questions if I did so. So maybe we'll just save that piece. Okay, let's go on to Mr. Merrill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Twight, uh, for your motion. Your motion has two component parts, and I was curious as to why you combined um, both uh, the alternative with the performance standard sort of married to it with the halibut avoidance plan as one motion, and whether or not any aspects of that avoidance plan might also be applicable to the other action alternatives that we have before us. Thank you. Uh, if the council chose to apply it to others, I they certainly could. Um, the reason I did not was um, because I thought it was an integral part of, of making the performance standard work here. And I question whether the performance standard will actually work in any of the other alternatives. And so it, it seemed to me not to... Um, be particularly useful to add one more requirement to a performance standard when I'm, um, when I at least have doubts about whether the performance standard is is workable with any of the, the alternatives that are currently in the motion. Further questions on the amendment? Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Twight. So the, the portion of the motion that includes a, an annual limit, that, that is integral to your, your lookup table. You could not choose the lookup table without an annual limit. Is that what I heard you say in your response? 
Um, that's the intent of my motion, yeah, is that at every step there is both a, um, a backstop that the bycatch cap as and the operative value, which is the performance standard that's, that's then um, at each point, the council has a choice whether to use 80 or 90% of the bycatch cap as the performance standard. But that, that for each box, both of those are operative. Thank you. And then a second question, Mr. Chair, is on the, the halibut avoidance plan piece. It looks like or it reads as if it's direction to the Amendment 80 sector. Is that is the intent of that piece that we would describe in regulation what would be needed in a halibut avoidance plan in order to submit it as part of the annual co-op application? Or I'm just not sure what, what is regulated in this sense and what isn't. If you could just elaborate on that. I, I would hope that if um, that we could couch it ultimately in a way that serves as guidance and and have the least amount of it in regulation possible. Um, I think we've got some precedent with some of the other reports where we um, do require a report, but don't necessarily put in regulation all the required elements of the report. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Kimball. Further questions on the amendment? Amendment to the amendment. Into comments on the amendment. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Twight, for the amendment. I've, um, yeah, been, thanks for reading it through and, and sort of explaining uh, the process for how it would work and appreciate uh, you kind of incorporating the same concepts that we're working with under uh, the lookout table approach. Um, I, I, I do have, uh, concern about uh, the PSC limits and resulting annual limits uh, in this particular approach. I think I heard you say very clearly that uh, you think that the PSC limits and resulting annual limits in the current alternative may be uh, too constraining and, and may not allow for the most effective PSC management. Um, I guess I'm not necessarily seeing that uh, in the analysis, I think you're right. We, we definitely heard uh, a lot of testimony uh, from the Amendment 80 sector, and I appreciated that. And, and I hope, uh, as we talked about earlier, that we will be able to improve our analysis and maybe add some information uh, in terms of practicability uh, of the Amendment 80 sector to um, stay within the limits that would result under an ABM program. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm just... Uh, at, at this point, just looking, uh, for example, at table 319 in the document and uh, understanding that there's no average year for the Amendment 80 sector, I guess I'm just not seeing with this particular uh, lookup table sort of any meaningful uh, recalibration, if you will, to our our current state of the halibut stock, um, which as we've heard throughout the presentation um, is lower than uh, when the council took action in 2015, we were at a medium high state at, at that point in terms of the set line index and the trawl survey index. And according to this table, uh, the PSC limit at our current state of low low would be 1,571 metric tons. And uh, the two potential uh, annual limits there, I think just uh, doing a, a brief scan of, of the PSC used by the MM and 80 sector, I, I just am not seeing uh, a meaningful reduction in understanding that it could be challenging uh, for the MM and 80 sector in any one year. I think one of the really important objectives of this ABM action uh, is to link the PSC limits to abundance. And when we do that, uh, we can't just look at the limits. We also need to look at uh, Amendment 80 PSC use in recent years. 
and I'm just not comfortable uh, that we would be able to achieve our objectives in terms of minimizing bycatch to the extent practicable. Uh, I understand your concerns about practicability, but I'm thinking of all of the other factors that we need to consider uh, in terms of fair and equitable allocations and uh, considering fishing communities. Uh, so I'm not going to be able to support this motion, although I, I do appreciate uh, the motion and I, I uh, am interested in a performance standard concept. I understood your comments related to that, but um, I just am not able to support this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Ms. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I want to follow up on my earlier question to Mr. Troy. And while I appreciate his optimism that this is going to be implemented in 2023, and I hope that he's correct, I think it could easily be 2024 before this is implemented. Uh, the first three years that it is implemented, so say that 2024, 2025, and 2026, the sector, assuming that we're still in the low, low box, would have a PSC limit of 1,571 metric tons, a level that they haven't used since pre-deck sorting days. The earliest I think we would see any potential constraint on Amendment 80's PSC usage would be 2027. In 2027, assuming we choose the 90% performance standard, they would have a limit of 1,413 metric tons. And that's a limit that wouldn't have been constraining in 2016, 2017, 2018, or 2020. Then they would go right back to the 1,571 metric ton limit in 2028. So over the next <laughs> seven years, we would have a limit that, that just, we don't have any evidence that it would ever be constraining on Amendment 80. If this is Mr. Twyke's vision of how we balance the competing responsibilities of the council in being responsive to national standards, I just could not disagree more strongly. So I can't support this. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Mr. Marks. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Mr. Twyke, for the motion. Um, I, I find this compelling. I, I, my issues with the other options, I, I, I think they're more of a stick than a carrot as far as the performance standards. Again, it effectively drops drops each of the the uh, cells and and uh, caps by 10 to 20 percent, and and then there's a essentially three out of seven years you could exceed that by 10 percent or maybe 20 percent. I find this con concept interesting in that, that it is it is more of a performance standard. It, it provides that carrot. It encourages the, the uh, fleet to, to do better and, and with ownership. Whether, whether these caps are the right ones or not, I won't speak to that, but I, I think it's a concept that, that's worth looking at because again, none of the other options or the fixed amounts provide that, what I would really call an incentive-based uh, standard of performance. As again, you can, whether you agree with these numbers or not, they, they can, the caps, they can change. But, but it, again, I, I think this, in my mind, is, is much more of a performance-based standard than, than any of the others. And I think it's worth looking at, and, and I will support it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Marks. Mr. Twice. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I did want to respond some to Ms. Campbell's comments because I, I, I felt like they um, were either based on um, a mistrust for how the performance standard would work or um, an, an assumption around status quo that I'm not sure I share. Um, if the scenario that um, Ms. Kimball outlined is indeed operative, that we're still in low, low, and if 
we're not seeing problems like we saw in 2019 with warm water and, and ex extensive overlap, um, then indeed they would not be constraining, but that's by design um, because that's an opportunity then for the Amendment 80 fleet to essentially still minimize bycatch in order to build up credit. In a lot of ways, you're describing a, 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 a best start to a performance standard, which is efforts to put fish in the bank for that inevitably troublesome year like the 2019. Um, so if indeed we're in that that category you're talking about, but indeed their halibut bycatch levels remain at, at what you envision. Those are the years, that, based on incidents, those are the years when they can actually put some fish in the bank and really make a performance standard, which is an incentives based approach, work. There has to be room for incentive in there. And that, that's created by that difference that you were describing. You were viewing that as a negative. I view that as actually a positive for having an effective performance standard approach where the fleet is actually able to use their tools to continue to aggressively minimize bycatch. It's a difference in perspective, I guess. But for me, the situation you were describing could provide a very successful start both at achieving our objectives of having bycatch minimized, but equally at achieving our objectives of seeing the OY utilized. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Further comments on the amendment? Mr. Merrill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Twight. Uh, I've appreciated the comments around the table, and I think um, there are a couple of ways to look at this issue. I, I support this primarily moving forward uh, on procedural grounds. Right now, we're at a standpoint in our process where we are getting ready to publish a draft EIS. And one of the things I think that the public can be advantaged by is that there's an understanding of a potential range of alternatives or approaches that might be under consideration. There's been a lot of discussion around this table from public testimony about how do we interpret practicability, and I think that there are many different ways that that could be done. Is this the right way to interpret practicability? I'm not sure, but including it as an alternative that would be allowed to have comment on it as part of our draft EIS process and that would be available to us for consideration in October I think may be helpful moving forward in terms of the record, as well as providing the public with some clear understanding of this slightly different approach that combines not as an option, but as a requirement of performance standard as part of the alternative. The other aspect of this that we have not talked much about is the idea of a halibut avoidance plan. And in looking at the language that's developed here, this reads very similarly to language that was developed when we implemented Amendment 91 as a way to incentivize participants to try and reduce bycatch at all levels of abundance. There, I think it's a merit as well in having an opportunity for the public to provide comments on that as well. So I think it would be helpful for us to think about this uh, moving forward as a potential option. Uh, the other reason that I feel somewhat comfortable supporting this from a procedural standpoint is Assuming that we could incorporate this without creating large numbers of additional tables and significant staff load, uh, many of the potential implications of this alternative should already be captured within the range of alternatives that we've already got before us. What this does do that is a little different is describe the specific way that those specific aspects would work under various conditions of halibut abundance. So for those reasons, I will be supporting uh, this particular action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Chair, I appreciate Mr. Merrill's comments about the helpfulness of the process and analyzing things. And just for analysis, let's put it on the table. I must have heard that a million times in my, in my stint serving on this council. And it's usually put forward as an argument 
to support something that doesn't pass the red face test on its own. And then it said, let's just do it for analysis. So here is my issue with putting something on the table for analysis that's not responsive to our problem statement. I don't think that's informative to the public. I don't think it's helpful to the process. I don't think it strengthens our analysis. Our problem statement says that we're going to do abundance-based management. By all accounts, the status of the housing stock in Area 4 right now is at a low level of abundance. Developing a program that gives the largest user of halibut bycatch a limit that is more than they've used since they completely changed the way that they operate is not abundance-based management of halibut. If this is non-responsive to the problem statement. It does not meet the standards to reduce bycatch to the extent practicable because it's not even anywhere near their current usage level. So we're going to set a limit when we're at a low level of abundance that exceeds the current usage of the largest bycatch user. I just, I just think that the argument about process and analysis is a red herring. And that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Mr. Jones. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to to, to make a quick note here. Um, you know, I, I'm going to be uh, I'll be in opposition to this motion, and, and for many of the reasons that have been stated already, but also uh, a few that that haven't. I just wanted to to uh, to to bring that up. That you know, uh, being from Washington State, we've heard from a lot of folks from Washington State that are uh, are are very concerned and have had uh, you know the um, the serious ramifications to their business plans, their business models, and their ability to continue to fish halibut from the great people at the Fishermen's Union to the Fishing Vessel Owners Association and many other private people uh, 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 that we've heard speak from Washington State that I, I think we've got a good range of alternatives now. You know, we have alternative – we don't need to add anything else to this package. It's going to complicate this. We've had a discussion. We've been at this for a long time. Um, so uh, whether we, you know, we have alternative one, uh, which is, is a potential outcome, alternative two is a potential outcome. And I won't go through many more, but if you look at alternative two with option one uh, and giving them the, the, the rolling average and option three, to have a performance standard and give them some tools. We don't need a halibut avoidance plan. They'll do the Amendment 80 will do this on their own. We don't need to prescribe a, a halibut avoidance plan. As far as I can see in the testimony I've heard from Amendment 80, all of the things that are here are things that they're already uh, doing and working on, and they'll continue to work on it. What's going to be our um, the, the the range is, is 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 quite broad. We've done our job with the national standards to, to bring a balanced, fair uh, um, uh, initial review and release that to the public. And we're going to bring being back a very fair, broad range of alternatives for uh, final action. And, and what we take to final action, I, I, I don't know what we're going to do, but we certainly don't need another alternative beyond uh, um, alternative four. Um, I think between alternatives one through four, we're doing great. So I'm going to oppose this motion based on the people in Washington State that are uh, conservation-minded, and that includes the halibut uh, bycatch, inclusive of that. There's a lot of people that are very concerned about this, and and I, I think we've we've got the tools we need to to deal with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Down, Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, just a couple of closing comments. Um, alternatives, in, in order to work, a performance standard approach has to fit and, and provide incentives across the full range of abundances. Um, both alternatives three and four in particular, uh, but I have, I have questions about all the existing alternatives, but I just want to point out in particular the effects of alternatives three and four at the low and the very low levels in particular, very large cut to the bycatch caps, very large reductions of existing usage. Um, and 
when you then add on um, the impacts of a performance standard approach, which would be another reduction below the bycatch cap, they break down. Um, and then my judgment actually, alternatives one through four all do, but three and four clearly do. I expect the analysis to elucidate that. But if they break down at those levels, then they, they're broken for the entire range of abundance. And we lose the opportunity to craft an abundance-based approach to bycatch reduction that relies on incentives. Instead, we have an approach that relies on hard caps, which generally results in a race to achieve the hard cap. I don't think that's what we want. And I think having an alternative in there that will be, it provides the analysts with an opportunity to demonstrate how those work across the full range is an important opportunity for all of us to look and see. I can pretty much guarantee you right now that two of those alternatives, when you combine them with performance standards, will demonstrate how performance standards allow the analysts to show how performance standards break down and don't work. I think we should include an alternative where we can demonstrate how they will work. Am I going to argue they're exactly the right numbers? No but they are the right numbers for showing how a performance standard approach really will work. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Any final comments before we vote? Okay. Mr. Witherell. Calling the roll on the amendment <clears throat> to add a new alternative and a halibut avoidance plan. Ms. Baker? No. Ms. Campbell? No. Mr. Cross? Yes. Mr. Down? No. Mr. Jensen? No. Ms. Kimball? No. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mr. Mesro? No. Mr. Twight? Yes. Mr. Merrill? Yes. Mr. Kinnean? No. Motion fails four to seven. Okay, thank you, Mr. Witherell. Further amendments to the main motion? Okay, let's move to comments on the main motion. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll be brief. I I do appreciate the discussion. I think uh, the council is moving into somewhat new territory here uh, in, in terms of implementing an abundance-based management program for halibut. I'm, I'm not uh, downplaying the challenges associated with that. We've talked about those for a number of years, um, but I really, uh, I, I've appreciated the conversation. I understand uh, the need uh, for us to balance a number of factors. I think though uh, Ms. Campbell's reference to the the purpose and need statement um, for this particular action is pretty key for us. And, and so uh, we are establishing an abundance-based management program. And that means at low levels of halibut abundance, uh, the PSC limits will be reduced in order to um, essentially share that conservation burden across all directed halibut users of which we know, uh, excuse me, all halibut users of which we know directed halibut users are currently managed that way. And so I feel, again, I'll, I mentioned it earlier, but uh, it is important that in the index states we're looking at right now, uh, we are in the low, low state. And, and so I do feel it is important. Again, I mentioned it earlier, 
that we recalibrate our thinking in terms of what is a fair and equitable PSD limit, uh, what is minimizing bycatch to the extent practicable in the Amendment 80 sector, uh, and, and all of the other things that we will need to discuss uh, when we take final action on this in terms of balancing the national standards. Uh, I, I agree. I think we have a good range of alternatives. Um, we have some performance stand. We have a performance standard option uh, to help us evaluate if, if that will um, help us with in terms of flexibility. I, I am not. I haven't reached a conclusion on that yet with with the analysis. And so uh, I appreciate everyone's uh, participation, the staff especially. I know uh, this has been a tremendous amount of work for them and uh, especially the change in alternatives the last time that we saw this. I, I don't want to underestimate the impacts that's had. We heard very clearly from the SSC uh, a little bit of um, commentary on that. And so um, I just want to say I appreciate all the council member engagement and discussion on this issue. It's not an easy one um, and, and appreciate all of uh, the constructive uh, public testimony that we did receive on this particular agenda item. And uh, overall, I'll be supporting this motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Further comments on the motion? Mr. Clayton. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I am going to vote in favor of the motion, although I don't want that interpreted as, as a signal of support um, for most of the, for really any of the alternatives in there right now, um, including status quo. Um, uh, but I, I think we need to keep this moving. Um, and, and I definitely support moving this towards final action. There's an issue that came up in public testimony that I just wanted to, uh, I didn't know how to pick it up at this point for uh, inclusion. Um, and I imagine other council members didn't either, but I don't want to just lose track of it. And um, it was raised by at least uh, one person in public testimony that there are other actions that the council has taken in the past that may actually reduce the Amendment 80 sector's um, ability to, um, to find um, harvest areas that have uh, as low levels of halibut as possible. And it, the, one of the ones that was mentioned was uh, one area that where yellowfin often congregate. But I think there may be others as well. Uh, and, and I would actually encourage um, the sector, uh, as, as well as staff in the agency, to think about some of those other areas. That it's clear that, um, as we heard a lot about um, concern from the Amendment A sector and others, that they may be running out of tools in their toolbox. And so, I, I think uh, the council should be doing what they can to uh, to assist the sector in looking for other tools. And so, again, I don't have any action to propose on that at this point, but I thought it was important to uh, just flag that as, as something we're probably going to need to do, um, no matter what set of alternatives we choose for this. Um, Thank you, Mr. Clay. Mr. Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will not be supporting the motion. I, I find it, uh, um, I don't see any red herrings, but I see no carrots either. Um, I think this has a potential to uh, drive a race for fish within the Amendment 80 sector. I see it as uh, punitive. I don't see it as one that has incentives built into it to do better. Um, uh, I do not see anything that says we should be recalibrating what's practical. What's practical is what's practical, and, and uh, you don't recalibrate it. You, it is or it isn't. And um, so I, I view that differently uh, than other council members. I think that if we continue down this road with this one, I think we will find that we're going to have to revisit it, and uh, because I think there will be difficulty. Um, 
the reason um, and, the, and the facts that Ms. Campbell brought up that they've never gone below it before, uh, I get that. But the change that's going on in the Bering Sea right now is going to make it more difficult. We're not living in the past. This is a whole different uh, Bering Sea and a different mix of fish. And I think we need to have incentives in there. Um, and I think that, that we will be, uh, whether it's two years or three years or four years, whenever, we'll be revisiting this because I think that the Amendment 80 sector will have a difficult time um, uh, reaching these and, and the carrots aren't there. So um, I will be opposing the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kratz. Mr. Mesero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be supporting the motion. I, I also appreciate the discussion around the table and particularly Mr. Twight putting this out there for discussion. I think, you know, the, the point of this is the public testimony and the fact that we've been at this for as long as we have is clear. And if we select an option that could take six or seven years to make any sort of reduction on top of the six or seven years it's going to take to take this to final action, that would be almost as long as it took to get the RQE implemented, and it's too long. And so I feel like moving this forward now is appropriate. I appreciate the public testimony and most of the written comments, and I appreciate the staff's hard work on this. The AT's good job of really having a substantive discussion that I was able to get some insight from. And uh, I appreciate the work that Ms. Baker put into this motion and this issue in general. It's it's not, it doesn't just happen here. I know she's put weeks of effort into trying to come up with uh, viable options and I appreciate the motion and I'll be supporting. Thank you, Mr. Mesero. Additional comments? on the main motion. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just briefly um, put my support on the record for the motion. And I am glad for the discussion that we've had and the discussion around Mr. Twight's amendment as well. I think it really does get to what the differing views of practicable are. It highlights the fact that we are bound to the national standards and that we do have you know, flexibility in how we interpret those national standards, but we have to make our case based on what's in the analysis and what we hear in public testimony. And I think we'll continue to do that. Um, I do appreciate that, that Ms. Baker has left in, you know, alternative two through four. I appreciate that we could apply a performance standard to any of those alternatives or choose not to apply a performance standard to those alternatives. I also appreciate that we have not identified yet a PPA, but that doesn't hinder us taking final action on schedule at the end of this year. And I, I hope to be able to do that. I also wanted to um, just comment briefly on the work that staff has done. I know everyone says thank you to staff often, and I appreciate that about our council. Um, but in this action in particular, I feel like there's been many redirects and not for inappropriate reasons. I think it's been based on you know, new ideas from public testimony, um, some missteps that we might've taken in the analytical approach. And I just appreciate their ability to continue to provide us with, with a robust product. And I hope we can get you know, one clean, clear version for the next round and be in a situation to take final action. I thank you, uh, Ms. Baker, for the motion and I'll be in support. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Mr. Merrill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Baker, for your motion. I, too, will be supporting uh, moving forward with this motion. I do have a couple of uh, comments that I did want to make, though, a bit about process and also a bit about where we are within the analysis itself. And I think many of you know that the agency sort of wears two hats. One, we wear the hat here at the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, representing council interests. We also have a role and responsibility with the International Pacific Halibut Commission in representing U.S. interests there. I do believe that part of the challenge that we're facing, both in terms of the comments that we receive, as well as a number of the issues that we're struggling with here around the table in terms of how to balance Magnuson-Stevens Act issues with potential impacts on the directed users, is is perhaps due to a, a lack of a clear understanding of the different roles and responsibilities between what we do here at the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, what we are doing here through the Magnuson-Stevens Act process, 
And what occurs through a collaborative process, ideally, with Canada through the International Pacific Halibut Commission and the process that we use there for setting catch limits and the many different types of considerations that we have there. I do believe that the analysis could be uh, improved by providing a little bit more clarity about the different roles and responsibilities between those two bodies, particularly given the large number of comments that we received from members of the public who are not as familiar with this process as we are. I think having that in the analysis will also be useful as we continue to have deliberations on this issue and could be uh, fruitful for us as we continue our discussions about practicability and impacts on communities and understanding fair use and equity. All of those are very important issues for us to address. I don't think this necessarily requires an extensive amount of work, but I do think that that lead-in is particularly important for the public. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I hope we can proceed and continue to move along a successful process. I'll also note that in terms of the uh, NEPA process, as you know, we will have a relatively short turnaround between completing this analysis, preparing a version of the draft environmental impact statement, which is published. There's a 45-day comment period as part of that. We would be coming back to the council with a comment and response document that would be ideally available uh, in as robust a form as we can provide it for you and your consideration in October. In addition to that, I also want to note that the agency reached out early on in this process to a number of tribal governments that have expressed interest in the past on this issue. Our intent would be to continue to do that, to do so after this council meeting. And I certainly welcome any uh, input from any of the various tribal governments that uh, would like to seek consultation with, with, with us here at the National Marine Fishery Service. It is part of the process and we're certainly open to having those discussions. Should we uh, undertake consultations with tribal governments and those are concluded prior to October, we will certainly make sure that the council has an opportunity to see the results of those consultations as well. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Merrill. Okay, Mr. Marks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Baker for the motion. I'm, I'm on the fence with the motion right now and I, I will support it going forward I, I, at this point. I'm not sure I, I see a, a, a final action within the range that, that I support. I, losing the, the rollover option it, uh, was, was, is a big part of that. You know, not, not as it was stated, but when I looked at table 211 in there, and, and in particular where it identifies overages in 2018 or 2019, it, it's it's one of those carrots where how how do we frame a rollover that that really addresses those are the years we needed to address and we didn't want to just roll over and and add to the cap. What we wanted to do is is provide some relief when necessary to address those hopefully few numbers of overage. So what if we limited that to two and five or three and seven like we're doing and. In my mind, that that's the type of carrot we should be having in in a package that goes forward. Not that we couldn't reinsert it, but it's not there now. I didn't I didn't offer an amendment to keep it, so so be it. Um, so anyway, that uh, so I'll support it. Uh, again, I'm, I'm quite not sure, not quite sure how it's going to come out in the end. Just a couple other comments. I, I found a lot of the conversation. It's a great testimony, and you know, and I, I, I think you know, certainly, you know, the the communities. Uh, we we have an issue we need to resolve. It's it's a situation where the paradox is we've got we've got a, a, a halibut, a product that that caters to pretty affluent, but but our suppliers are our communities and and their their costs at home and costs at fisheries and the importance of fishing. You know, I heard that loud and clear. We've heard that from several people in the salmon fishery and the halibut fishery, just the importance of fishery. We, we need to resolve that. We need to keep communities whole. On, on the flip side, we, we, we have some larger producers and, and in my area, um, 
it's I, I can go to the store and and you know I for a con- local consumer who's who's not affluent they can buy a pound of halibut or they can buy three pounds of of Pacific cod or they can buy four or five pounds of rockfish or other fillets and and so that really does it it there's a social issue on the consumer side and it's not characterized in, in the uh, doc it, it, it's not characterized in the document it was spoke to the document could could be enhanced with the inclusion of that information and and again it, it does not uh, minimize the importance to community because I, I get it but at the same time um, we, we have a we have social issues on the other side and and food security at this this time you know in schools and and underprivileged and lower income um, th- this is a, a federal you know a federal area a federally based fishery and and if we're looking at at uh, benefits to the nation we need to think about that and and it needs to be better portrayed in the analysis so I think that's a, a weak point from my in my mind I think the other one I, I think the SFC made a g- good point on this wasn't their specific point, but what resonated with me was just the, the element of adaptive management and, and that, you know, this this PSC is not perfect, but it has been adaptively managed. And we should continue that. I'm not I'm not compelled to to take a take a deep dive when when we've heard on one side that, that they're on the margin. On the other side it's it's clearly not enough to, to really make a difference to communities. So, so anyway, we, we can need to continue to work on that. We, we, part of that issue, and, and Mr. Twight spoke to it, is this, the majority of the Amendment 80 fishery occurs in 4C D&E. And, and so it's a major production area. Everybody knows that, but I'm just saying it out loud. And, and so it, it creates this, this disproportionate issue with with uh you know and how to how to balance kind of the benefits of that. so that's a challenge I, I do like the thought of are there areas outside where they're very site specific that have have uh you know a high ratio of target catch to to uh by catch and we need to look at those i mean how can one the other thing we haven't looked at that needs to be looked at is better utilization of bycatch. There's there's a lot of of uh, comments on waste and you know not that waste should go back to the Amendment 80 fleet, but how would we better utilize that? What are the downsides to bycatch? Does that actually you know because bycatch or discards attract halibut to the area? Does it attract crab to the area you know so so there's an issue that with that that i don't know the answer but I, it's certainly it's it's interesting to think about and, and how can we look at those types of things to to change change our perspective on bycatch and and actually use it to you know is there a way to to benefit or fund an rqe or or do better research and and development so we can can uh, you know address some more of these problems? Again, it's outside of the scope of this um, analysis, but it, it's something we need to continue to think about in all these fisheries and the bycatch. So, anyway, I won't continue to go on, but those are a few of my my thoughts on the matter. So, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Marks. Further comments. I think we're ready to to vote. It's been a a robust council discussion and an incredible amount of engagement from from the public, which is uh, we all appreciate. So I think we are ready to vote, Mr. Witherell. Calling the roll on a motion to release the analysis with revised alternatives. Ms. Campbell. Yes. Mr. Cross? No. Mr. Down? Yes. Mr. Jensen? Yes. Ms. Kimball? 
Yes. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mr. Mesero? Yes. Mr. Twite? Yes. Mr. Merrill? Yes. Baker? Yes. Mr. Kinnean? Yes. Motion passes 10 to 1. Thank you, Mr. Witherell. Anything further on ABM? Great. Thanks, everybody. With 3.36 Alaska time, I think we have time to uh, set the table on agenda item D5. Let's uh, stand down for a, a minute while staff is getting ready. Stay close here. like our presentation is being loaded. I believe Dr. Stram is going to introduce this item for us. Good afternoon again, Dr. Stram. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. Um, we are on agenda item D5 for snow and bike catch. I've just got a couple of introductory slides to um, walk through to tell you about the um, items that you're taking up under this agenda item, particularly in light of the fact that um, we had to skip it during that April meeting last year. I'm not going to go over everything that's posted to your agenda, but as you can see on the agenda, you have a number of different reports that we'll be walking through um, and during this agenda item. And um, there's a number of different presenters. Um, because of some of the geneticists are new, I just wanted to um, walk through a little bit to explain to you in terms of what's being presented and by whom under this. So there's a number of reports for salmon genetics. Um, you're gonna receive a report on overview of new technologies and workflow improvements and updated methodology changes and chum baselines. That will be by Dr. Wes Larson, who's the head of the genetics group, as well as Dr. Pat Berry, who's a postdoc. You then will receive book two years of 2018 and 2019 chum stock composition analysis for the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska from Dr. Chris Kanzila, a research geneticist. And then the 2018 and 2019 Chinook stock composition analysis for the Bering Sea and the Gulf, as well as the coded wire tag update for the Gulf, and that is from the Chuck Guthrie. We then move into um, the IPA annual reports. You do have reports posted to your agenda for all three of the IPAs, and you will receive a presentation from each of the IPA representatives on their progress in 2019 and 2020. And then finally, for C-Share, um, Mr. Jim Harmon will, has provided his report that's on the agenda, and he will also be providing a PowerPoint to walk through the update on the 2019-2020 C-Share donations and new developments. Just as a reminder then, and I know that you had this conversation with the AP as well, the last time that you took up the Sam by Catch agenda item was in, a, was in June of 2019, and at that time, we um, provided you not only the reports that you have, but as well as a, a report back from the Salmon Bycatch Workshop that we held in April 2019 to address a number of different issues. Um, we do have a standing um, Salmon Bycatch work group that consists of council staff, NIMP staff, um, both at the AFSC as well as the OSBE lab and ADF and G staff. And we do meet periodically. So we have been um, periodically meeting to discuss a different issues as well as to work on some items that were requested from the council. And so I just wanted to remind you for context what your council motion was and when you identified priorities and future directions. And this also is posted to your agenda. The first then was the priority on processing the backlog of more recent Chinook salmon scales from the Bering Sea and the Gulf in order to update the age length key used in the Bering Sea 
Chinook AEQ model and to develop the necessary age length keys for the Gulf. And in the course of this, these presentations, we can provide you some information as far as where we are at with, um, with addressing council's priorities here. The next thing that you request with the salmon bycatch work group do is examine the available salmon bycatch data set to identify and help prioritize potential future research possibilities. And looking at the, the um, addition of syntheses to the now extensive data sets on salmon bycatch and examining how these pieces of information can be used to inform future management actions. I believe that you will hear back during the course of the, the next two um, items on workflow, as well as the, um, the different analyses that the geneticists have done with respect to Chum and Chinook, and you will see kind of the progress for how we have been addressing that as well. Um, number two, exploring the options for collaboration amongst the genetic laboratories and to continue to develop coastwide genetic baselines for Chum and Chinook salmon. And again, I would just highlight that, that those kinds of collaborations are ongoing and that has been um, a real effort and um, real progress on that since the salmon bite catch work group uh, workshop. And then finally, to identify the existing data gaps and defining comprehensive stock composition in the Gulf of Alaska, we can probably, um, in conjunction with the presentations or, or questions kind of give you an update on, on where we're at with respect to that. So I just want to remind the council then of what your motion was before and the, the while not explicitly addressing these specific aspects of the motion, I do believe that over the course of the presentation, you will get a sense of how these have been taken into account and we can answer more explicit um, questions as well. Mr. Chairman, that would cover um, just the, the general overview of the presentations that you'll be taking up. Thank you, Dr. Chairman. I think unless there's any questions, we can uh, move into the M Genetica. Great. Dr. Larson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the uh, council. Thank you so much for uh, inviting us to present our research today. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? We can, loud and clear. Perfect, all right. So today I'm gonna give um, a little bit of an overview of kind of where we're going as far as uh, genetic analysis of, of salmon bycatch. It, it, it's a transition year for us um, as I'm, I've taken over and um, a new postdoc has started and we're gonna talk to you about some of the, uh, uh, the, new, the new things we're gonna be doing as far as bycatch this year. Uh, so first off, I just wanted to give a quick introduction to myself. Uh, so I started, um, as the genetics program manager here at Oak Bay Lab uh, in March of last year. And a little bit of my history, I, I did my PhD under Jim and Lisa Sieb, who ran the ADFNG genetics lab for about 20 years. Uh, the first chapter of my PhD was on stock identification of Chinook salmon bycatch um, and some other uh, samples we had to, to try and understand kind of more about the ecology um, and the stock distributions of Chinook salmon uh, in the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska. And then I moved to uh, conducting genomic analysis of Western Alaska Chinook salmon uh, with the major goal of improving resolution for AYK stock. Uh, and finally, I, I finished up uh, looking at the genetic basis of life history diversity in sockeye salmon uh, with a focus on Bristol Bay. Uh, I spent four years in Wisconsin uh, running a laboratory with a focus of developing genomic methods to inform fisheries management. Uh, I went there kind of straight after my PhD um, and I'm really happy to be back uh, on the West Coast now, um, back in Alaska and working on um, fisheries management issues uh, in Alaska. Okay, so what are we doing as far as updating the, the bycatch genetics workflow? Uh, the first thing we're doing is we're transitioning to a new genotyping chemistry. Um, it's called GTC and uh, I'm not gonna get into the details, but essentially, it's the, the standard chemistry, uh, the industry standard used for um, stock identification of salmon across the West Coast by laboratories such as ADFNG, um, Critvic, et cetera. Uh, and then we're also transitioning to a new analysis method um, called Rubius, which is uh, integrated into the R programming language, which just uh, increases efficiency and speed of analysis. 
Uh, the third bullet point I kind of want to stop on and, and talk about a little bit more. And so this is um, ages for all samples. And, and we've talked about this quite a bit at the SSC um, and uh, the AP. And I want to emphasize that we're working to start aging all of our Chum and Chinook salmon samples um, every year. Uh, we do have to do some some backlogs, and um, we're we're working to get a contract in place so that we can um, conduct this work. But we understand that it's uh, extremely important for things like um, uh, parameterizing AEQ models and understanding cohort specific dynamics. And so we are uh, fully committed to uh, making sure that we get those ages integrated with all the um, samples as we move forward. The other thing we're doing is we're working on full integration uh, with the Axon database so that we can uh, just have more flexibility um, and more um, kind of nimbleness to, to do uh, more and different analyses. We're also collaborating with um, quantitative ecologists from other uh, programs at the Alaska Fishery Science Center to try and um, kind of synthesize data. And then we're constructing a Shiny app, which is a tool to facilitate data exploration um, for folks in industry and um, other folks interested in the data. And Pat's going to talk about, about that a little bit more, but um, building this interactive tool that can allow um, uh, interested users to actually manipulate data and um, explore different uh, topics. And all analyses are going to start to be conducted in R, which is going to lead to an automated workflow um, and, and more rapid report generation. So just moving this to kind of a reproducible research um, automated workflow kind of um, approach so that we can get things done uh, faster and more efficiently. So what does this mean for you? Um, first off, the time saved will facilitate new analyses. So the first bullet here is a pretty important one. So trying to conduct more refined spatial and temporal analyses to understand long-term trends, how env environmental variables influence trends, and how to leverage the specific information to better um, facilitate avoidance of certain stocks. So at the end of the day, the goal here is to try and synthesize all the data that we've collected um, for the past decade or more on stock compositions, merge that with environmental data um, and ages to try and actually understand uh, the larger, larger scale trends of what's exactly happening with the dynamics of the bycatch and how can we understand these, these trends so that we can actually avoid certain stocks. Um, the other thing here that's also really important is um, conducting more cohort-based analyses to parameterize these AEQ models and track stock compositions by age class, and also try and relate uh, the abundance of different stocks to their comp to their um, proportions in our uh, in our samples, so that we can try and understand if, if essentially if this was just a big year for that stock, or if they're actually you know significantly overrepresented um, in the bycatch. Uh, and then we're also beginning conversations about faster turnaround, um, and this is this is mostly related to chum salmon, um, but for both species, we'd like to uh, streamline reports so that they're potentially available a little bit sooner. But uh, the big point here is that for, for chum salmon specifically, we'd like to produce or to reduce the lag time to one year um, so that we can essentially get results from a previous bee season analyzed and stock composition presented or um, processed and available before the next bee season. So for example, uh, for the samples taken in the 2019 bee season, we'd like to have results available by the 2020 bee season so that those stock compositions from the last year uh, can be used to try and um, inform rolling hotspot closures and, and things to that of that nature. Um, I just wanted to take a quick, uh, a quick couple minutes here to just talk about the future of the Off Bay Genetics Lab. So uh, we're definitely very focused on this bycatch um, project, but we also have a couple new research foci um, and these are marine genomics and environmental DNA. Uh, the other thing is we've also added uh, a number of new employees over the last year, a new research geneticist, two laboratory technicians, and two postdoctoral researchers. And this means that we've increased our capacity to answer um, new questions related to fisheries management in Alaska. And so some of these questions include um, population genetics research on things like sablefish, Pacific cod, and rockfish. Um, and also trying to uh, integrate and understand how eDNA works for um, assessing fish communities in nearshore and offshore environments. And so uh, hopefully we'll, um, we're going to definitely make some progress on these progress and on hopefully you'll see these uh, topics at a council meeting in the future here. 
All right. So uh, lastly, I, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Pat Berry, who's a, a postdoc with us funded by the PCCRC. And, and he's really um, spearheading this, this effort to um, kind of transition to new workflows for uh, the salmon bycatch work. So he's funded by the PCCRC um, and NOAA uh, with the goal of updating the bycatch genetics workflow and um, analyzing chum salmon stock compositions across time. So trying to pilot some of these, uh, these analytical tools for looking at uh, our salmon data sets kind of in a more um, holistic way to try and, try and move towards prediction and kind of understanding larger scale trends. Uh, and he's going to give an update on the new workflow, the Shiny app, um, and the and future analyses leveraging this Acton data integration um, and all these new um, fancy tools to try and uh, get a better idea of what we're looking at as far as uh, stock compositions across space and time. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Barry, and, and thank you so much for your time today. Okay, thank you, Dr. Larson. Good afternoon, Dr. Barry. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the council. Um, so as Dr. Larson mentioned, um, my name is Patrick Berry and I'm a postdoc uh, funded through the Pollock Conservation Cooperative Research Center, the PCCRC. And um, my project really is looking at um, doing some spatio-temporal modeling of the chum bycatch um, within the Pollock trawl fishery. Um, but I've been recruited kind of uh, to deal with some of the methodological advances that are ongoing in the Off-Bay Labs genetics program. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my PhD work was done at the University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, in the College of Fisheries and Ocean Science with Drs. Tony Garrett and Megan McPhee studying the population genetics of sockeye salmon. Um, and as Dr. Larson mentioned, uh, methodologically, the Ocbe Labs has undergone two main developments in the lab, which I've been helping with, uh, switch to a new genotyping chemistry and a transition to this new software to produce our stock composition estimates. And um, a major benefit of these changes is that we can create a seamless analytical pipeline with really uh, minimal user manipulation um, to go from um, uh, uh, the genotyping of these samples to producing reports. And uh, so here is a simplistic schematic of the new data analysis pipeline. Um, in the first part on the left-hand side, observer data are downloaded from the Alaska Fisheries Information Network, the Axton database. Um, and these data are paired with the genetic samples that we receive in the lab uh, that are then processed. A uh, few lab steps occur and the data or the raw genotype or the raw sequencing files are generated on an Illumina short read sequencer and then imported back into the R statistical environment for scoring and quality control. Uh, and then we can do, we can actually produce the stock composition estimates um, and then a report is auto-generated. And that report, um, so that's the, the streamline report that Dr. Larson mentioned. And then that streamline report will serve as the basis for each year's tech memo going forward. Um, Axton is currently working with us to provide a way of uploading the genetic data as well um, as the stock composition estimates to the Axton database uh, so that they can easily be retrieved uh, for a host of different analyses um, that will we'll be able to retrospectively do these analyses. Uh, so while we were updating the database management for the CHEM genotype data uh, for improving our ability to query different spatial and temporal strata, uh, we decided the best solution was to partner with Axfin and have them handle the database management uh, for those unfamiliar with Axfin, they were established under the direction of the Pacific States uh, Marine Fisheries Commission with the goal of consolidating fisheries data. And um, they offered um, uh, value-added data summaries in the form of these data dashboards um, that a lot of people use. Um, instead of constructing our own new SQL database, we can instead link the observer records that we current re currently rely on 
uh, during the intake of genetic sampling um, and link those with genotype and age information um, while maintaining complete confidentiality. Um, we're nearly complete with the construction of the CHUM genotype table uh, and merging those records with the observer data, um, which will facilitate much more refined exploration of the, the spatial and temporal strata um, that we currently uh, provide estimates for. Uh, so here I'll briefly show just the type of analysis that this database um, will facilitate. Um, so what if we were interested in exploring the effect that, um, say, a static closure might have in preserving individual stocks of fish? So here on the left, we have a map uh, with the chum savings area outlined in red. Uh, we can easily query um, the new database to figure out how many samples we have for each year. Uh, the current minimum sample size for running these mixed stock analyses is 100 samples. Uh, so we can see that the lowest sample size um, from 2011 to 2019 is 129 fish. Um, so we could include all of those years within this analysis. Um, then we can pull the linked genetic records, uh, format them, run stock composition estimates. Um, and this entire analysis could be done um, in a day. And we could further evaluate the effect of potentially breaking each of these mixtures into temporal segments. So the beginning and end of the fishing season. Um, and that um, really kind of um, um, sorry. Uh, so 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 merging the genotype um, information with the observer. Uh, data into the Acton database will really facilitate the exploration of a lot of these really cool trends in the bycatch data that we're seeing. Um, so the example I just gave really forms the basis of how we plan on identifying the spatial and temporal samples uh, that are large enough that we can run stock composition estimates on um, so that we can look at the inter and intra-annual patterns uh, at a much finer scale than we have had than we've been able to previously. Um, so we plan on exploring patterns across um, space, time, fishing sector, and um, age of fish. Uh, we plan to model these distributions with both biotic and abiotic factors, such as uh, sea surface temperature, PDO, uh, the, the abundance of age zero pollock. Um, and we hope that in doing so, we can move to a more predictive framework for bycatch avoidance. Uh, so as one of the other objectives, uh, we wanted to produce an easy way for people to um, access and, uh, the mixed stock analysis results that we provide each year in these tech memos um, that didn't involve actually combing through 10 different reports. Uh, so we designed um, an R Shiny app, which is um, an interactive web-based application um, that Dr. Larson mentioned. Um, and we'll, this will hopefully help industry um, and C state more easily visualize and explore the stock specific bycatch um, across both space and time. Um, but the app currently can be um, accessed at the above web address. Um, so I'll give an example of how we might use this application. <clears throat> if we were interested in differences between, say, the eastern and western Bering Sea, uh, we could go through the reports and look for the results of the west and east of 170 analysis. Um, but here we have the results comparing the stock composition for just the 2016 year. Um, so what if we wanted to look across multiple years uh, to see if these proportions are similar or how they might change through time? Um, so you could go to this um, web address on this slide, and that would bring you to a landing page uh, that looks like this. Um, so really, um, to, to navigate this um, website, really, um, you're using the left-hand side selectors to indicate what region, what spatial strata, what temporal strata, and years you want to, um, to actually graph and look at. Um, so I'd like to stress that all of these data are, um, are public, so no confidential data are accessed through this application. Um, the, the, the 
a web application, it basically allows the users to recreate graphs that are already produced by the Ocbay labs. Um, so within that left sidebar, you can select um, the criteria that you would like to look at. Um, so this application is still currently early in development, and we hope to add some more functionality. Um, and a really great suggestion that we got from the AP was integrating a way to actually track um, what users were looking at so that we might be able to craft a tool that is much more useful um, to, uh, to certain user groups. Um, so the last slide I have here is um, a little bit about previous work that I had been involved with, also funded by the PCCRC. Um, it, it investigated using new sequencing technology to estimate just the Asian versus North American contribution of chum salmon bycatch. Um, and this would be while on board a ship such as a catcher processor. Um, so this would in theory give the fleet the ability to uh, redirect fishing pressure away from um, North American stocks or potentially keep harvesting pollock if the bycatch was primarily um, hatchery chum salmon from Japan. Um, this research uh, leveraged existing information about the genetic variation uh, for a mitochondrial locus. Um, and so in the bottom left hand uh, panel is a network analysis of the genetic variation for each stock. And each circle represents a unique genetic sequence, and the diameter is proportion, proportional to its prevalence in the baseline samples. So each haplotype um, is colored by which reporting group it occurred in. Um, so here we have uh, Japan samples in red, North American samples in purple, and Japanese, or Russian samples in the highlighter green. Um, and what you can see is that... Um, there's really good separation between the Japanese red and North American purple haplotypes, uh, but there's a fair bit of overlap between both, um, both of those with the Russia samples. So for initial testing, we performed stock composition estimates uh, for a sample of 96 chum salmon with both the microsatellite markers, which ABL currently uses, and the haplotype data. And the results are here graphed on the bottom right. Um, that, and what you can see is that um, the point estimates are actually uh, quite similar. Um, however, the 95% credible intervals uh, for the North American and Russia reporting groups are quite large. Uh, but this really relies on just a 500 base pair sequence um, and the observed overlap in the network analysis. Um, this, this wasn't too um, unexpected. Um, but other parts of the mitochondrial um, genome show similar patterns, and we're hoping to develop this, uh, this method a little bit further um, and to continue this research. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people at the NOAA Off Bay Labs for kind of helping me um, learn all about the, the bycatch issues um, for both the Chinook and Chum, um, the folks at Axon for helping um, really integrate this database, and my advisor at UAF, Megan McPhee. Great. Thank you, Dr. Barry. Is there any Mr. questions Chair. from council members? Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that presentation. It's really exciting work, and it looks like an exciting new team. And I, I just wondered um, if you had already received some feedback from those that are implementing the salmon avoidance plans and would use, you know, be the end users of this kind of information on the level of spatial or temporal refinement that would be needed to make that um, usable. And, and if I need to, uh, you know, further explain what I mean, I, I can, but maybe you get my question. So through the chair, um, Ms. Gimble, thanks for the question. Um, so we're pretty early in the development of this um, kind of data analysis pipeline. And right now, uh, most of my efforts has been um, kind of identifying how how small we can make both our temporal and spatial strata. Um, but it, it's definitely something I would um, like people to reach out, but I, um, I'm not sure exactly how to go about that. Um, but yeah, maybe you can help in that regard. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I think just as you as you get further and, and realize kind of what's possible or through your exploration, I think bringing 
that back in a future report whenever the next genetic report comes back to the council so we can start engaging or engaging through that salmon bycatch work group um, so that there's some um, alignment, I guess, with people that want to use this information on the water to do just the things that you described and then and then what you're further developing. So I'm just trying to make that link as early as we can um, since I know the salmon avoidance plans are on a pretty fine spatial scale. So thank you for that response. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Any further questions? Oh, so through the, this is Wes Larson, through the chair, just one quick comment on that, if that's okay. Sure. Sure. So um, we're working pretty closely with uh, uh, with Jordan Watson, um, who, who has pretty close relationships with C-State. And while we haven't um, done anything tangible quite yet, because, um, you know, this is still in development phase, like Pat said, we have started to have the conversations about, you know, what it might look like to integrate this into um some of the the kind of real time management, and uh, we're definitely definitely excited to continue those conversations as we start to kind of refine refine the tools. So I guess we have the pipeline kind of open, and we're definitely going to circle back around with those guys uh, frequently when we um, when we get some more results. Thank you. Ms. Bush. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if this is the right uh, place to ask this question, but you did mention in your report um, some of the updates that were happening with the CHUM salmon baseline. Um, it's my understanding that, that there were um, some more updates uh, for the Chinook baseline as well. I know this was one of the, um, the points that was included in the Council's June 2019 uh, motion and, and request. Can, do you have an update of, of where that work stands or if, if there are any um, major barriers to having that baseline updated as well? Uh, through the chair, this is Wes again. Dr. Larson. Um, so ADF&G is, is working to uh, update the baseline in the AYK region. Um, the the issue for us is that there's no coastwide baseline that includes the, the new set of markers. Uh, that's going to be the 300 or 299 um, Chinook salmon markers. Uh, what I would like to hear from, from all of you is, uh, you know, what areas you might want uh, additional resolution um, in. So as far as new reporting groups and, and updated baseline resolution, uh, what areas are of interest would dictate how we might proceed with that. For example, uh, there's specific markers for AYK region uh, for Chinook that ADF&G is, is developing. And uh, if that's of major interest, then we, we could definitely pursue that further. Um, and, you know, kind of similar with maybe Southern stocks or something like that. So uh, I'd be very interested to hear exactly what folks would be uh, interested in and what we might uh, want to pursue with that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bush. Yeah, I don't have any more questions. Okay. All right. Any additional questions before we break for the day? Okay, I don't see any. Um, so, uh, Thank you, Drs. Larson and, and Barry, and uh, um, we will resume with our presentation on D5 tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock Alaska time. See you then. Thank you.